Ethics Committee today heard from several lobbyists and scholars and spoke to the clerk of the U.S. House at this hearing on lobbying reform. Chaired by California Republican David Dreyer, this is a little under five hours. The Rules Committee will uh, come to order. We're here for a uh, very important original jurisdiction uh, hearing. Uh, but I would uh, like to uh, begin by uh, saying that I just had a, a spectacular meeting uh, in the other room uh, that is building on one of the most important programs that we put together. Back in uh, the early part of the 1990s, as many of you know, and we, I see our friend here in the room, Martin Frost, uh, our former colleague, uh, we had the uh, honor of uh, establishing a task force that Mr. Frost um, led, along with our former colleague, Mr. Solomon, to help build democracies in Eastern and Central Europe, working directly with parliaments. And we have uh, built on that success by establishing the House Democracy Assistance Commission by uh, looking at a wide range of uh, parliaments uh, all over the world uh, with which we can work in this effort to, uh, to uh, build uh, uh, good relationships between the United States Congress and parliaments in other parts of the world. And I'm ha very happy to uh, say that the, uh, that program, which was a bipartisan effort launched by Speaker Hastert and Minority Leader Pelosi, was uh, established uh, last year. And we've uh, been going uh, very strongly on it. And I just had, as I said, a wonderful meeting. And I'd like to introduce uh, to the committee uh, Josefina Topali, who is the speaker of the Albanian parliament, who has joined us here today. And so. Madam Speaker, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. We're very, very happy to have you and look forward to continue working uh, together with you on a wide range of these programs. Let me say that uh, today's hearing is the committee's first installment in a series of hearings on how we can change our rules to provide greater transparency and accountability for our constituents in this institution's interaction with outside groups. I should note that the Rules Committee has already originated one lobbying reform rule change this session. We reported out a resolution that eliminated floor and gym privileges for former members who are lobbyists. We all know that was a small but an important first step. On February 1st, this resolution passed overwhelmingly with 379 votes, and I hope that our other reform efforts will enjoy the same broad bipartisan support as we proceed here. This morning, we'll take testimony on current lobbying laws as well as ideas for lobbying reform. We want to lay everything on the table and look at this uh, information as a committee and as a Congress so that we can move forward with reform together. There is no doubt that recent disgraceful lobbying and ethical scandals on both sides of the aisle have created a groundswell of bipartisan support for change. When illegal and immoral actions bring shame on the United States Congress, we have a duty to look closely at lobbying and ethics laws and determine where we can improve and strengthen them. We owe it to the American people, we owe it to this institution, and we owe it to ourselves. This is not a partisan issue. It is an issue that goes to the integrity of the Congress, and every member has a stake in that. Before we begin taking testimony, I want to put our reform efforts in a historical context. Lobbying reforms have been undertaken many times by many Congresses, and it's no wonder when you look at what was allowed many, many, many years ago. When Daniel Webster was a senator from Massachusetts in the 1830s, he was paid by and actively solicited money from one of the country's largest banks. In those days, members and lobbyists could be one and the same. Subsequent reforms have made such outrageous and obvious conflicts illegal. In fact, lobbying and ethics laws have been continually updated with the times. As we uh, know very well, to be committed to good governance and reform is to be committed to constantly revisiting and revamping the rules and laws that apply. More recently, in 1989, uh, the first President Bush worked with the Congress to update government ethics laws. <coughs> These changes including limit included limiting the sources of income for members that members could earn uh, outside of their elected duties. That bill was introduced by our colleague uh, Lamar Smith from Texas. Eleven years ago, we rewrote the 1946 Federal Regulation of Lobbying Act. 
The Lobbying Disclosure Act of 1995 enhanced reporting requirements and made clearer and broader definitions for lobbying activities. But like all reforms, it was not a one-shot deal. Today, we are here to continue that reform process. Before we get underway, I want to make very clear that lobbying is not only an honorable profession, it is a constitutionally protected profession. As we seek to level the playing field for constituents and lobbyists, we must protect the First Amendment right of all Americans to petition their government. As all of us up here can attest to, uh, input from constituents and advocates is essential for effective governing, so we have to strike the right balance. I will close by saying how encouraging my recent conversations about lobbying reform have been with scores of members and outside experts, many of whom are going to be testifying here today, Democrats and Republicans alike. We all understand that with one voice, we can improve the deliberative nature of the Congress. With one voice, we can come together and, I believe, deal with this challenging relationship that is there on the horizon. And with one voice, we can improve the stature of the United States Congress in the eyes of the American people. Nearly everyone I spoke with agreed that it is time to take action. So in the greatest tradition of bipartisan reform, we look forward to having the action begin. And we are going to let this hearing begin. And we'll begin with a statement from our very distinguished ranking minority member, my friend from Rochester, New York, Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I also want to thank our esteemed witnesses this morning uh, for being here. Their many years of public service and their clear dedication to promoting the higher ethical standards in government are invaluable to this nation. And we appreciate your taking the time to be here today. I know that your testimony is especially important for us. It's a time in the history of Congress that troubles me greatly. I honestly worry about what the future holds for this House and consequently for our nation. This has truly been an era of shame for this institution and one which has done harm to the American people. Something is fundamentally wrong with our Congress, with the way it does business, and with the legislation it's passing. Sadly, in the minds of our fellow Americans, the very word Congress has become synonymous with the word corruption. More than 200 years ago, Thomas Jefferson created a rules manual that has guided the House ever since. This Jefferson Manual created a process that would, if followed, ensure that reason and pursuit of the public good would be the highest principles of the House, not the search for power and profit. The strong-arm tactics and regular abuse of House rules and traditions employed by the majority and the devastating legislative outcomes those acts have conspired to produce can lead only to one conclusion, and that is the wise process laid down by Thomas Jefferson no longer holds. The rules have changed. Lobbyists are now writing the bills, and Jefferson's fair and open process of deliberation, the hallmark of our democracy, has been replaced by secret backroom deals and arm twisting and influence paddling. In today's Congress, committee chairmen negotiate major legislation at the same time that they are negotiating for themselves sweetheart job deals with special interests. And as the business of this government has been regularly put up for sale to the highest bidder, Democrats have been locked out of the room where the decisions were made. And as a result, the millions of Americans that they represent are also shut out of the process. As all of this has come into the public eye, the members of the majority have joined longstanding Democrat calls for change and reform. But so far, as our chairman mentioned, we've gotten to uh, barring former members from the gym and from the floor of the House if they are lobbyists. Uh, which is fine, but uh, we must go much further and, uh, th that, and we can't do that unless we look back to the K Street Project. Because the simple truth is, and I think if I, nobody hears another thing that I say today, the simple truth is lobbyists can only be as corrupt as people in this Congress allow them to be. Corrupt lobbyists like Jack Abramoff are the symptom. The disease is here in the Congress. They could not have done a thing without a congressperson to have allowed them to do it. And so the responsibility to change falls squarely on our shoulders. And what we need to admit is when the lobbyist buys influence in exchange for gifts or donations, a member of Congress has allowed it to happen. And when a lobbyist writes legislation to benefit an industry instead of ordinary people, a member of Congress invited them into the room. The latest example we had of that was yesterday where we are now about to pass a bill that will take away food safety labeling. 
all over the United States. There were no hearings on this bill in the last two Congresses. No scientists have ever looked at this bill, and the scientists from almost every state in the Union have said, please don't pass it. But it's going to happen because, once again, this was written by the lobbies for an industry. And when the guardians of our political process allow these things to occur, they do it at the expense of our traditions and the integrity of the democracy they profess to serve. Congress writes the law of this country. Congress makes the rules that govern what members can and can't do. Congress decides to either punish transgressions or to allow them pass by unnoticed. We're calling upon you, our expert witnesses, to help us do the job correctly. I want to mention a few specific subjects that I am particularly eager to ask you about during our time together. While we're still waiting for any significant reform package to be proposed, uh, we do have a Democrat rules reform bill that my fellow Democrat members of the committee and I announced yesterday. Our common sense reforms are designed to return accountability and transparency to the Democrat process here in the House. They will crack down on the serial abuses of the conference process, which has become fertile ground for corruption. We want to require the conferees vote on last minute and dead of night changes to conference reports and to guarantee members 24 hours to actually read the bills they're voting on. We're asking the majority to crack down on arm twisting and influence peddling on the House floor and conflict of interest in job negotiations. Democrats also to impose, uh, seek to impose fiscal accountability on the legislative process by requiring a vote to increase the debt limit. We want to prevent major spending bills from being passed under suspension of the rules. And I'm anxious to hear what you have to say about these reforms. Uh, and I hope that if you agree with us that these are important, that you will help us urge uh, to get this bill passed in Congress soon. More than a month ago, the Democrats presented the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act, H.R. 4682. It hasn't gotten any attention at all. I hope that some of you in here might have read it. It's a broader bill designed to regulate the conduct of members of the body and eliminate some of the most egregious ethical abuses we've witnessed. It bans gifts and meals from lobbyists, strictly regulates member travel on private jets, which frankly I would just assume they had banned. It will also establish a new Office of Public Integrity to help enforce the reforms. That's a cru crucial thing, because it's my understanding that only about 5 percent of the lobbying groups now file the, uh, the uh, reports they're supposed to. And uh, we also want to shut down the infamous K Street project. I look forward to learning from our experts if we're on the right track. And if we are, we certainly want to try to urge our friends on the other side of the aisle to help to pass these reforms and do it as soon as we can uh, to eliminate the disease of corruption in a that is so clearly weakening our Congress. I also hope that our experts can add detail to our understanding of exactly how the K Street project works and explain why and how it was created in the first place and who has benefited from it. But more than just exploring history, we need to fully explore solutions. The solutions I've mentioned are some that we hope uh, might find some interest, but we expect to hear many others from you today. After all, nothing can be more important than ensuring the integrity of our political process. It is the foundation from which every law, every act, and every proclamation springs. It should be the strength of our ideas and not merely the strength of our numbers that determine which laws this body chooses to enact. To be sure, this Congress owes the American people a better government than the one we have today. And we had better take the steps to really reform Congress or risk permanently weakening the very democracy that defines us as a people. It is my hope that we can usher in a new day here, a day which nothing is hidden because we have nothing to hide. I look forward to your testimony. and Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Slaughter. You've come forward with some very interesting and creative proposals, uh, many of which I believe that we'll be able to uh, incorporate in a package as we proceed. And let me just say that we are very, very honored to welcome for her first appearance before, I think, any congressional committee since uh, probably ever, and now since she has uh, been named as clerk of the House of Representatives, <laughs> Our very good friend, uh, Karen Haas, who's uh, been a, a constant fixture on the House floor for the past several years, so every member knows Karen very well. And let me officially, on the record here, extend uh, congratulations to you, which I've done countless times in private, but uh, I'm happy to do that. And I know all of my colleagues 
join me in, in extending congratulations to you. And we're very anxious to hear your testimony, Karen. So thank you uh, very, very much for being here. And we want to encourage <coughs> you to turn on the microphone there so that our television audience can uh, enjoy it, as well as Mr. Gingry. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Madam Ranking Member, members of the committee. You might want to pull the I appreciate having the opportunity to appear before you today regarding the operations of the Office of the Clerk relating to the administration of the lobbying disclosure laws and in particular the current Lobbying Disclosure Act of 1995. With your permission, Mr. Chairman, I would appreciate the opportunity to summarize the statement I had submitted to the Mr. committee. Without objection, your statement will be included in the record. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I have served as the Clerk of the House for just over two months, but I have had some intensive on-the-job training coming on board close to when mandatory electronic filing became effective. I was able to witness firsthand how that project played out in the weeks leading up to the February 14 semi-annual filing deadline. Also, for five years earlier in my career, I worked in the Washington Government Affairs Office of a major public company. That is when I first became familiar with the rituals of lobbying registration and reporting, an experience that I feel provides me with added insight in my present position. We have been administering lobbying regulation and disclosure, excuse me, disclosure statutes on behalf of the House for over 60 years. We are, at the, we are the point of entry for filings, the House venue for public disclosure, and we monitor compliance for this and other statutory and regulatory filings required to be made to the House. When the Lobbying Disclosure Act was signed into law by the President in mid-December 1995, repealing the Federal Regulation of Lobbying Act, the Clerk and Secretary had only a few weeks to deploy common forms, instructions, and guidance. By the end of 1996, 3,359 firms and organizations had registered <clears throat> representing 10,073 <coughs> clients. Today, as we speak, our clerk staff is processing and beginning compliance review on the expected 20,027 reports to be received for the semi-annual fi <clears throat> semi filing period ending December 31, 2005. Those reports represent 4,934 registrants, accounting for 21,534 individual lobbyists. As the law requires filing with the House Clerk and the Senate Secretary, registrants have to deliver separate filings to both entities. Until a year ago, filers with the House could only file on paper. For disclosure in the House, we provide on-site electronic search and retrieval of lobbying filings and offer the public five search fields. Receiving a paper filing requires us to rekey to our database part of the information in the form and make such to make such retrieval possible. Also, we scan the filing so it can be viewed on our public terminals. Processing of all paper forms can run upwards of 45 to 60 days. Only after that data and those forms have been entered into our internal system, the process of com compliance review can begin. Receiving that information from the filer electronically makes those filings immediately available for public disclosure and allows for immediate compliance review. <clears throat> in my submitted testimony, I go into more detail of how, when, and why the clerk deployed an electronic lobbying filing program in December of 2004. Our system differs from the Senate fi <clears throat> electronic filing system, which was introduced in the year 2000. Ours uses an Adobe form an outsourced GSA ACES program compliant digital signature for authentication and secured transmission. In June 2005, House Administration Committee Chairman Robert Ney authorized the clerk to implement mandatory electronic lobbying act filing, effective January 1, 2006, <coughs> which coincided with the semi-annual report filing for the period December 31, 2005. Through cooperation with the Senate Secretary, we successfully modified our House form to allow filers the option to also transmit their data from the House form to the Senate's electronic database, provided they secured a Senate system password. By the filing deadline, we had approved close <clears throat> to 16,000 electronic filings of an expected 21,000 filings, nearly 70 percent. To date, that number has inched into 80 percent. Of that number, we have approved nearly 7,000 electronic filings on February 13th and 14th. <clears throat> Partially from the over 2,000 calls that our help desk staff responded to in the two weeks leading to the deadline, we are aware of problems filers experienced with our system. Our servers process the intake quite handedly. 
but we know filers had difficulty adjusting to the digital signature requirement and our workaround to an Adobe version problem. Many did wait until close to the deadline to first become familiar with the system and its requirements. I'd like to add here that our staff of the Legislative Resource Center and our legislative computer systems provided some of the finest help desk support I have ever witnessed or experienced. Regarding compliance, the Act precludes us from general audit or investigative authority. We monitor compliance based on those who have registered. Only when a firm or organization comes into our system through the registration process can our staff track a registrant to ensure they file semi-annual reports. We also look for errors and omissions, which forms filed electronically will be relatively a moot issue. The current law provides for referral to the U.S. Attorney of the District of Columbia if a lobbyist or lobbying firm has filed to respond satisfactorily within 60 days of a written notice from either the clerk or the secretary. At the outset with this new act, both sides agreed to issue two separate 30-day warning letters prior to sending the 60-day letter. The House has continued with this policy. The House and Senate also agreed that compliance was the respective responsibility of each of the filings it had received. Until 2001, the House had not referred any registrant to the U.S. Attorney. On the advice of the House Inspector General, following a year 2000 audit, my predecessor proceeded to the issuance of a 60-day letter and to the eventual referral of 238 entities accounting for 354 individual instances of failure to file semi-annual reports. As I stated earlier, now that we have electronic filing, we can move much more quickly to identify non-report filers. The system proactively prevents filers from making common errors and omissions. Although proposed changes in the law may affect how we administer the system in the future, we are pressing ahead to address the lessons learned in this first year of electronic filing. That includes pursuing with the Senate a more seamless interface, a resolution of the Adobe version issue, and continuing to work through GSA to better expand the availability of ACES vendors. I hope, Mr. Chairman, that I have provided the committee with a clear understanding of procedures and process that may be of relevance in the, any proposed legislation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you or the committee have. Well, thank you very much, Karen, and uh, congratulations on your uh, very thoughtful testimony and uh, the hard work that you've put in. And as you said at the outset, you've obviously taken on this task at a, a very challenging time. And um, I'd just like to uh, throw out one question. I know that all my colleagues will, will have uh, questions that they uh, will want to want to pose to you, but do you know when the Speaker and I unveiled the plan that uh, we uh, uh, referred to um, as being sort of our framework for reforms, uh, the key principles, one of the things that we addressed was this issue of moving from semi-annual to quarterly reporting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been included in virtually every reform package that is there. I mean, the fact that we've dealt with semi-annual reporting something that has created a huge lag time and I think that sort of common sense says that it should move to a more expeditious uh, schedule for reporting. And I wonder what kind of uh, challenge that would provide for you and your office as we, as we look at that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> it will be a challenge, but the key to that is the timing of when the decisions made to go forward and how much time we're given to, to allow us to put the process in order. If there are changes made to the current system, whether it would be in the forms that we current have, if additional information, all that would come into play with the quarterly filing. If you decide at this point just to move forward with quarterly filing, part of our role would then be to help educate the lobbying community of those changes and make additional changes to the instructions that we provide for filing. But it's something we could, we could move to fairly quickly once the decision's made. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you know, I have the uh, <clears throat> privilege of chairing the Subcommittee on Legislative and Budget Process. Uh, and this morning, uh, we had a, a meeting with outside experts on the budgetary process. And I was impressed at, at that meeting uh, with how the consensus among experts, international experts, as well as American, is that the budget process in the United States Congress is the most transparent in the world, as well as the most flexible and innovative in the world. And I was uh, 
very interested by your comments uh, this morning with regard to the extraordinary progress that as a nation, as well as as a Congress, we've made uh, in the area of transparency uh, and in the area of integrity. Uh, and so I, uh, while I have no questions for Ms. Haas, I have to leave now for a press conference. I know our experts uh, who are here to testify know how our schedules are, and I will try to return as soon as possible. I have an issue that I have to be at a press conference on with regard to Puerto Rico. But I wanted to say that as we delve into this most important issue, we do not uh, ignore the fact that this is a Congress of men of, and women of integrity, uh, that our rules with regard to tra transparency and integrity are the most developed in the world, and that while no human, no human endeavor is perfect, it certainly should be perfectible. And it is in that nature that we meet today and that we will continue to meet to further perfect this institution, which is a representative institution of this marvelous nation and an institution made up of honorable men and women. So I look forward to uh, uh, this and other hearings. Uh, and. Um, and to learning about ways in which we can further improve the great progress that we as a nation and as a Congress representative of this nation have made. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. diaz Blard, for those very thoughtful remarks and for your uh, hard work on your uh, subcommittee as well. Mrs. Slaughter. Well, Mr. Chairman, given that the FBI and the SEC are investigating a number of our members, I can't go on that premise that this is a house full of people full of integrity. But Ms. Haas, you are. Uh, and I have no questions for you. I just want to say I want to congratulate you on your appointment and say that I'm very pleased to see that take place. Uh, we all know you well. You have been on the floor for many years, and we've, we've come to know you and respect you a great deal. Thank so you. thank you for uh, I, I do hope that we are wise enough to give the resources that are needed to really allow this reporting to, to go forth. Um, because the figures that I've heard is that very few of the lobbying firms now even bother to file, uh, and without much of a process to really enforce uh, the fact that they must file and that there has to be a penalty for not filing, I think that that's, uh, that's something we have to really take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, and uh, Karen, I want to congratulate you on your elevation to the position that you now hold. But first, I want to associate myself with remarks that my friend from Florida made regarding uh, this institution and those of us that make up this, this institution. I think we sometimes we lose sight of that. Self-government is very, very difficult, mm -hmm. and we sh we ought to uh, we ought to look at the I think the positive side, and I think Mr. Diaz Ballard put it in that perspective. And I I want to just want to associate myself with his remarks. I do have one question uh, that. Um, uh, because there's been a lot of ideas that have been floating around and uh, uh, different parts of the government will be involved with that. But there have been calls for fully searchable database lobbying disclosure records uh, to be on the Internet. Uh, how might such a system be developed and could it include lobbying registration and disclosures submitted since the enactment of the Lobbying Disclosure Act? Sure. Um, Quite frankly, we've come a long way this last year with electronic filing, so we're much closer and in a much better position to move in that direction if, if that's the direction the Congress chooses to go. <clears throat> we could fairly quickly go to um, a searchable database with the information that's been filed electronically. One of the key questions is how much of that information you want to have available, how far back in the data you want to go, and that would take some more time. Currently, we have the information available on computer uh, terminals over in the Cannon Building. Go back to 1988. Um, the forms have changed over the years. So if we had a process where we wanted to immediately go and ha make the information available that's already provided by electronic filing, that could be done fairly quickly. And then we could work backwards and add that additional information that currently exists. But that would take a little bit more time, and it's a little bit more difficult on the technology end. But it is doable. It, it is doable, and, and probably we—is it—is it safe to say that we may be uh, 
uh, a little farther than what is anticipated if that were to be uh, requested? Absolutely. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Mr. McGovern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, Ms. Haas, thank you very much for your testimony. And, and I think all of us should be committed to making sure that as we hopefully go forward on some of these reforms that we provide your office with the resources and the funding it needs and the technology adjustments that it needs to be able to uh, to be able to imp uh, to be able to employ all the things that we put forward. Um, you know, I was interested. My colleague from Florida talked about how we have the greatest rules in the world, um, but the problem that many of us have is these rules are consistently ignored or waived. Um, that uh, the fact is, the rules are only as good as the people who enforce them. And um, I want to associate myself with the remarks of our ranking member, Mrs. Slaughter, uh, and applaud her for the legislation that. Um, She's an, she unveiled yesterday, along with others of us on the minority side, about how we can um, have more accountability within the House. Because this, I'll, I'll tell you this, to me, this problem is not just about uh, lobbyists. Bottom line is uh, we have all kinds of rules and regulations uh, on, on lobbyists. Uh, but if there are members of this institution that choose to skirt around those laws or ignore those laws, I mean, that's a problem. The problem really is here. Um, I'm for all these new reforms. I want to let the sun shine in. People should know as much as they want to know. But the fact of the matter is uh, what we should be focused on is this institution because we have an institutional problem here in the United States House of Representatives. I mean, you have an institutional problem when the democratic process is held in disdain. Um, you have a, an institutional problem when the rules of this House are regularly ignored or waived. Uh, you have an institutional problem when debate is squashed and deals are made behind closed doors. Uh, you have an institutional problem when the committee process is obliterated. Mr. Slaughter alluded to a bill that came before here yesterday that has the potential to impact millions and millions everybody. and millions of our citizens, everybody, on food labeling and safety issues. No hearings were held. Uh, oftentimes we have bills that come before our committee that don't even go through the committee of jurisdiction. They just show up here. Uh, we have bills that come up here that no one has an opportunity to read. You have an institutional problem when the, the time between the conferees sign off on a bill and it goes before the President of the United States to be signed into law, items are put in and then items are removed. Uh, I think you have an institutional problem here when campaign cash is more important than sound policy, when raising money is deemed uh, as more important than governing. Uh, you have an institutional problem when the, when the uh, when, uh, when the, uh, the laws uh, that are made here uh, cater more to corporate interests, whether it's uh, the drug industry with prescription drugs or the oil industry with regard to our energy bill, or I go on and on and on. The bottom line is we have an institutional problem when the Rules Committee, as I've said on many occasions, uh, is a place where democracy comes to die. So, I mean, we need to be talking about how we reform ourselves. Um, and. Uh, you know, here we are having a hearing on lobbying reform and, and how we can make this place better. Um, let's understand one thing. We're here because um, this thing has got out of control. We're here because there are indictments and the indicted are about are talking and there are more indictments and the public has had it. Um, this is nothing new. Uh, we're here because the majority party got caught with their hands in the cookie jar, quite frankly. I mean, we talk about the K Street project as if it's something new. Look, at, I, I, I did a search. I mean, these are all the articles on the K Street project going back to 1996. And now people are expressing some concern about uh, this innovative uh, way to, uh, to uh, get campaign cash. Uh, the issues with Mr. Abramoff have been around for a long, long, long time. This is nothing new. Um, but we're here today because all hell is bro broken loose. Um, and uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, you know, I appreciate the fact that we're having a hearing, and I'm a, I appreciate the fact that we're going to um, listen to some expert witnesses here, but quite frankly, the proof is in the pudding. Um, this is a long time in coming. Um, you know, if, if the other side, quite frankly, were interested in reform, we would have been doing this thing a long time ago. Um, the fact of the matter is this place has become corrupted. It is accurate to say that there is a culture of corruption here. Um, you see it in the legislation, and you see it in the way we do business here. Um, and my hope is that uh, enough pressure will be brought to bear by, uh, by the American people that, in fact, uh, if for no other reason out of self-preservation, uh, that a majority in this House will, uh, will amend the rules 
and do what I think is right, and that is make this House of Representatives truly the people's house once again. So I thank you very much for your, your testimony, and um, again, I stand willing to help any way I can and support uh, you in any efforts in terms of funding and resources that you may need to be able to comply with hopefully what will be some new regulations that will come down the road. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. McGovern. Let me say that many of the uh, <laughs> ideas that you've uh, raised are, excuse me, are, many of the ideas that you've raised are clearly uh, uh, going to be addressed in the uh, legislation that we uh, proceed with. Mr. Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Clerk, welcome. Thank you. I, uh, I'm only in my third term. But, uh, you know, it, in, in, in late night votes and things like that, you hear some of the folks who have been around a little longer talking about the way things used to be. And, uh, and, and I'm just curious, is it true that in, in the good old days uh, when there was a, an, another party in charge that, that members at, at some point could, could keep all their office money that was left over at the end of their term and pay taxes on it, but then keep it for personal use? Did that, did that really ever happen? I can't answer that. Or, or, that, or that there was proxy voting where everybody except the chairman could leave and you could come in to, to present your bill and there'd just be one guy sitting there or, or, one, or one other member of Congress sitting there and, and they'd be able to just pull out all these pieces of paper and, 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 and vote the will of the committee without anybody except one person being there? To, is, that, is that something that's part of our past? Something I couldn't speak to. Okay. Well, I, I, I've just heard all these stories about these, you know, you'd be able to convert all your campaign cash to personal use. You could, every day somebody would show up at your office delivering a bucket of ice to you and, and all these just wild and crazy things that seemed like they were just totally out of control with, uh, with what the reality ought to be in, in this public service. Tell me, uh, tell me a little bit more about the Inspector General's report from 2000 that you referred to in your testimony. Sure. <clears throat> um, back in 2000 and in 2001, the House Inspector General decided <clears throat> to undertake an audit of all documents that were coming into the clerk. So there are several different types of documents that were required to be filed with the office of the clerk. At that time, uh, the primary pur purpose of the audit was to assess the management controls that were in place and to also look at the public disclosure to make sure the information that was supposed to be available to the public was available to the public. In the course of that audit, um, they discovered that the letters, the 30-day letters, reminder letters that had needed to be sent out for the lobbying disclosures were being sent, but that the 60-day letter had not been sent. So at the conclusion of that audit, the clerk began sending out the 60-day letters. And once those 60-day letters were sent out, we now are at the point where we have referred 354 individuals to the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia. So that was the result of that audit at that point in time. So that Inspector General audit you, you found to be a, a pretty effective way of making those absolutely, determinations? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, if what my colleague from uh, Florida say is, uh, is true, my good friend, that in the good old days, um, uh, the things that he described um, uh, were true, uh, then they were abhorrent. Uh, however, that doesn't absolve us in the new good old days uh, from uh, ignoring uh, the Jefferson Manual, abiding uh, the rules, and allowing for equanimity in this process, um, and allowing uh, the minority voices uh, to be heard. Um, it was abhorrent then, and it is abhorrent now. And I would assume that's in part why we are here. Uh, some of our witnesses have been around long enough to have witnessed this abhorrence uh, on both sides, the majority being under Democrats and under uh, Republicans. It doesn't make it go away. If it stunk then, it stinks now. And so we just have to deal with it. Ms. Haas, thank you. Um, I join and echo uh, the love fest in uh, welcoming you. Uh, as you know, um, I um, uh, have great respect for not only uh, uh, your abilities, but your uh, fairness and your comprehensive approach to what is obviously a very um, uh, tedious job uh, that's unheralded 
here in the House of Representatives. Most people don't even know what you do that are members of the House. Uh, that said, um, all of us do, and we deeply appreciate uh, your efforts in the two months that you've been there. I do note in your uh, prepared testimony uh, that you speak to uh, pursuing a seamless interface with the Senate and also getting a handle on the Adobe version. Yes, sir. Um, I, I would appreciate it if you would just um, elucidate for a moment um, uh, your uh, feeling as to what progress, if any, you're making at this time. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, the Senate problem in particular, as you're probably aware, the Senate started electronic filing in 2000. Um, it is not a mandatory system. Um, we, as you know, made our system mandatory with this recent filing. Uh, one of the problems that existed is that we have two very dis different systems in place at this time. So for the lobbying community, they needed to submit information on both sides. Um, the problem existed in that because the systems are very different, the House system did not immediately allow the lobbying community to then submit their information to the Senate side. We were able to create what we call a work, a, a work around or a band-aid approach to allow uh, individuals that needed to file they could create their information on our form, submit it to the House, and then they would have to go back to that form and put a Senate ID in and allow it then to be forwarded to the Senate. They could also print out that form on a paper version and submit it on paper, as again, it's not required to be electronic on the Senate side. So at this point, it does allow the lobbying community to have a one stop shop in the House to submit. However, it's not the best way to proceed, and we do need to make additional progress on making it a more seamless approach for the lobbying community. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the other issue that you mentioned was the Adobe issue. When the clerk first came out with this electronic filing process, Adobe had a 6.0 version, and that was the process, that was the version that we went with when we were constructing our current system. Um, as we continued through this year, Adobe came out with a newer version, and at that time, once the digital signature was applied to the document, it then corrupted the file. So it created a problem for the lobbying community with this newer version. Um, the, we, the way that the lobbying community is able to get around it, and we provided this information in several formats, is to go back to the 6.0 version. Um, and what that requires them to do if they have the newer version is to remove the newer version from their system and download the older version. There's no expense involved in that change. It's just difficult and one more step that we're asking the community to take. Right. You had one other uh, matter uh, that you cited to, and that is that you want to continue um, uh, your work through GSA to better expand the availability of ACES or ACS or, or vendors. I've had a lot of experience in my life in dealing with GSA. And when we finish lobbying reform, we may get around to bureaucracy reform, but I, I doubt that very seriously. Let me urge you, um, uh, Ms. Haas, um, notwithstanding all of this magnificent technology that seems to overtake itself with each passing day with newer technology, uh, to always have in your office, in addition to yourself, um, uh, someone that has institutional memory um, and be able to call upon them, even if they're retired, to come in and give you assistance when the new way doesn't work on a given day. Uh, you need some people that can think and can write. I use the airlines as a good example. The system goes down. There are people in the airline industry that all they ever worked with was electronic stuff. They don't know how to write a ticket. You know what I'm saying? Mm, so <laughs> make sure that you have somebody around that can do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Hastings, and let me assure you that bureaucracy reform is something that we spend a great deal of time and energy on and Absolutely. pursue every single day. Absolutely. Um, I understand that uh, Dr. Gingry is uh, headed down to the uh, House floor, and so uh, the three colleagues who are in line ahead of him have just agreed to allow him to uh, proceed with questions. So, Dr. Gingry. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I thank my colleagues for extending me that courtesy, and Ms. Haas, thank you uh, so much for being with us this morning. I, I want to make a few comments. I do have a couple of questions, and if I have to leave before uh, you respond to those, I'll certainly check the record and look forward uh, to your answers. Uh, I, I want to uh, take a moment to express uh, my uh, extreme 
uh, displeasure with uh, some of the comments that were made from the other side regarding uh, the fact that this majority uh, has done nothing but uh, pass uh, laws written by corporate America in exchange for uh, campaign contributions. I think that that is absolutely uh, a misstatement uh, in, 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 in contrary to the facts. Uh, this uh, majority, uh, in the time that I have been here, in the two years that I have served, uh, has passed meaningful tax cuts uh, which uh, give the American people more fairness, simplicity, flatness. Uh, and I'm talking about things like uh, in lowering marginal rates, increasing tax child credits, elimination of the marriage tax penalty, incentivizing small businessmen and women to grow their businesses, help create uh, over four million new jobs in the last three and a half years, giving us an economy uh, that's been the strongest that we have ever seen in the 70s, 80s, and 90s with an unemployment rate uh, of lower than, than 6 percent. I think the last number would, uh, nationally was about 5.6 percent. 4.7 percent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, GDP growing at, at, a, at a rate of over 4 percent for uh, 30 straight months. Uh, more home ownership than we have ever seen uh, in the history of this country. So that's what uh, this, this majority has done in regarding to presenting meaningful legislation. And I could go on and on and on. Uh, I will mention things like class action reform, tort reform, association health plans, the opportunity that this House ha is trying to give to the American people to reduce the uh, rate of, of the uninsured from some 41 million. We all agree it's too high. Uh, but we get resistance every step of the way on every measure that we have tried to, to pass and, and, and fortunately have been, ever, been, ever, been able to pass in this House, sometimes with very, very narrow margins, certainly uh, talking about giving a prescription drug benefit to needy seniors who for 40 years have been asking for this. Uh, and most of that time, our friends on the other side of the aisle were in control. Uh, the fact that included in that uh, bill was, a, was an opportunity uh, for health savings accounts, just like a, uh, a, an IRA for health care. And, and, and these, these are the things that this majority has done. So for the other side to suggest that there's corruption in this process because our legislation makes good business sense, makes good health sense for the American people, creates jobs, and, and we end up with a strong, solid economy. I say uh, congratulations to this majority. Now, clearly, this, this issue of, of ethics reform, uh, and, and it was said by my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, needs to be addressed in a bipartisan fashion. And I, I am so thrilled to have the opportunity to be at this hearing, to hear from the witnesses, to hear from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And at the end of the day, for us to come together in a way that we can agree, uh, we can take uh, some of the suggestions that Ms. Lauder has made uh, in the Democratic package. We can take some of the suggestions that we'll make on, on this side of the aisle uh, and do this in a bipartisan fashion because this problem is, is not unique to one part or the other. It's, it's a situation that has been allowed to develop over a long period of time. With that, Ms. Haas, let me do ask you a couple of questions specifically. Are you aware uh, how many, you, you mentioned to us earlier that there were more referrals to the Justice Department. Are you aware of how many prosecutions and or convictions have resulted from referrals from the Office of the Clerk to the Department of Justice? And then the, the second question I would like to ask very quickly. Uh, we have seen what many regard, uh, and it's been mentioned, as abuses of existing lobbying and ethics standards on both sides of the aisle. To what degree are these cases a lack of enforcement of existing prohibitions, and what can we do about that? Sure. Um, I can't speak <clears throat> to uh, what the Justice Department has done. I can only speak to the referrals that we have sent over, the 354 referrals. Um, 
the second part of your question, I guess, when it comes to the enforcement mechanism and the compliance, one of the important things I'd like you to take away from this hearing is that um, we are only as good as those, uh, our operation is only as good as the people that have filed. So we can only go back and look at compliance based on those individuals who have filed with us. That's how we go about going back to see whether or not someone is, has complied with their quarter, their uh, semi-annual filings. So. Um, that is just the way the current system exists and how we have to go about with our compliance mechanism. Okay. Thank you very much. Mrs. Matsui. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Haas, I want to congratulate you on your new role. I'm sure that you're finding it challenging and probably fulfilling at the same time. And with your great experience, I know that we're really in good hands. Um, and I really, um, very heartened by the fact that you're understanding that the system has to work in order for us to proceed with the, uh, the lobbying reform that we want to do. And I was concerned at how long it would take to actually integrate or make compatible the Senate and the House way of filing electronically. That's a very good question, and I'm not sure that I can give you an accurate answer. Uh, maybe if I tell you a little bit about the differences of the current systems, and it would be a very, it'll be a very big challenge. Um, we currently have a system that's based on a form-based system, mm -hmm. where the Senate system is based on a password system that's a database system. So at this point, um, they are not compatible. Um, so it would take, it's going to be a technological challenge to go down that road. It's something we can do, clearly, but we need the time and the resources to make that happen. Mm, thank okay. you very much. And I just want to just uh, comment on a couple of comments to um, Mr. Gingrey, who will be down on the floor with me, I think, on the food safety bill. I just want to say that um, I've not been in Congress that long. It will be a year next week that I've been a member of Congress. And um, maybe because of the fact I haven't been in Congress that long, I'm awfully close to my constituents, and they talked with me a lot, and particularly young people. And I'm very, very disappointed and very saddened by the fact that young people don't have a great deal of respect for the federal government. Um, they really are very cynical. And I feel that that does not not good for us as a country at all. And um, part of the concerns that I have is that, yes, we have gone through and looked at a lot of bills here, but um, we really haven't had a lot of debate. And my concern is, is that, as Mr. Dr. Gingery has said, that, yes, we looked at, you know, makes strong economic sense, business sense. I understand that because I want my business community also prosper. However, I don't want um, anything around here to just be bottom line. Because I hear from my seniors, and I hear from my young families, and I, I hear that they don't have the support they need, the access to health care, um, the prescription drug benefit, which we all agree is a good thing when, in the sense that we, they need to have it. Is so confusing, it's even frustrating them further. I think that people don't feel that they have a representative. They feel very strongly that the system has closed down. And I don't like that at all. Process is a very boring thing. The process is important. We, when we teach our children, we very much try to explain to them why it's important to go from one step to another. And here, yes, we're talking about lobbying before. Yes, we need to do that. But we have to look at why it's gotten to where it has gotten. And my sense is that I know that we have a lot of amendments that we would like to make in order for the food safety bill, for example, which really preempts California and their high standards of food safety. And I must say that I feel like we can keep talking on this side of the aisle about how important it is to have some of these amendments made in order. The American public wonders why they're not being heard. And it would be wonderful, and I think it would be actually um, quite refreshing to hear the debate, because I know a lot of you on the other side of the aisle 
also believe that there are some things, for instance, in the food safety bill that need to be changed. Uh, and I think that, yes, some of the things should be nationalized, but don't bring our standards down in California to do that. I'm just saying this, not pointing fingers at all, but just saying that, yes, we do want lobbying reform, but yes, we want transparency, not only in lobbying, but also transparency in our process here in the House of Congress. That's what we'd like. So I am very happy that you're here helping us with the lobbying uh, aspects of it, and I would like to have my colleagues uh, together address some of our concerns. Thank you. Well, Mrs. Matsui, thank you very much uh, for that. Before I call on my colleagues, I'd like to make just a, uh, a couple of remarks. First of all, uh, when you noted that uh, you're approaching the first anniversary of your service here, of course, it brought back the memory of your wonderful husband, Bob, and we are uh, still to this day very sad with his passing, but uh, very, very happy and proud of, of your service as the uh, finally getting another Californian on this committee, which uh, brought a, an important perspective here, is something that we appreciate, so we're, we're happy that you're here. As I look out in the audience, I have worked with uh, virtually every member of the, uh, of the panel that will be joining us uh, following Ms. Haas, and uh, I've often quoted my friend Tom Mann, who 15 years ago reminded me of the fact that uh, Thomas Jefferson referred to the need for a healthy skepticism on the part of the American people towards their elected officials. And I do credit him regularly when I quote this. And he said 15 years ago that tragically we've shifted from a healthy skepticism to what you described, Mrs. Matsui, as a corrosive cynicism. And I believe that the continued struggle to shift from that corrosive cynicism back to the Jeffersonian vision of a healthy skepticism is something that we need to continue to strive to do on a very regular basis. And I will say that, um, just building on what Mr. Gingrey said, I'm, I'm proud of many of the things that we've done, providing a guaranteed motion to recommit, uh, since you were talking about substance, that was often denied us when we were in the minority. I'm very proud of the fact that if you look at the number of bipartisan and democratic amendments that have been made in order in this Congress, there have been more of those than there have been Republican amendments made in order. So can we continue to work towards greater reform? Absolutely. We very much want to continue to do that in a bipartisan way. Mrs. Slaughter and I were just talking a moment ago, and I believe, uh, as I said earlier in my remarks, worked with a wide range of Democrats on that. And I uh, am continuing to be open to uh, recommendations as to how we can work to uh, improve this. Um, I, I don't want to get, I mean, No, I just, just don't want to leave the impression that, uh, that, that there's a consensus on this Mr. committee that this committee is being run in a bipartisan way. I never said that. Way. I never yeah. said that the committee is being run in a bipartisan way. What I'm saying is, is that we've worked in a bipartisan way on a wide range of issues. So let me call on Mrs. Well, Capito before now. Before you do, if I could just do some back this, this corrosive cynicism, I, I just wanted to say to my good friend, Mr. Putnam, uh, members have never had money given to them, and money is allocated, the money bills are all paid by the finance office. I, I can't believe there was ever any time when members went away with money. Secondly, there was a time when some committees, not rules, uh, did use proxy voting, but it was done on a, uh, an agreement between majority and minority. And at any time, a minority member could have come in and objected to that. Uh, the Democrats did away with proxy voting. I was chairman of the Organization Study and Review uh, at the time when we did that, we did away with a couple of committees and a lot of subcommittees and proxy voting. So, so there was never a time when you were allowed to retire and convert your campaign cash into personal use? Your campaign cash. I think you're talking about your, your MRA. Well, I mean, I was asking about both. Well, I think campaign cash, as far as I understand it, that's controlled by the state in which you live. Let me just say that well, I'm very well, sorry that I responded to Mrs. Matsui. So. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations, Karen, uh, you. on your uh, service for the future for the House. Uh, I would like to ask some very basic questions on the lobbying disclosure forms uh, that you all have. Not being, I'm going to plead my ignorance here, not being familiar, I would ask that these forms become part of the record so we can actually see them. But could you tell me briefly what 
is disclosed in a lobbying disclosure form. Sure. It's really some very basic information, uh, depending on whether you're an organization or a firm filing, but it's name, address, email, phone number, that basic information, as well as if you're an organization, any money expended for lobbying, if you're a firm, um, the costs that are involved with lobbying during a six-month period, as well as the issues that you are lobbying on, and we ask that you list the bill numbers and sections, depending. Um, and then in addition to that, whether or not you've contacted a branch of the, uh, either the House of the Congress or one of the federal agencies. So those are kind of the, the major areas that are covered in the file. Okay, so specifically, <clears throat> it's not disclosed what specific office or what specific committee Correct. might have been, just generally. Have House, you? Senate, or federal agency. Okay. Um, then you, I noticed in your comments that you have a helpline and you've had over 2,000 phone calls and a helpline. Obviously, there's a lot of gray area here. You wouldn't have that many questions. Is there a predominant area where questions are asked? Sure. The reason why we had so many questions this time around is, is because of the mandatory electronic filing. And the issues that were of most concern really were problems people had either with the Adobe issue problem that we had and we had to walk, work through that issue with the individual filers or with the electronic um, digital signature, which was very new to a lot of the filers. So those were the two issues. I and mean, we had some people, quite frankly, that were just not um, technologically savvy. Mm -hmm. And so our folks would stay on the phone with them and walk them through every step of the process so they were able to file electronically. Okay, and also, in that you said it's disclosed the, the amounts of money that are spent. Are there a lot of questions as to what money, if, if I spent money doing this, does that count? If I spent money doing that, does this count? I mean, is this an area that needs to be looked at in more depth? Obviously, this is where a lot of the questions are coming. Sure. We, we get some of those questions. This particular go-round was more about the electronic filing specifically, but yes, we do, and we're very limited to what information we can provide to those questions. Okay. Well, I'm firmly committed to this process, and for my little um, edge of the, uh, of the uh, debate here today, I would like to say, we need good, healthy debate, but where I think we lose the American public is when we throw mud in the debates, where we don't debate in a civil tone, where we don't respect one another's position, and we try to draw in all other, throw everything in the handbasket in, just to try to uh, get our position out there. So I would say that this is something that I'm working on in a bipartisan way to, to uh, lift the level of our debate so that the American people won't become cynical about us. And the other thing I'd like to say is I think the vast majority of everybody here in Congress, I'm talking 98 percent of the people, maybe even 99.9, .9, are here to do for the right thing, for the right reasons, and to conduct ourselves with integrity. And I thank you for everything you do to help us do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Gosh, after, uh, after uh, Ms. Capito's speech, boy, she defanged me pretty good. I've got to behave <laughs> a lot better than I, than I might have otherwise. But I want to make a couple of remarks, and then I've, I've got a series of questions, but I would be remiss not to start, uh, Karen, if I may call you Karen, because that's what I've always uh, called you, <laughs> instead of ma maybe Madam Clerk would be better in this format, uh, how delighted we all are on both sides of the aisle that you have the position that you have and how much confidence we have in you and frankly, as the American people and, and other uh, people that pay attention to the House uh, in an expert capacity, uh, watch your performance. Uh, they'll understand why you're held in such high regard as a person of integrity and great ability. So thank you for your service in so many ways, and we're delighted you're in the position you are. Uh, we've had a lot of history lessons here today. As an old historian, I actually liked it when the chairman began going all the way well back into the 19th century and reminding us how much the process over time tends to improve. But the improvement is usually in fits and starts and usually after some backsliding. And that's part of the normal process of a reform. At least any of my friends uh, on the other side ever think that either side has a monopoly on virtue or vice. I would just ask them to go back and read Brooks Jackson's old book, uh, Honest Graft, in the 1980s. It'll reacquaint them with their uh, immediate past. And John Barry's great book, uh, The Power and the Ambition. Uh, both of those are excellent, and frankly, they'll, they'll tell you about what some of the defects of the institution and the practitioners were at that particular point in time. Uh, we did have a great fit of reform uh, for a while. I'm very proud, uh, frankly, of the Congress, but particularly of the majority for, for uh, making some changes, requiring laws uh, be pa that are passed to apply to Congress, uh, ending proxy voting, requiring open committee votes at markups. Uh, uh, requiring all bills be posted electronically. Those were good things. I would also tell you, though, they were much more about uh, about shedding light on the legislative process as opposed to lobbying. 
process, which we're here to talk about. So I think it's probably going to get some attention that it hasn't gotten in the past and that it, uh, it ought, to, uh, ought to receive. And again, at least I'd be too partisan in these remarks. I think bringing C-SPAN in was a great reform under a Democratic uh, uh, era in terms of opening up the process to visibility. So I, again, I think both sides will end up having a lot to do. And I suspect at the end of the day, Mr. Chairman, I don't know where we'll end up. We'll end up probably with a bipartisan bill. It'll probably either, it can be either a bipartisan good bill where both of us uh, on each side decide, uh, you know, this can probably work well and this is what we think as members needs to happen so that we can legislate effectively and the American people can have confidence in what we do and, and know what we do, have transparency, or it'll be a bipartisan bad bill. We'll pass a lot of things that, that seem attractive and sound good if you don't really know the procedure and, uh, uh, and we'll have a race at the bottom. We'll make the place more unlivable than it is. You'll, you'll encourage more members to leave early, uh, and that's sad because I do think it takes time to build up expertise and knowledge and, and frankly, even to form the human relationships you need to, to have to be effective in the body. Uh, having said all those things, let me ask you this. I, I view your, you here in your particular role, because we're going to have, obviously, uh, some other distinguished people to talk to us about maybe some of the reforms that we need to do, and it's almost unfair to put you in the position uh, to, to ask that. But it seems to me there's three areas that you are the preeminent expert on uh, or your, your operation is, and you can really help us. The first, and you've discussed some of these in your remarks and in your uh, testimony, is transparency. The second uh, is, uh, to some degree, accountability. That, and when I mean accountability, I don't mean in terms of punishing or rewarding. I mean making people accountable for the quality of the information they provide you, that they're obligated. And finally, the ease of access to that material. And you've laid out uh, to us in good detail some of the, uh, some of the operations that are now underway to, to uh, try and enhance that, some of the tools we have, frankly, that earlier eras didn't have in terms of uh, the Internet, electronic filing, that sort of thing. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you just to step back from the way your operation works today, because I think we all agree if you come to us with requests for resources, that needs to be pretty seriously considered to do those things. From what you know at this point and what you know as a longtime observer, what are the things in the clerk's office, or more broadly if you care to uh, speculate on them, that one, you think we need to do to be more transparent? What other kinds of information are you getting requests about uh, in large numbers and that you would regard as legitimate requests uh, that we're not providing? What, what things can we, and what, what transparency tools do you need? I know you'll want to satisfy the public and, and again, people that are students of the House and uh, have a, you know, media that has a vested interest in reporting it. What things do you need that you don't have, either rule-wise or technology-wise? Sure. Um, <clears throat> from the transparency side, I think part of that comes to, into the decisions that are made here and in future lobbying um, legislation as to what information we want to request from the lobbying community. Um, as I was telling Ms. Capito, we have very basic information that we ask for right now. Um, in addition to that information, it's how that information is made available. Um, we now make it available on computer terminals only over in the Cannon House office building. If the decision was made to go to the Internet, um, I think one of the keys there is then to look at the, we currently have five ways to search for information on the filings. I think we want to look at broadening um, the information so that people could, who want to look for that information, be able to look at many different ways to search information. Um, that's something that we don't currently have. Um, it would take some technology improvements um, and, and resources, as I mentioned, but that's something that can be done. Um, I think the other, th the other part of this, and um, it, it was played out actually recently in a Washington Post um, article, um, the fact that we have gone to electronic filing, and as I mentioned in my testimony, of the 16,000 filings that came in at the appropriate time, 7,000 of those came in the last two days with the filing deadline. But once that information was received in our database, it was immediately available to the public, to the press, whoever wanted it. So there was an article that appeared in the Washington Post about six days after the, the February 14th deadline, and it referred to information that was available at the House Cannon Office Building um, site. And that information six months ago or a year ago would not have been available that quickly because we've moved to the electronic system. We now, assuming people file and file on time and file electronically, that information is available immediately. Um, where we still have a problem, quite frankly, is that we don't have everybody filing electronically. 
and we still have some paper filings coming in, and that's a problem that will also go to this transparency issue. And um, because we are still in the process now of making that information available, going through the old process of scanning those documents and keying in key information so that people can then retrieve uh, that information publicly. Let me ask you this question as a follow-up. You, you said if the decision is made sure. to go to the Internet, Correct. do you have a personal opinion on that one way or the other as to whether or not that would be a good thing? What, what do you see as the advantages and the disadvantages of that uh, particular approach? Um, you know, I guess my personal view is that information is available now, and it's, the more you can make it available to the public, the better it is. Okay. Let me ask you this, too. In terms of the, the kinds of information that you're now receiving that people are required to file, are you getting a lot of requests for different kinds of information than those that are publicly available? In other words, can we say, you know, we got it about right in terms of what we're asking people, whether they're doing it or not, but uh, do you think there's other kinds that you're, again, getting a lot of attention, a lot of requests for that just simply not available? We're not asking people to provide. At this point, the, the individuals that are coming and in seeking information, we're not hearing complaints from them that certain information isn't available. Um, so at this point, I'd have to say no, but I'm sure if we just, you know, the more information we make available, people are going to be anxious to get that information. This, this probably isn't a fair question to ask you, or maybe even one you can, you can address, but I'd, I'd like your opinion insofar as you can give it. Uh, you know, you can have information on file, accessible, but it doesn't mean it's the truth. It doesn't mean it's accurate or complete. Uh, and frankly, as you said, you get a lot of, uh, of last-minute reports. I, just like most Americans, I mean, I, I'll, I'll be the first to confess, if I've ever filed my income tax before April 14th, I don't know about it. Uh, you know, I'm usually right there in line with the last people because it, it both takes a while and I'm lazy uh, and I've got other things to do. And I suspect you've got the same mentality. But, uh, you know, that aside, are you, do you have any way of measuring whether or not, frankly, the information you're being told uh, is accurate and therefore when republic or when the public looks at it or when the media looks at it that they have some level of confidence that hey this is the truth we do not is there any uh, and again I'm, I'm educating myself on this uh, that that is not necessarily your function but uh, uh, whose function is that to, de to determine to do a spot check to take a look anybody's uh, not at this point, unless, you know, I guess the Inspector General would be another, excuse me, the uh, House IG would be another, uh, an avenue for an audit. But uh, at this point, that does not, there's, there's nothing in the works that I'm aware of. So probably the real risk would be if somebody filed information that weren't accurate, that weren't, I mean, then they could, you know, if they ended up in an investigation situation and somebody, okay, this is what you filed, but this is what we find looking at your records. You would, but, but it's sort of like the income tax. I mean, most Americans don't get audited, a very small percentage do, but as far as you know, we have no ability to systematically audit, no, and no arm of government does to systematically audit or occasionally pick one out and say, hey, we're just going to take a check here because it looks pretty unusual. Right. To speak for our operation exclusively, we have no audit authority and no investigative authority at all at this point. Yeah. Well, would you want that? I'm not sure that it's appropriate. I think uh, that's something that would need to be looked into, but I'm not sure it's appropriate. Uh, last, uh, last question. You've answered this uh, in part. I want to go to the issue of access, uh, because you have an enormous amount of information, obviously, that you're responsible for reporting and recording. Uh, you've sort of discussed this with the Internet, but are there other things in terms of access to the information? I mean, everybody agrees, whatever our disagreements on specific proposals, the, the litany I keep hearing, which I think is a good one, is one, transparency, which to me means access as well, you know, not just looking on the Internet, but access, physical access, uh, 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 accountability. Those are the two principles that we're trying to reach. So do you have any thoughts on things that would make the information you have more accessible other than just the Internet? Um, I think that's, I would say, for this particular type of information, really the Internet is, is the the most logical way to proceed. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you for your, uh, your service, and uh, you give a lot of us a great deal of confidence that you're in the position you're in. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, uh, too, would like to congratulate you on your position. I, you're going to do a, a marvelous job of that, I am sure. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having uh, this meeting. Um, 
and especially having it televised. Cause I'm looking at that, that light over there, and I really think I'm getting a leg up on my summer tan. <laughs> so I hope we do this a lot more often. Um, one of the advantages of being the last one here is you don't have to listen to me as, as much because everything else has been, has been asked at this stage of the game. So I just have a few specific questions for you. In your office, how many FTEs work on this reporting portion, the collecting of the data? Sure. There's a total of approximately 22. We have a smaller group that's completely dedicated to this. But for the overall, we have a, a resource of 22 individuals that we pull in that includes our IT folks as well as our record and registration people. Is that full-time FTEs that work on this issue? That's correct. OK. Um, if of the 354 that were sent over, you, yes, you said they've been sent over so far, and yet there has been no adjudication on those issues. Uh, no, I didn't say there had not been any adjudication. We just do not follow up on whether or not there's been convictions. Um, so we only, oh, at this point, only track those that we have forwarded to the U.S. Attorney. All right, and that was 354 who did not file. Correct. Correctly, or adequately. Correct. It, the list that you maintain of lobbyists, is there any way of that you have of purging that list other than people just not filing and then referring it somewhere else. Do you have a way of, of ascertaining who is no longer a lobbyist and then should be left off? Yes and no. Um, we don't purge the list. Um, how we handle um, individuals that are inactive, we keep them on the list, but they, uh, individuals are required to file a termination filing. So they remain in our system. Um, when we, you've seen lots of numbers, I'm sure, thrown around about the number of lobbyists and who's filed and who hasn't. Um, when I speak to the House specifically, we count the members, the individual lobbyists that are active lobbyists. So the numbers that you hear in my testimony, um, we have other individuals that remain in our system, but they are in, inactive at this point. And they have to do an actual termination Correct. filing to get that status. Correct. If I could just follow up on, on what uh, Congressman Cole said simply about checking the accuracy of the reports. If um, we were to come up with a system in which members were to submit also some kind of filing or list of their action or interaction with lobbyists, mm -hmm. would that be a way of, of cross-checking the reports that are given to you by the lobbyists themselves? Um, if, you, if the decision was made to go down that road and also require the lobbyists to make similar, absolutely, that would be a way to cross-check. What would that do to the size of your office, though? <laughs> Um, it would, um, well, it would be an increased demand and it's something we'd have to look at for additional resources. If we were to piddle around in any way, shape, or form then with the definition of a lobbyist, uh, in, which I'm assuming is still in statute somewhere, mm -hmm. what, is a, what is a lobbyist? If we were to change the standards, go after the so-called grassroots lobbyist, or, sure. or look at those who are receiving uh, some kind of compensation that's not necessarily in the form of actual but indirect compensation, would, once again, you require greater staff time. Could you handle that with the, the 22 FTEs you have now? Well, it again, it would depend on the extent of the change. Um, I think uh, one of the things or a few of the things that you would um, want to consider if you want to um, go down that road, um, well, yes, we could handle it. We leave it at that. That's a gutsy statement. Thank you for that one. <laughs> I appreciate that. Let me just do two last things. I. Okay. I, I told you before, I hate the say, phrase, I wish to associate myself with com I wish to associate myself with comments of the, the clerk, because she's the one here that knows what she's talking about. And I feel safe with that, with, with the one caveat being um, talking about people who are not technologically savvy. Um, if it's written on a legal pad, it's, it's from God. <laughs> I'm still convinced that we had the internet at the time of Noah, and that was indeed the cause of the flood. So besides that, you're going in that direction. And I don't know if it's been said yet, but in, in a meeting I was at a, a while ago, someone gave a great quote in which she said, there are two things that Congress does well, uh, nothing and overreacting. And I, have, I realize that what we are trying to do is now split that difference. And Mr. Chairman, I, I have confidence that with your leadership, we're going to be able to split that difference and come up with something that is neither nothing nor is it going to be overreacting. Nothing or overreacting. Well, that's a great challenge that we have. And I thank you uh, very much for that, uh, Mr. Bishop. And I thank you very much. Again, congratulations, Karen. You've done a superb job in your first uh, opportunity to testify before a congressional committee and you're doing a superb job as clerk we're all very very proud of you and and uh, happy that you're here so thanks for your for your fine work and let me just say that uh, I know that there may be other questions we had some very thoughtful questions offered and 
And I'd like to, uh, without objection, have the hearing record uh, remain open for 30 days so that members on either side of the aisle could ask questions of, of the clerk uh, and similarly of the next panel that we will have before us. So thank you very much thank for you. being here. And um, let me say that we uh, are going to uh, move to our second panel. I'll apologize in saying that unlike other committees, as you've certainly noticed, the Rules Committee provides a wide range of latitude uh, rather than complying strictly to the five-minute rule. So, Gentlemen, please come forward, and uh, I will introduce you. I, we got a team that's going to help you uh, get whatever you need there, glasses of water and all. Let me just at the outset say that as I looked at the list of, uh, of witnesses, uh, it's interesting. I've, I've, uh, our former colleague, Mr. Bacchus, is here. We're going to begin with him, but I've uh, worked closely over the years with uh, with Mr. Uh, Thurber and Mr. Mann and Mr. Ornstein and Mr. Wertheimer. And uh, the only person I haven't really worked with is the lobbyist who's here. So uh, that's kind of a, as I looked at the, the list of our six witnesses. And so uh, I'm uh, very, very happy to uh, welcome all of you. And I will say at the outset that uh, without objection, your prepared statements will uh, be uh, included in the record. And any uh, summation that you'd like to provide, we would certainly uh, welcome. And, and uh, we don't Chairman? have quite as many. Oh, yes. Just, 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 you, you, you earlier made a reference to Daniel Webster in the opening. Um, yes, I just want, for the historical record, I want to clarify that even though he's from Massachusetts, he was a Whig, and that later became the basis for the formation of the Republican Party. So I just thought that was important to clarify. Absolutely. And so, right. you, so you, you, you've, much, underscored, right? you've, underscored, you've underscored very clearly, as Mr. Cole said, that obviously there's uh, no corner on the issue of, uh, of uh, corruption and challenges that we face. So thank you very much for that. Let's begin with our distinguished former colleague, uh, Mr. Bacchus, who is uh, here representing the Greenberg Toro Group. He's the chairman of uh, Global Trade Practice Group. Uh, so please uh, welcome back. It's nice to see you. Thank you very much, and uh, look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Committee on Rules. Uh, my name is Jim Bacchus, and I am indeed an attorney with the Greenberg Troy <laughs> Law Firm. I am also, uh, among other things, a registered lobbyist as uh, a part of uh, a broad international law practice. I work from time to time with the executive branch of the federal government on a number of international trade issues for clients of our firm. I am also, as you're kind enough to recall, a, a former member of Congress from the state of Florida. And in many years of public service along the way, I uh, served uh, as Congressman Hastings will recall, as an aide for many years to uh, former Florida Governor Reuben Askew. I worked on sunshine in government and uh, other ethics reforms in Florida. I was a special assistant to the U.S. Trade Representative uh, in the Carter administration. And after leaving the Congress in 1995, I served as a member for eight years and as chairman for two terms of the seven-member appellate body that serves as the final tribunal of appeal in international trade disputes among the currently 150 member countries and other customs territories of the World Trade Organization. Some of you were kind enough to support my nomination by the United States, and I'm grateful for that. So I bring to the issue of lobbying reform uh, a varied perspective. Um, you are no doubt aware that one of the lobbyists who formerly worked in the Washington office of greenberg Troig is named uh, Jack Abramoff. Uh, I trust you are aware also that when the firm uh, learned of Mr. Abramoff's now confessed transgressions, greenberg Troig demanded and received his resignation, and that greenberg Troig has since gone to extraordinary lengths to cooperate fully with subsequent investigations, as well as to comply fully with all ethical and other obligations to the firm's many clients. I cannot add anything to what others in the firm have previously testified before the Congress about the actions of Mr. Abramoff. During most of the time while he was with the firm, I was on a leave of absence from full-time practice and was busy fulfilling my responsibilities uh, to the members of the WTO in Geneva, Switzerland. I can tell you this. In 27 offices throughout the United States and elsewhere in the world, there are about 1,500 attorneys and other professionals of greenberg Troig who are not named Jack Abramoff. And in my experience, they all work hard every day to do the right thing in the right way, just as each and every one of you does. 
nor can I add much of anything to all that you already know about the lobbying of members of Congress. The truth is I have considerably more experience in being lobbied than I do in lobbying. Uh, I chose not to seek re-election to the Congress in 1994. I cast my last vote in November of that year. I have not been back to the floor of the House since, nor have I, I might add, been back to the House gym. So I won't miss those former perks of former members now that you have ended them. In fact, I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times I've been back to Capitol Hill since I cast that last vote more than 11 years ago, uh, with a finger or two left over. All this said, I'm grateful for this invitation to offer my former colleagues and others in the Congress my best advice on how best to reassure the people that the United States House of Representatives truly is representative of the people. I emphasize, this is my personal advice on these issues. I do not speak for my firm or for any other member of my firm. I speak only for myself in saying, by all means, toughen the toothless regulations on lobbying require full, frequent, and public electronic disclosure of the pre precise details of the earnings of lobbyists from lobbying, of the spending of lobbyists on lobbying, of the specific congressional and staff targets of lobbying, and of all the so-called grassroots lobbying spending intended to influence what you do. By all means, too, strengthen the legal obligations of members. If I were still a member, I would be supporting efforts to ban privately funded gifts, meals, and travel altogether. It may be, though, Mr. Chairman, that there is room for a bipartisan compromise that would rely in, in large part on transparency and would include much more extensive and public disclosure of gifts and meals, as well as strict prior approval of some limited travel for legitimate public purposes. I've worked with a number of you on a bipartisan basis, and I'm confident you can come to a consensus. By all means as well, post conference reports on the internet, limit earmarks in appropriations bills, lengthen the revolving door period for former members and for former senior staffers alike to at least two years, and require the forfeit of pensions for conviction of a job-related felony. All this will help, but from my perspective, all this will not be nearly enough to provide the reassurance that the people need. So I urge you to go beyond these few reforms and do much more. I urge you especially to provide the necessary staff and the necessary funding to ensure effective oversight and enforcement of both the current lobbying rules and the new rules that have been suggested by reformers in both parties. Rules without the resources to make them real are but empty promises. I urge you also to establish an independent and impartial means of investigating ethics complaints against members of Congress and their staffs, including the right of private citizens to file such complaints. Back in 1976, as uh, Congressman Hastings and others will recall, in Florida, by initiative, popular initiative, uh, we, uh, we uh, urged the people and, and they uh, enacted a constitutional amendment, the Sunshine Amendment that I helped draft for Governor Askew, that created an independent commission on ethics that is in many ways a model for the country. Take a look at that. I urge members in both parties to ensure that we have the kind of representation our Constitution requires by supporting reform of congressional redistricting. I support the initiative underway in Florida now. Mr. Chairman, I supported the proposal made in California by the governor last year. The fundamental principle of equal representation must not be sacrificed to partisanship, ever. I urge you, too, above all, to free yourselves from the endless treadmill of political fund fundraising by enacting real campaign finance reform. I know you've just been through this. I know there's a reluctance to do it again so soon, but it must be done. As someone who has spent some time on that treadmill with you, my personal preference would be to bar all private political financial contributions, direct and indirect, to congressional campaigns and to provide for full public campaign financing. But there may be other ways that might work. Lastly, lastly, I urge my friends and my former colleagues in both parties and in both the House and the Senate to rise above understandable partisan concerns and to find some way of accomplishing these much needed reforms on a bipartisan basis. Perhaps more than anything else that you might do, that would reassure the people that you are, as I know you are, working for them and for their best interest. Mr. Chairman, I have spent most of the past decade working for 150 countries, including 
our own. And I have seen firsthand that many of those countries don't have the institutions that we have. They don't have the legitimacy of institutions that we have. Our institutions are precious. We must cherish them. We need to maintain the legitimacy of the House of Representatives. And I believe that it must be uh, a bipartisan goal above all other goals to maintain that legitimacy. Far more important than who happens to be in control in the House at any one time is what all members are doing to protect the constitutional democratic integrity and legitimacy of the House. If I can help you in any small way, Mr. Chairman, I'm more than happy to do well, so. Well, thank you very much, Jim. It's nice to welcome you back after that 11 years and uh, add this. I don't know if you've filled your hand yet with your number of visits back to the Capitol, but this is a very important one for all of us, and we're, we're very pleased to have you with us. Professor Thurber. Yes, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I, sure. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to thank the Chair for the work that I've done with him on Internet, uh, Congress and the Internet, and uh, other committee reforms in the past. But also, there are other people I'd like to thank. I uh, worked with uh, Representative Slaughter in the early 90s on, on uh, reform. Uh, but I'm most proud of the fact that I have uh, 147 students that work on Capitol Hill, and two of them are uh, directly related to this hearing, including Hugh Halpern, who received an A uh, on, a, <laughs> on a paper on congressional e ethics in 1991, which actually was quite useful in my testimony before this committee leading up to the 95 reforms that occurred. Um, yeah. <laughs> Fred Turner is the chief of staff of Mr. Hastings. He's another former student of mine taking courses in Congress. It's hard to summarize 30 years of study of Congress and ethics and the issues before us, but I will try to do that. And Mr. Hastings, I ask permission that my written uh, testimony be put into the record, and I'll summarize it. With, without objection, all of your written testimony will appear fully in the record, and all of you are welcome to uh, summarize if you choose, but to go right ahead. And I might add, since you gave me this entree, I, to have a staffer that took a class from you, and. Uh, so that's all right. I won't quiz you on I'm that. I'm sorry. It's hard to keep up with them. <laughs> They're doing very well. I want to say that they're all uh, very ethical people, the four members of Congress, that, uh, including uh, Mr. McGovern, who are, who are uh, graduates of the School of Public Affairs at American University, are quite ethical. <laughs> well, I want to address that. I was asked by both the minority and the majority to appear before this committee. And I think it's very important to think about approaching this in a bipartisan approach. Uh, and I know both sides have issues, but it's time to find some common ground to have a ceasefire on lobbying reform. There are several streams of reform that are going on right now here and outside of Congress. Lobbying reform, procedural reform, uh, reform related to redistricting. I'm involved with that, as Tom and Norm are also. Uh, but also there's just the simple reform of enforcing existing law and ethics of this institution and abiding by the rules. That's a stream of reform also. I will focus, though, in my oral remarks only on lobbying reform, and I'm willing to ask, uh, answer any questions uh, related to any of those other reforms that are occurring. And I've uh, studied those areas and have opinions on them uh, from the past. I, just very briefly, I used to work on the Hill um, 32 years ago, uh, and I also have taught courses on Congress for <laughs> over 30 years. But more importantly, I teach a course on lobbying and ethics. It's funded by a grant from the Bryce Harlow Foundation that is trying to improve integrity in lobbying. I also teach a the Lobbying Institute have for 20 years, and therefore I have a network of <coughs> literally hundreds of former students that are lobbyists. Uh, we have a strong element of teaching about ethics and the law. And uh, as far as I know, none of them are unethical people or have gotten into trouble. Uh, I'm very proud of them. Uh, it's from that experience, the experience of 30 lobbyists that come in every, twice a year to speak in my lobbying institute that I know these people. They're, uh, the people that I invite to, to speak are ethical individuals, and they uh, have a lot to say about lobbying reform right now, and I've talked to many of them, 
and they are for reform. Uh, and some of the reforms that I'm going to mention today that I'm for, they're certainly for. Um, let me uh, summarize very briefly and say that, that we have some discussion about the number of lobbyists in Washington. Let me say that if you define lobbying as direct lobbying with members of Congress, but also grassroots, top roots, astroturf, issue ads on television, direct mail, a coalition building and maintenance, uh, co uh, activity in campaigns, I would advocate, I would propose, and we've looked at this, that we have over 100,000 people in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the advocacy business. Now, uh, the, there are various debates about the number of lobbyists. Is it, is it 32,000? Is it 11,500? Uh, that's unimportant compared to the money that is awash in this system. If you combine the money from lobbying, uh, which last year, 2004, was $2.1 billion, probably over $3 billion, uh, that is recorded, along with the campaign contributions and spending in, the, in each cycle, uh, it's, it's approaching 10 to $12 billion per year. Uh, just registered money, uh, money that's, that's recorded, is, comes to $4 million per member per year, a little over $350,000 per member per month. That's a lot of money. No one's really talking about money. Money is not corrupt, but it's, it, but it's part of the picture that we need to think about. If you look at um, whether we're recording this or not, we're not. It's not transparent, in my opinion. Uh, I, I listened to the previous testimony, and, and I, I almost wanted to come in and just talk about Adobe, and that's it, right? <laughs> uh, but I decided to, to go beyond that a little bit, Mr. Chair, and say that very simply, we need a common form that's simple to fill out for the House and the Senate. We need to put it up on a website. The, the institution has to be modern. You know that. You've been uh, a real leader in using the Internet uh, through this committee, but also encouraging others to do that. And, of course, you endorsed my book called Congress and the Internet, which I appreciate. Uh, <laughs> um, right. Uh, so that's let me get that issue off. But I also feel, and with great respect, Mr. Hastings, that we have had the committees of jurisdiction uh, not pursue um, oversight and enforcement of existing ethics and rules on members, staff, but also on the lobbyists. So I would and I have endorsed a proposal for an Office of Public Integrity. Uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Obama has uh, has proposed this as well as many other people. Uh, but if that is not possible, I would strongly recommend that you think about expanding the uh, authority of the Office uh, of Inspector General of the House of Representatives. No one's really mentioned this. It's just been mentioned yesterday in, in the Senate to have a common one. It works in the executive branch. It should work here. I looked at the reports, and with due respect to the Office of, uh, of Inspector General, They've only had uh, seven reports in the last four years uh, that I can see up on their website. Uh, and that's how I uh, looked at it. They were important things like the Postal Service, transition in, in, in district offices. They could easily uh, be uh, uh, funded and have an expansion of authority to look at this area of ethics and, uh, and law. Uh, let me go on and say that, that the primary thing that I'm interested in is not talking about uh, a gift ban, whether it should be $49.99 for a lunch or $59 or something like that. I'm for transparency, for recording uh, the gifts that come in under existing law and making sure that there's some penalties for people who don't, don't record them, uh, but also transparency with respect to lobbying activities in Washington. It's controversial, but I would expand it beyond simply the law in 95 for lobbying into other areas, including coalition building, it's tough coalition maintenance. Uh, I know the grassroots issue is, is very controversial, but, but millions are spent on grassroots, astroturf and top roots. Uh, there's no reason why that uh, information cannot be recorded and, and given to the American public. I know the people who are doing it. 
they record it in their office about who their clients are and what they're doing. It would not hurt their business. It might help their business, in fact, if they showed what they were doing uh, with clients. I also would say that um, the enforcement area, I think, is serious with respect to the Department of Justice. I actually have tried for a month now to find out if there are any cases, now maybe someone here can tell me, any cases that have been prosecuted uh, under the referrals from the clerk uh, of the House of Representatives or from the Senate. I cannot find that. I can't even find out the number until today of referrals uh, to the Department of Justice for problems. Uh, let me, I know we're limited on time, so let me summarize very quickly and say that, um, that transparency and enforcement are the two most important things. Transparency will enhance, uh, uh, I think, the public opinions about this institution. That was the intent of the 95 Act. It starts out with that, with that purpose. It, the Act has failed in my opinion, in terms of transparency. And therefore, it's important to go back to the Act and make sure that bef before we have major reforms, that we enforce the transparency of the 95 Act as amended in 1998. Um, that means that uh, we need to have also other acts, aspects of transparency. I think the reports that the individuals have in the House and the Senate they, from the lobbyists should include the following, a list of members' offices and congressional committees that were lobbied during the period of the report. Disclosure of political contributions by lobbyists should be made in the same report. Uh, in 94, I proposed to this committee that it was a little wacky, but that the Federal Election Commission uh, record campaign contributions as well as the money coming through on lobbying. But I would not recommend that now, looking at the way the Federal Election Commission is working. I think that needs to be done separately. The form should also require disclosure of, by lobbyists of all prior government employment, disclosure by lobbyists of all travel for members they arrange uh, or paid for, detailed disclosure on all gifts by lobbyists, over $20. And I recommend strongly that you increase the fines and the sanctions. Uh, for failing to comply with disclosure. The other aspect of disclosure is that people are late or they don't file. There are many major firms in town that have never filed. It's, it's a mystery to me uh, why that occurs. Every one of my speakers in the Lobbying Institute I've asked, they file. If I might say, Mike Berman, who teaches ethics for me, President of Duberstein, says there's no problem. I mean, we've got a, we've got a staff member that takes care of this. Why aren't these other people filing? Uh, that's a major issue, and the way to handle it is to, is to have some sanctions for not filing, in my opinion. Travel. Lots of people have talked about travel. Now, let me, just, let me just summarize my feelings on travel. I think it would be very, a very poor idea to stop travel that is educational and uh, goes into investigations. I think that gaming of the system to go out and give a one-hour speech in Aspen uh, and then spend three days out there on recreation is not right. I think we should have pre-clearance of travel by some office, an office of public integrity or some other office, pre-clearance of travel. And yes, it's all right to have the private sector pay it if it's educational, in my opinion. So I'm sort of a radical moderate uh, on that one. I don't want to ban travel because I want members to know about what's going on and learn about that. And that's one of the great things about the Aspen Institute, is it's bipartisan, but it's also uh, transparent, and they learn a great deal. And the members get to know each other. They're not just here from 2 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon and leave on 2 o'clock on Thursday afternoon. That's when they really get to know each other. And those, and those CODELs that go to Iraq, they're very important, paid for by, the, uh, by uh, public funds. And uh, if, uh, you know, Lee Hamilton has said, well, all of it should be paid by public funds. I disagree. I don't think it'll happen. Thank you very much. I've taken too much time, oh, I know. Yeah. But, Thank you very much. And I'll take questions later if you want. Mr. Mann. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mrs. Slaughter, members of the committee, I'm delighted to return to this room. Uh, I have had the privilege over uh, 35 years of uh, 
of appearing before you uh, under Republican and Democratic uh, chairs uh, to wrestle with uh, this great institution and its problems, its its challenges, and 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 I'm delighted uh, that you invited me back uh, once again. I wish I could be as upbeat as uh, Mr. Diaz Ballard and and Mr. Hastings on the state of uh, this institution. Uh, I think the chairman and others know uh, I have long explained and defended this institution to its, to its critics. Uh, I love Congress uh, and believe it is the, the, the linchpin of, uh, of American democracy. And I also believe that it has to constantly examine itself. Um, and I certainly work with the chairman when he was not chairman in in uh, trying to improve this institution when, when I felt, we felt, Democrats were abusing, uh, uh, abusing their power. And in effect, it wasn't simply a matter of fairness. It was, a, it was a matter of making sure the body played to its comparative advantages and fulfilled its, uh, the role that the framers uh, set for it. So, I have not been uh, uh, fearful or amiss in, in criticizing Congress when it was under Democratic control and, uh, and certainly not under Republican control, as uh, I'm sure the chairman knows as, uh, as well. Sadly, uh, I've come to the conclusion, uh, along with my, uh, my colleague uh, and friend uh, Norman Ornstein, that, that Congress has become the broken branch. Uh, uh, and, and I, I implore you uh, to, take, to take this criticism seriously, to not see it as sour grapes of, of a minority. Uh, this institution is being challenged in a fundamental way, and it's not good enough to, uh, to, to point to, to rationalize uh, how things are actually uh, doing well and we're making it, uh, making it better. I'd like to associate myself with the comments of those who have come before me and, and say how heartened I was by uh, Mr. Baucus's uh, testimony. It reminds us that, that the lobbying profession uh, is an honorable profession. The Constitution guarantees a right to petition the government for redress of, of, uh, of grievances. And I was struck by the commonality in the, uh, in the critique and in the solutions proposed. If, if you all take this seriously, you really can find a broadly based uh, set of ideas for, uh, for reform. Uh, my written testimony actually takes those six questions you pose seriously and tries to answer them, and I'm not going to repeat that here. It's there, it's there for the committee. What I, what I, want to say is, in these circumstances, when we've had a scandal uh, or a series of scandals, the natural reaction of Congress is to do something quickly, uh, to try to minimize the political embarrassment and fallout and move on. Uh, it usually entails applying Band-Aids that, uh, that then fall off within a day or two. Um, this is a chance for you to take a little time and to to deliberate, uh, that is to, to actually uh, try to do something that's needed doing for a long time before the appearance of, uh, of Jack Abramoff and before the revelations about uh, uh, Duke Cunningham. Uh, like Jim, I think all the attention on further restrictions on gifts and private travel is, uh, 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 is is a misallocation of priorities. Uh, you can do it if you want, but it'll lead you to some really foolish things. Uh, getting into trouble over trivialities. Uh, again, I believe, as the title of these hearings uh, argues for, that uh, transparency is, uh, is the best route, more luminous transparency and, and effective enforcement. But it's important to understand this isn't just about lobbyists. It's about members of Congress and their staffs. Uh, and there have been some pretty profound changes in, uh, uh, in the interaction uh, between members and staff and the lobbying community. 
and uh, they change the way in which this system is operating. Moreover, we're not talking about transparency just to report on lobbyist activities, because that only, that only deals with one side of, uh, of the equation. Um, it has to be expanded to deal with elements of the broader legislative process, because without that, you will, you will make no real difference. The, the reality is the, the worst example of this has become the conference committee. I, can, I think I can speak for the, the virtually all congressional scholars that have become utterly appalled by what's happened to the conference process uh, uh, in Congress. It is an embarrassment, and it, and it fuels the very problems that uh, now confront you as an institution. So, so transparency, yes, but on both sides, the lobbyists and the legislative process and members in staff. Secondly, we desperately need to take an ethics process that has been gutted uh, and restore it. And we need to restore it. I wish we could restore it to the way it was before with members themselves taking the full responsibility and doing it in a bipartisan way. But it's become way too politicized in this environment. And it really calls for a blending of an independent ethics commission uh, made up primarily of former members with an office of, uh, of public integrity. And I think, I think you could sit down with people and work out the details of this and do it without Congress shirking its responsibilities under the Constitution to police its own members. Uh, uh, they, could, they could do that easily. And you can avoid the horrors of uh, the equivalent of an independent or special counsel who gets off on a vendetta against an individual, uh, uh, individual member. Um, let, me, let me conclude um, uh, with this observation. Uh, the majorities are very narrow uh, in this Congress. We live in a time of parity between the parties. And the parties haven't been as ideologically polarized uh, uh, since the late 19th, early 20th century. That increases the stakes. You all feel it intensely as you move up to, to every election. This means there's a huge demand for private money, even among those of you who have no electoral risk whatsoever, because you're expected to redistribute funds to those who are at risk. Everyone is under enormous pressure to raise money. OK, so you have the demand for, for private money, and then you have the supply of benefits that are now uh, easier in some respects to provide because of changes in the legislative process. The, we've seen it in the earmarking process. We've seen it in special amendments added late in the process under the veil of secrecy. We see it in invitations to participate in, in party and, and sort of committee and formal groups doing markups. Uh, we see it in a whole variety of ways. That is a reality. The demand for private money, the supply of public benefits. And unless you deal with both sides of that, Whatever changes you make in uh, lobbying regulations, you will not have done anything more than touch the surface of the problem. That means you really are going to have to deal with a reality. There has been a serious decline in deliberation in Congress uh, associated uh, with the demise of regular order. And there have been new and more troublesome roles for money uh, in politics. Uh, Listen, this, as I said before, is not simply a matter of fairness. This is a, it's a matter of the quality of the products that you produce, which the framers always anticipated would result from you actually talking to one another and debating one another and having genuine give and take. It also threatens the integrity of an institution that I have uh, come to respect and admire and, uh, and feel is absolutely critical to our institution. And Mr. Chairman, uh, I know you share those feelings. I also know you are, you are, like every other member, living in this highly partisan environment. And I, 
and I pray you will be able, working with your uh, colleagues, to, uh, to make some headway on this. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. My name is Paul Miller and I serve as the current president of the American League of Lobbyists. And I'm really happy to be here that we're going to talk about some transparencies in the legislative process. As this committee knows, lobbying Congress is not only a completely legitimate part of our democratic process, it is also essential to its effectiveness. Lobbying is a fundamental right guaranteed by our Constitution and professional lobbyists such as all's members perform a critically important role in helping citizens communicate factual information and in advocating their interests and concerns to public officials. Regrettably, a widespread misperception exists today about what lobbying involves and what lobbyists do. This mis misperception is not new, but it has been elevated to an extraordinary level as a result of the activities of Mr. Abramoff and his associates. Those activities not only strike at the heart of our democracy, they also have damaged severely the vast majority of lobbyists who will perform their role in a democracy in an ethical and totally legitimate way. Mr. Chairman, I understand and sympathize with the outrage we have witnessed outside the Beltway in regards to this scandal, but I also have to say I'm saddened by the reaction inside the Beltway. I think we can all agree what Mr. Abramoff did was appalling, but to say all sorts of new rules being floated would have prevented this abuse or will stop it from happening in the future is just not realistic. Let's keep in mind we are here having this debate because one man broke the law and got caught. We have to remember this. Mr. Abramoff got caught by the system. If Congress can step back and take a look at this issue objectively, I think we can provide a solution that isn't sexy by Washington standards, but one that would make a difference that the American people will come to truly appreciate and understand. To make the system more transparent, I would offer you eight principles that truly would make a difference. These are simple ideas, but would have an immediate impact on transparency and the public's call for reform. The first step has to be a comprehensive review of the current rules to see what, if any, of these rules aren't working. Right now, I don't think we can honestly say with certainty that the current system is broken. We can't know if the current rules work or not because we don't have an enforcement mechanism in place to gauge this. No matter how well-intentioned a reform effort may be, it will be meaningless to the American people if we first don't begin talking about the enforcement of the current rules. Otherwise, without that critical first step, we risk finding ourselves back here again next year facing a similar scandal and with, even, with the public even more outraged, and they will have every right to feel that way. If we can solve the enforcement issue, we then can be, begin to discuss the current rules and regulations. Absent an effective enforcement mechanism, we really don't know if the current rules are truly as inadequate as some critics have suggested. Before we create new ones, therefore, we should urge Congress to undertake a detailed review of what's currently in place to see how effective those rules and regulations would be with enforcement. If Congress is going to draft meaningful reform that provides the transparency and openness the public wants, I believe it must take into consideration the following. We just talked about review and enforcement. Uh, Congress should support and review the enforcement of a current Lobbying Disclosure Act before Congress can impose new sets of regulations with potential loopholes. We urge Congress to carefully review the current LDA to determine if and where problems may exist. If the current LDA is not being enforced, additional penalties and rules without proper enforcement will have no real effect. Review, of the, review the idea of a commission to review current rules and, and report back to Congress on any new proposals or change. Com the commission should be made up of current members of Congress, former members who do not lobby, practicing lobbyists, current interest groups, and a representative from the general public with no political ties, affiliations, or ties to any group currently represented on the commission. Rules and regulations should apply to all. Right now, the current definition is, is pretty strict as to who qualifies as a lobbyist. But we have to look at the current situation. Mr. Abramoff has pled guilty now to crimes. Um, he is going to go to prison. But Mr. Scanlon is another one who has pled guilty, but he was not a lobbyist. He is a PR consultant by, by his definition. But Mr. Scanlon is also, by my opinion, a lobbyist because Mr. Scanlon has acted in the way that lobbyists do. He advocates for individuals. He advocates for policy. He tries to sway the decision on, on, on issues. He has played in this arena. He has advocated on behalf of clients. So Mr. Mr. Scanlon is not a PR consultant, but he should be defined as a lobbyist. And so our, my concern right now is the definition of lobbyist is too broad. It needs to be expanded to include a lot of other groups and folks who are doing too narrow, I'm sorry, too narrow to include other folks who are doing what we do but currently aren't part of the system. If you're talking about where the money goes and you want more transparency, 
why not expand that definition to cover these folks? Because if you're looking for where the money is spent and how it's being spent, these folks can add, should file the same reports that we do. You would have a better indication of who's spending that money and where it's going. A uniform electronic filing system. I know we heard from the clerk earlier, and I have great respect for her and her staff and, and the challenges that they've had uh, as of fe February 14th. I know it hadn't been easy for them. They got a lot of phone calls. Um, but a unified, uniform filing system is needed. Uh, right now, you have two very different systems. In, in the House, you have an electronic, electronic filing system that is very difficult. One, you have to apply for a digital signature, which was not easy in the process, and many folks were not able to get that signature completed in time to meet the requirements, so you had to file on paper. In the Senate side, you don't have that same requirement. If you want to do it online, it's much easier. You have an identification number that you can just type in there, and you can send it with a click of a button, and it goes over to the Senate side. That still doesn't solve the problem on either side. If you're going to make this more transparent, the House system right now is electronic, but you and the, Ameri the American people cannot view this over the Internet right now. You have to come to Washington. You have to come to this building or in, uh, the Cannon building to physically go and view those reports. So electronic filing is nice to put it on a database and those types of things, but it's not currently accessible to the general public, whereas the Senate, Senate's version is. So if you want to fix this problem, get the Senate and the House to come together, pick one filing system, make it put it electronically so that the general public can get it in real time. That will, that will, I think, help the American people better understand what we do, what issues are being worked on, where money is going, and those types of things. I don't think you need quarterly filing. If the, the information is put up in real time, semi-annually filing should appease the public and, and the in information that they're looking for. Travel. We've heard a lot about travel. I, I think there, the, the, the scandal that we've talked about has kind of put a, a black mark on travel. I think, for one, travel is important. The, the Congress is not going to pay for all the necessary travel that is needed. These trips, 99, again, 99.9% .9 of them are valuable. Yes, the junkets should probably go. There's no one is, is uh, objecting to that. But we would object to is, is allow, to, forcing folks to not take those trips. You're, those trips are valuable to you. They're valuable to the community and the constituents that you represent. But there's easy ways to do that. Strict new rules would be placed on publicly funded travel. Members would be required to submit requests to Ethics Committee for approval. If a new body is created to review lobbying regula regulations, this body would need to vet trips as well. Public groups initiating the invitation must also submit the itinerary, travel plans, accommodations, and cost of the travel to Ethics Committee and review body if one is created to oversee the lobbying disclosure. Travel must be made public within, within one month uh, by the member of Congress and or their staff, and that could be easily done by put on, on, their, on their website. Lobbying identification card. Each registered lobbyist would be required to apply for a personal identification card. This card would be worn or carried with you while lobbying any member of Congress or agency. This card would be similar to those currently worn by congressional staffers. A member of Congress or, or staff could require verifying that a person is a registered lobby, lobbyist before meeting with them. If the person does not have a registered identification card, the member of staff could refuse to meet with that person. It also helps identify those folks in these buildings for staff and the general public. If transparency is the issue, why not allow us to have the same type of identification card that congressional staffers currently are required to wear? Mandatory ethics class. Um, every congressional staffer, member of Congress, and registered lobbyist would be required to take a three-hour mandatory ethics seminar every two years to comply with federal law. This requirement must meet or a, or a fine would be issued to to those not completing this seminar is required. Part of the problem you have right now is there are gift rules that we are to adhere to, and we do. Nine, again, 99% of us do that. But the problem you also have is you have congressional staffers who may not know the rules of what we're able to do and not able to do. So it's, it's putting them in an awkward situation. It's putting us in an awkward situation. So maybe a little mandatory ethics training for all of us might be useful. It's not going to be something that's going to hurt everybody, take a lot of time. You're talking a three-hour seminar, maybe every two years. Um, it, it should be something that we should take a look at if, you're, if we're talking about transparency in the system. An individual lobbying identification number. Right now, if you're an association or your company, or if you're in a company, you get a, a general identification number. When you file your report, everybody is listed under that. Not by name, but you have one identification number. Why not require every lobbyist to have their own separate identification number? Again, you put that information up on, on the website so people can identify who that person is through their personal identification number, which you can't currently do right now. You can only affiliate them with a corporation or a company. Mr. Chairman, I would urge, this, urge Congress to stay away from campaign finance issues. 
if you begin adding these provisions to a lobbying reform bill, you only complicate this issue and, in my opinion, get a package that is confusing and loaded up with amendments like the appropriations bills we have been hearing so much about lately. If money in politics is the issue, then Congress should focus its attention on campaign finance issues. These are two very different issues and should, in my opinion, be treated as such. If Congress tries to mesh these two issues together, what you are going to get is a very complex bill that no one will be able to figure out or even enforce. Mr. Chairman, we welcome the opportunity to work with you and your colleagues on this issue. We look forward to a process by which we will be able to submit the current LDA to a thoughtful and rigorous review and find ways to make it more effective. And we are confident that working together, we will restore our people's faith in government and in the legislative process. We owe them no less. Mr. Chairman, if I can also leave you here today, leave here today with one request. It is that members of Congress should not run from us or use this issue to gain political points. For more than 200 years, the lobbying profession has played a critical role in the political life of our country. It continues to play that role today, and members of Congress should not be afraid to say that. I want to thank you for the opportunity, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. Dr. Ornstein. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like Tom, I recall many warm uh, hours uh, spent in this uh, room testifying uh, uh, before different chairs and also working with you uh, for uh, intensively, especially on uh, the very constructive reforms uh, discussed by some implemented through the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, of which you were a leader uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, you then followed through with some very courageous committee reforms uh, in, in the aftermath uh, of those. I must say, though, it's a little depressing uh, for, uh, for me this morning. Tom and I uh, came here at the same time 36 uh, years ago, uh, uh, four years uh, before uh, young Jim Thurber. Uh, of course, a little bit after uh, Fred Wertheimer, who was here, I think, at the time of uh, his namesake, Fred Muhlenberg. Uh, but uh, to uh, sit here a, a few minutes into uh, the hearing and realize that we've been working on uh, congressional reform and studying the institution since long before Mr. Putnam was born, uh, is, uh, and long before any of you were members uh, of Congress, is a little depressing, to tell you the truth, although you've held up a lot. Work in, uh, that's right, work in progress. You've held up a lot better than we have, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity that you have to step back and take a look at many elements uh, of Congress uh, and bring some sensible and tough changes. It's not going to be easy. As you know, uh, many of your colleagues uh, had an initial wave of sympathy for reform and now would prefer to do a few small things, hunker down, and hope that this all blows over and other things take over. And you don't have to do things that will discomfort your lives or change the ways in which you do business. Uh, I don't think you can, uh, can, and I hope you uh, will understand, and I believe you will uh, shrink from that, uh, uh, won't shrink from that responsibility. Uh, this is certainly something that's responding to a wave of uh, public cynicism and a low level of public confidence in Congress, but it, it's not just that. As Tom suggested, this is about the integrity of Congress itself. And we believe, uh, as many others do, that uh, the way in which the institution itself operates needs a careful look and some serious changes. The regular order needs to be restored, and that includes a, a process of deliberation. Um, I don't think that you, when you bring major bills to the floor without any hearings, without any uh, uh, give and take, uh, without uh, the kind of uh, serious notice so that people inside and outside can take a look at the legislation, is good for anybody. A uh, bad process results in bad policy, uh, and uh, ultimately that reflects back on uh, a majority and uh, on the institution itself, and uh, it's, it's not a good thing to do. Uh, one of the most salutary things that came up uh, when the Republicans took over, an idea that I think really was Newt Gingrich's, but you helped to implement, was the Thomas system. It has been absolutely wonderful for people outside, and that includes average citizens as well as those of us who follow this for a living, to be able to go up and have uh, the range of information readily available to us. Uh, if we do not return to a process, for example, where conference reports uh, are out for 72 hours, and they ought to be up on Thomas uh, for all of us and you to see, uh, then we're making a big mistake here, and that's a part of this process, uh, I think, uh, the uh, uh, conference element uh, thousand-page bills brought to the floor without notice and other things that 
distort the regular order and need to be changed. Um, uh, we've just, uh, Tom and I have just been going back for a book that we're doing uh, on Congress and rereading the reports that we did to work with you back in the early 90s called Renewing Congress. We were very tough on a majority party then, the Democratic Party, that uh, itself had begun to stray from the regular order and uh, ignore the rights of minorities, sometimes gratuitously. Uh, we were tough on them then in the early 1990s. We're tough now when some of those things have occurred and have even been uh, uh, expanded very dramatically. And we will be again if and when the majority changes. Uh, but uh, serious changes are necessary right now. Now, uh, before I get to the lobbying reform itself, um, I, I want to address the ethics issue a little bit. Uh, I would strongly endorse uh, the uh, uh, bill that has been introduced by Senator Obama to create a commission uh, on ethics, which is modeled on the Florida and Kentucky commissions. Frankly, I don't see how any member of Congress from Florida or Kentucky, to start with, could not strongly endorse and co-sponsor such a proposal. If they don't, it's basically suggesting they don't have much confidence in the proposals of their, uh, or, or the uh, processes of their own states. But it ought to go well beyond that. Now, there is a parallel proposal that's out there that is uh, uh, likely to be voted on in the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee uh, today. Uh, which has also been endorsed by a lot of reform groups uh, for this Office of Public Integrity. I do not believe that these are mutually exclusive plans. The British system has a chief ethics officer, uh, but that ethics officer is overseen by a, uh, an outside panel uh, of distinguished citizens. Melding these two proposals, creating an Office of Public Integrity with a chief ethics officer, with an expanded staff that can engage in education of members, staff, and others about what the rules and ethical procedures are, that can take in these uh, lobbying reports and disseminate them and have a capacity to make sure that there are serious sanctions, which you have to build into this process for a failure to file or for a distortion of the forms. And by the way, listening to the clerk talk about how it's possible to put together the Senate and House systems, but how they're completely incompatible. To use one of Newt's favorite phrases, it's insane that each House has a separate system and separate set of requirements. And you ought to certainly start by making sure that there is one system for the entire Congress when it comes to lobbying and lobbying disclosure. But it would make sense to me to have uh, this chief ethics officer with an independence akin to that of the Controller General have an outside commission with members of impeccable integrity overseeing it. And by the way, that's to keep it from, uh, and, and this chief ethics officer would have the uh, ability to initiate investigations, move them to recommendations to the ethics committees and to the House and Senate itself. I don't want to see uh, a, the equivalent of an independent counsel, somebody who can run amok uh, investigating members uh, willy-nilly. And I think you can build a check into that with an outside commission. But I also don't want to see something that has happened from time to time in states that do have independent commissions, which is legislatures that get upset with them because they're doing their job too well, cut their funding or restrict their ability to operate. And I think if you had an outside group with people like Lee Hamilton, John Porter, Nancy Kassebaum, just to pick examples, that they would let neither of those things happen. In either case, and whether you opt for an office, uh, a, a chief ethics officer, something akin to the inspector general or expanded inspector general status, the salutary plans for a commission, or both, you have got to focus on enforcement here. Transparency, accountability are wonderful things. If there is not enforcement of ethical procedures and rules, and I do not believe we've had it for a long time, and I should note that for more than 20 years we have advocated uh, an outside group to, uh, in a bifurcated process to handle the initial investigations here and take in the complaints. It's something that was endorsed by the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. It does not have constitutional issues if you draw it carefully. It needs to be done. Now, as for lobbying, uh, just one uh, uh, little note on uh, uh, the issue of uh, 
ignoring money and politics, campaign finance, as we move towards lobbying reform. Uh, I disagree with that fundamentally, but uh, even if you decide that you want to make some separation of the issues, whatever restrictions you put on travel and meals, if you leave open the loophole that allows members to have meals paid for of whatever variety or cost, as long as the person paying for the meal also gives them a $2,000 campaign check, and you ban or greatly restrict travel but allow people to travel anywhere as long as they're with a campaign funder uh, who can be a lobbyist uh, to a fundraiser, then you're making things worse, not better. It is wrong to uh, allow those things to happen, and uh, you've got to really uh, address that element of the campaign issue. Most of us believe that this is a system in which the money process has also gotten dangerously out of whack and needs to be dealt with uh, along with these issues. And frankly, if I had my druthers, I would start with a ban on leadership PACs, uh, which I think have just careened out of control. And when I looked at the process in which the uh, Appropriations Committee chairmanship was decided the last time, and it was very clear that the candidates for the chairmanship, all good, strong members of Congress who were on that committee because of their legislative work, understanding that the price for admission to consideration of the chairmanship was raising huge sums of money for the team. And what they had to go through to do so, it's just wrong. Uh, and it's something that uh, it has, has gotten out of, uh, out of hand. Uh, uh, along with that, uh, let me say when it comes to the meals and uh, travel, I, I think members of Congress can live without uh, gifts, meals, or private travel. But having said that, as my colleagues have suggested, this is not the biggest issue facing you. And it has to be done, dealt with in a serious and careful fashion. Beyond the Aspen Institute trips, and just to pick one example, Tom and I, in one of our uh, myriad projects now, are working together on election reform. We are not done uh, with election reform uh, with HAVA or uh, with its implementation. But a part of what we're doing is holding regular lunches with people doing work in this area from the Federal Election Commission, the Election Assistance Commission, the scholarly community, the election officials community, and we've brought up staff uh, from the Hill who work on these issues to sit around for working lunches, to talk about them, to share information, to move forward. If you ban all meals, you're going to get yourself into an area where uh, you, you are going to basically throw out some very good things. Making some of these distinctions is difficult. I actually think the $50 limit uh, and the gift limit are not working terribly. This is not the corrupting uh, 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 problem here. And if we put too much focus on this, we're making a mistake. The travel itself is another issue. And I would just add a couple of things to what my colleagues have said. One is we, are, we have seen with the Abramoff case the use of outside nonprofit groups as conduits for money coming from lobbyists to pay for travel. And it often used as an excuse by members to say, well, I didn't know the money seemed to come from a nonprofit group. Uh, you cannot leave these sham transactions in place. And what you've got to do, I think, among other things, is to have serious penalties for people who are involved in nonprofit organizations that uh, take in money from the outside and basically launder it through to pay for travel, even if you leave an exemption for uh, outside nonprofit groups. And you need a much higher level of transparency when it comes to such things uh, if, uh, if uh, they're allowed. And I think you also have to either end the practice of private jet travel or at least make people who take such trips pay the real costs, not the equivalent of first class uh, airfare. The idea that these trips, corporate jets with lobbyists accompanying members on the trips for hours of unfettered access is something that is appropriate in this day and age, I think is simply wrong-headed. You've got a lot of work cut out for you. We appreciate the difficulties involved here. I am particularly heartened by the uh, uh, openness, Mr. Chairman, that you showed to the bill that the uh, uh, minority has introduced with many of its elements to restore the regular order and to move in these directions, I hope we can genuinely make this a bipartisan process. Thank you.
votes down the House floor. We've got two votes taking place. And the idea of our not having a full complement of members here to hear from Speaker Muhlenberg uh, is something I find very, very distressing. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you the option. I, I don't know how long your testimony is, Fred. If, if you uh, would like us to go downstairs and vote and then come back, we could do that or we could begin right now. Go. Okay, let's, let's do that. Let's uh, recess and we'll begin at the uh, reconvene at the beginning of the second meeting. <laughs> Committee will reconvene. Uh, let me uh, again express my appreciation to uh, all of our panelists for their uh, patience and for the very thoughtful testimony that's been provided uh, so far. And uh, I guess to be likened to the first Speaker of the House of Representatives is uh, the uh, ultimate compliment, certainly in this uh, hearing room. Uh, and I will, since as you all know uh, very well, the Speaker of the House chaired the Rules Committee up until uh, Cannon's Revolt in 1910. And so I uh, will say that to have Fre Fred Wertheimer uh, compared in any way to the first Speaker of the House is, I think, the, uh, the best uh, introduction that could be provided. And I've enjoyed working with you and your very helpful input uh, on this issue. And look forward to your testimony. Thank, thank, thank you, you Mr. Chairman. Although, as I understand it, the first Speaker of the House is dead. Uh huh. Yeah, I, and you're not. I think that's and you're not. You're long from it. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Slaughter, the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to respond to a question that Mr. Uh, Mr. Putnam raised. Uh, it is true that members used to be able to convert their campaign funds to personal use when they left Congress, and that was prohibited by statute. However, uh, if any member has a leadership pack, when that member leaves Congress, they can still <coughs> convert that money to personal use. So uh, we would be very pleased to support uh, uh, anyone on this committee or the committee if they are prepared to take on that issue. It's a big loophole in the campaign finance law, and the, pro and the reality is that we're still in a situation where members can convert campaign Since you began to by uh, just responding to a question that was posed, let me let me respond. Have there been any instances of members taking the resources from a leadership pack? I am not. I am not aware just, one I, way or the other. I wasn't aware of it until you just said when, it. When the leadership, when members disappear from Congress, uh, their activities do not draw much attention. So I don't know the answer to that. But. It, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, you and your colleagues have a very serious problem on your hands. Uh, and the problem uh, is with the American people. Uh, I just want to go over a, a, a few polls at the beginning here. A CNN USA Today Gallup poll said the following. Corruption ranked among the concerns most often cited by those polled with 43% telling posters, pollsters it would be an extremely important issue in 2006. That was just 2% below the 45% response for the war in Iraq and terrorism. Washington Post poll, these are all polls this year, found that 90% of the American people, 90% said it should be illegal for lobbyists to give members of Congress gifts, travel, or anything else of value. A Los Angeles Time Bloom, Times Bloom, Bloomsburg News poll found that by 72 to 21 percent, the public supports prohibiting the practice of allowing lawmakers to travel on jets provided by corporations and lobbyists for the cost of flying on a commercial airplane. 
Uh, these are overwhelming numbers, and they reflect a deep concern about, by the American people, about the scandals that they have been reading about in Washington and particularly in Congress. Uh, the only way to address that problem is with real reforms, Re reforms that change the way lobbyists function in Congress, that change the way business is done here. And in the end, uh, the efforts of Congress are going to be judged precisely by what those reforms are. Uh, uh, they are going to be analyzed and looked at in reality terms. And as people talked about before, you already start off with a very skeptical and cynical public. Uh, and in order to respond to that, we believe you need real reforms. Uh, I l go through uh, a list of proposals in my testimony. I want to touch on just a couple of them. Uh, they've been talked about here before. Um, if you don't do something to address the ethics enforcement issue, it's not clear that anything else you do is going to matter. Now, one can get into arguments about who was responsible for what, and those arguments have been made. But the bottom line is that we didn't have an ethics enforcement process. We didn't have an ethics committee functioning for an entire year last year. Now, in the almost 40-year history of the Ethics Committee in the House, that has never happened, never. So uh, you must create some form of publicly credible ethics process to oversee and enforce the rules in the future if rules changes are going to have any context for people in this country or for members. Uh, we support the proposal offered by Representatives Shays and Meehan for an Office of Public Integrity. It was offered by Senators Collins and Lieberman in the Senate. It's a bipartisan proposal. It's designed to work with and within the structures of the ethics committees and to provide some form of independent, nonpartisan uh, capacity in an office to look at and investigate ethics matters with the ethics committee still making the judgments about whether violations have occurred and what sanctions should be recommended. There must be some form of independence built into the process for looking at your ethics problems, even as uh, that is done within the context of the Ethics Committees and the Congress, and we believe that can be done. We believe these are the best proposals for doing it. Uh, we also recognize that uh, Senator Obama has come up with an, a, a variation proposal that also could address these problems. We commend uh, the senators and representatives who have taken this step. This is very tough business inside the Congress. We know that. Uh, Senators Collins, Lieberman, Obama, Representative Shays and Meehan, from our standpoint, have shown real leadership in forcing this issue forward. We believe that there are changes that have to occur that cannot be dis solved by disclosure. We believe new restrictions are, are required to deal with travel, uh, to deal with the issue of company planes. No one get in America gets to fly on a corporate plane at deep discounted costs, uh, with the exception of members of Congress. Now, people get to fly on company planes. They either don't pay anything or they pay their way. Uh, this just has become a big problem. It has to be solved in both the campaign finance laws and the ethics laws. It has to be solved by restrictions, uh, uh, not by disclosure. Similarly, uh, there is a gaping loophole in the ethics laws in the gift rules uh, that, in effect, end up a stopping a lobbyist from buying you a dinner 
but allowing that same lobbyist to spend $25,000 or $50,000 to pay for a party honoring you at a national convention. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't add up to say we're restricting the role of lobbyists to give gifts to members uh, and not allowing them to buy dinners or putting limits on it when the lobbyist can go out and spend $50,000 to throw a party for a member. I'm not talking about the general receptions that are held at national party conventions. I am talking about the parties honoring specific members that have gotten totally out of hand and that now uh, end up costing in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and are funded almost exclusively by lobbyists and interests trying to influence Congress. There is talk uh, about a temporary ban on private travel, followed by uh, a review by the ethics committees uh, and potentially new rules in the coming year. Uh, first of all, we don't believe that pre-clearance is an approach that works for activities like travel. Even if it did work, you do not have a process, a place where that pre-clearance could be given in a publicly credible way. But our biggest concern is the following. If for some reason a temporary ban on private travel is proposed uh, in legislation, the majority must give a commitment that any changes in that travel restrictions or rules are allowed to be voted on at the beginning of next year. If that does not occur, then we could end up with travel rules in effect for this year that are voted on, new travel rules put into an overall package of rules, which is simply an up or down vote at the beginning of next year, and no capacity for anyone to vote on them or for people to amend or change them. So if the thought here is of doing temporary rules followed by new rules next year, we believe that must be accompanied by a commitment to allow new rules to be voted on. Uh, we, there are certain areas where disclosure, increased disclosure is required. The disclosure on lobbying reports today is minimal. You basically get a total of estimated amount spent in a six month period, which house was lobbied and which house the groups work on, that's it. That is the information you get. And uh, it is minimal information. If you want to uh, uh, do uh, effective disclosure, one of the things you are gonna have to disclose is the various ways that lobbyists provide money to help and benefit members. Because in the end, that is one of the most influential things that lobbyists do. Now, let me just take a second and read a list, and I don't think this is an exclusive list, of the ways that lobbyists can and help members. Make campaign contributions to members and their leadership PACs. Host fundraisers for members and their leadership PACs. Raise and bundle contributions for members and their leadership PACs. Arrange trips for members, paid for by their clients or employers. Arrange company planes for members at greatly subsidized rates. Pay for parties for members, such as the parties at the National Convention. Pay for meals and tickets to sporting events for members. Make contributions to foundations established or controlled by members. Finance retreats and conferences held by members. Now, that is a list of numerous ways that lobbyists can help members. And if any of those are going to be allowed to continue, then lobbying disclosure requires that information to be put on the public record. That kind of disclosure is provided for in the legislation that was introduced by Senators McCain and Lieberman, in the legislation uh, introduced uh, in the House by uh, Representative Shays, I believe it is also in the legislation introduced uh, by the House Democrats. That kind of disclosure is essential if we're going to improve transparency. 
transparency here. One last point I would like to make. Uh, there is talk about including 527 reform legislation in lobbying reform legislation. We very much support legislation to close the loophole for 527 groups that was created once again by the failure of the Federal Election Commission to properly interpret the laws. Those groups should be living under the campaign finance laws and complying with the laws. We think what they're doing is already illegal, uh, but we support clarifying it in legislation. We are also involved with uh, members in a lawsuit to try to clarify that. We do not support putting that legislation into lobbying reform legislation. We believe 527 legislation should be considered as a separate matter in both the House and Senate. One other point on campaign finance reform. We will work to defeat any legislation that includes provisions to gut existing campaign finance laws, regardless of what else is in that legislation. And as an example, I cite to you the provision in the Pence win proposal to exempt national parties from the aggregate limit on individual giving. That proposal would allow a single individual in the future to give $150,000 to the Republican national parties, $150,000 to the Democratic national parties, plus uh, an additional uh, $95,000 to state parties. But that individual would now be able to give $300,000 to the national parties, and a number of individuals give to both parties. That is the same as, soft, as returning big soft money contributions to the system. The problem with soft money was the size of the contributions, not the name. Uh, and any, for us, and I believe a number of other groups who work in this area, any bill that includes that kind of legislation will be turned from a lobbying reform bill to a bill to gut existing campaign finance laws, and we will do everything we can to defeat it. Appreciate your uh, time, Mr. Well, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wertheimer, and, and thanks to all of you for the time and effort that you have uh, put into uh, to this uh, very challenging issue. You uh, have all talked about how daunting the task is before us, and. I remember thinking back to the, uh, the Joint Committee, and I've said this time and time again as I've listened to colleagues on both sides of the aisle talk about some of the proposals that I've thrown out there. I've concluded that I will be dining alone downstairs, as uh, was said once by uh, one of my colleagues when we were looking at the issue of making uh, major changes, because a lot of this is, as I think all of you have agreed, uh, not terribly popular. Mr. Wertheimer, you uh, uh, talked about the sort of the focal point of uh, this being enforcement and the necessity for enforcement. And I know that we've had a discussion about the notion of outsiders involved. And nine years ago, uh, I joined with Lee Hamilton as our colleagues, uh, Bob Livingston and Ben Cardin, were uh, looking at, uh, at, at reform here. And I talked about the idea of outside involvement. And uh, a number of people have raised constitutional questions, both uh, Mr. Mann and Mr. Ornstein have talked about the fact that this, the, the constitutional questions could be addressed. As I, as I read uh, Professor Thurber's statement, um, I interpreted it, and correct me if I'm wrong here, as indicating that this need to get the Ethics Committee up and moving and going is very important. And your sense was that that would be an, an important prerequisite before we looked at any kind of outside involvement. Is that a correct interpretation of well, I, if, if they were up and, and working? I'm use the mic. Sorry. Mm -hmm. If they were up and working, I don't think you would need to have an Office of uh, Public Integrity. Uh, I think uh, that they have failed in their job, both in the House and the Senate, and uh, that the Office of Public Integrity could indeed uh, send cases to the ethics committees, which would help them immensely in terms of staff and investigation. So mm -hmm. your question is, uh, well, let's see whether they'll work. Well, they're not working. And I think that there's great pressure on this institution right now to get things working. And therefore, I strongly support the Obama uh, proposal, but also the, uh, uh, the one that is being marked up right now in the Senate before the uh, mm -hmm. Senate uh, 
Government Affairs and Homeland Security Committee. Could I comment, Absolutely. Mr. Chairman? Uh, I don't think you're going to restore credibility to the ethics enforcement process under the current system. I just don't think it's going to happen. We're dealing with a complete collapse at this stage. Uh, the Office of Public Integrity idea doesn't have outside commissioners for those who are concerned about it, although that's an alternative that also could work. It is, an, it is uh, inside the legislative branch, and it has both independence and checks so that it, has, it would have the power to conduct inquiries and investigations. But an ethics committee, by majority recorded vote, could say we disagree with that. But they'd have to do it in a public way so that you would still have both an independent office and the ethics committee with a, a relationship to that office. But if, if, an, if, an, if the director and the office felt a matter had to be looked at and the ethics committee disagreed, they would have to do it in a way that they took responsibility for it. Right now, uh, we don't have anything of that kind. I don't think you can solve this with an inspector general's mm -hmm. office, uh, although that's, uh, I just think you need some, uh, you need a, an entity that has independent, nonpartisanship and professionalism who has this job and a number of other functions, by the way. Uh, you should have a centralized place for all the reporting that goes on here. You should have an office that can give, that can give advice and counsel. Uh, you should centralize these functions, but this office would not be limited to just ethics enforcement. But if you do not deal with this, uh, I don't know how you're going to come up with a credible solution to the problems facing you now. Mr. Mr. Thank Mr. You Chair, may sure. I, might sure. I add that it's not only ethics that this office should deal with, but it's the law, the, the law, the statutes related to lobbying. It's both mm -hmm. ethics internally, but also the law. And so we're using the term ethics and law uh, in the same way. They're two different things in terms of uh, what's right. happening here Absolutely. as well as outside. Absolutely. Right. Uh, let me say, uh, as I did at the end of uh, Ms. Haas' testimony, I, I know that um, there are going to be lots of questions, and I hope all of you will be willing to uh, take some of the detailed questions that we might have in writing. And I've asked unanimous consent that members of the committee be able to have 30 days to uh, provide uh, questions to uh, those witnesses who've been before us today, and I very much would like to do that. So let me call on Mr. diaz Ballard now. Well, I also want to thank the five of you for taking uh, so much of your time and and for your effort, I, I will look forward to um, reading uh, your testimony. That unfortunately I wasn't able to uh, be here for your uh, oral testimony. I just would have one question. I know Mr. Wertheimer, I, I was able to hear at the end of his testimony, refer to the issue of uh, uh, travel paid for by uh, not for profit corporations, 501c3s. Um, perhaps you've addressed it, and so it might be redundant. I'm sorry, but if you haven't, uh, in, uh, or even if you have, uh, I'd like to ask your opinion on uh, on on, uh, on that. You know, it's it's an issue that's very much uh, in discussion. Uh, do you support or don't you? Or what is your position on uh, uh, travel by members uh, paid for by 501c3s? To all of you, Jim. As I said in my uh, statement in my remarks, uh, I would ideally ban all privately funded travel. Um, I agree with uh, my friend Lee Hamilton that if there's a public purpose for the travel, then it should be done at public <coughs> expense. There may be a very limited number of uh, <coughs> private institutions that might offer legitimate opportunities for travel with a public purpose. You should look at that. One thing that concerns me uh, is that uh, Members really don't travel abroad enough. Uh, I think it can be very uh, useful to members of Congress uh, to, to travel abroad, especially nowadays, to better understand what's happening in the world. And that view has been reinforced by the past decade when I've spent so much time working with uh, and for uh, all of the members of the WTO. Um, 
That has, in itself, broadened my understanding of the world. And I think I would have been a better member of Congress had I done some foreign travel. <laughs> I didn't take any foreign trips when I was a member of Congress. I didn't do that uh, because I was nobler than others or more virtuous than others. I did it because I was a Democrat in a heavily Republican district, as you certainly will recall. And uh, I was afraid of the political consequences. I was afraid of the 32nd ad. In 1993, NASA came to me and said, we want you to go over to Russia and kick the tires of the Russian space program because we're going to be working with them more closely and you're one of our uh, strong advocates on the Hill and we'd like you to have a better understanding of what they're doing so we could have a better understanding of what we should do. And they were right about that, but I didn't go because I was apprehensive about the consequences back home of having gone. Um, I think these kinds of things need to be factored in. Uh, abuse by a few uh, makes it more difficult for all the many who don't uh, engage in abuses to do the right job for their constituents. Um, again, uh, I stressed before, and I would stress w once more, uh, Congressman, that uh, uh, I would urge all of you, whatever you do, to try to find a bipartisan approach because more than any of the details of what you do on travel or anything else, uh, the fact that you take a bipartisan approach, I think, will do more than anything else to reassure the American. Former Congressman Hamilton. If you Yeah, he is for ban on private travel. But if you are going to allow exceptions, you have to do it very carefully uh, to prevent abuses. And that's the difficulty with exceptions. Uh, Mr. Abramoff's trips that he financed through his clients were paid for by a 501c organization that uh, did not lobby, in my uh, knowledge of this. So once you start looking at exemptions for 501c's, you have to do it in a very narrow way or else you're going to open up the kinds of problems that have happened in the past. Yes. Uh I'm taking a moderate position. I think it's very important for members of Congress to be educated, to investigate issues. And if, for example, they want to go to the Palouse uh, in the state of Washington to see uh, about a uh, problem with the dams there and a 501c3 organization, Washington State University, wants to pay for it, it's a university, and it's, bipart and it's bipartisan and it's pre-cleared, I say don't ban it. Uh, I'm not for a ban on uh, 501c3 travel. And remember, we have 4,000 universities in the United States. Many of them have aircraft. Um, and they fly members uh, out to their universities to find out about research and, and other activities. What I want is a bipartisan approach to the travel. Have pre-clearance, make sure that both parties are part of this and that it's truly an educational uh, uh, event rather than gaming the system to go out and play golf uh, or to ski or something. So I'm not for banning it. I, I would have personally opposed the ban on travel. I think 99.9% .9 of these trips are very valuable to members and the constituents um, that, you know, with, on these issues. I, I think the question becomes a transparency. How do you make these, ish, these travels or these trips more transparent to the general public? You make the, the member of Congress and or staff vet them through the Ethics Committee, make that mandatory. You make the, the person who's offering that trip or the nonprofit who's offering that trip, make them go through the same scrutiny. You, you submit travel vouchers, you know, how much is it going to cost? What are you going to be attending? What kind of seminars are you going to be going through travel and all that? And you make that, you submit that to the Ethics and let Ethics Committee, again, in a bipartisan way, deem whether that trip is necessary or not. Uh, let me first say that uh, the pre-clearance issue I, I have grave doubts about. The Ethics Committee, as it's currently constituted, given the staff that it has, the idea that members get a free pass if they get things pre-cleared, do it with a, a small staff that's going to do a cursory uh, examination of who's paying for the trip. And that's what's happened in some of these trips in the past, that where money was channeled through, laundered through, really, 501Cs. It's just not going to work. 
and it's never going to work with the staff that's there. It might work differently if you had an Office of Public Integrity with a very substantial staff and you could really do a serious uh, vetting, but I, I'm just very skeptical of that. In an ideal world, there would be no privately funded travel. Trips that members take, which have a public purpose, should be funded for by taxpayers. And that's whether, uh, whether it's a trip abroad or a trip to a plant uh, to inspect it or a trip to a conference, uh, and you should be able to defend it. Uh, now, I think the practical reality is that for decades, partly because, frankly, we had a press corps that every time we'd get the travel disclosure forms out would write these thumbsucker stories about junkets. Didn't matter who was taking the trip or where they were going, it was easy to bash members of Congress like pinatas because they were traveling abroad. And that contributed, I think, to a serious deterioration of public dialogue and of the knowledge of members of Congress. Many would not travel because of a fear that it would be used against them politically. Post 9-11, that's not as big a problem. I think it's not difficult for a member to defend a trip almost anywhere in the world now because we're now aware that even small out-of-the-way places actually can have links to evil people trying to kill us. But having said that, I think the practical reality is you're going to get a lot less travel if you only have uh, public funding. So I'm not averse to having some nonprofit groups. I must say, having spent most of my career as an academic, nonetheless, the fact that universities uh, offer travel and have planes, when I see the academic earmarking that's going on around here, I think the lobbying done by universities is as substantial as almost anybody else. I'm not sure I want to give them a free pass. Uh, but uh, there are trips done through nonprofit organizations that have very legitimate educational purposes. What you do need to do, it seems to me, pre-clearance or not, is to make sure that if any 501c is used as a conduit for funds from lobbyists, from corporations, from others, uh, that there are stiff penalties, really stiff penalties, for those who let their organizations be used that way. It has been done. I believe Mr. Abramoff uh, and others have done it. It's too much of a temptation if you leave open travel by 501Cs to have 501Cs created for purposes of laundering money through or used in that fashion. Mr. Chairman, um, Jim, it's awfully nice to see you again. And I, I served through that. I'm probably the only one on our side that did serve with you. And you were a very distinctive member. And I miss you. Uh, I know you're not here representing Greenberg Towering, but nonetheless, you were a founder of the firm. And uh, I know you've been away for 10 years, but I, nonetheless, I've got to ask these questions of you. Uh, in two and a half years, uh, Jack Abramoff brought that firm $33,230,000 in lobbying fees uh, in just two and a half years. Is that normal? Is that, do you, all of your lobbies bring in that kind of fee? He was successful with the firm. Yes. Uh, but there are others uh, in the firm, lobbyists, that do as well? lobbyists uh, and uh, uh, lawyers who both lobby and don't lobby who uh, do as well in terms of bringing in uh, business to the firm. Uh, as I mentioned, our law firm at this point has 1,500 lawyers and other professionals. We have 27 offices. We have affiliations uh, throughout the world. Uh, we're on a calendar year, we're a private company, but uh, according to American Lawyer and uh, the National Law Journal, uh, in, in our overall uh, gross receipts, we're uh, among the leaders in, in the country. So his overall production for us was a small part of our uh, overall firm and even a small part of our Washington office, which is largely an office uh, of lawyers who don't do much or any lobbying. Well, that answers my second question. I, I was curious as why no other lobbyist ever said to any of the managing partners, what is it you think Jack, uh, Jack Abramoff is doing over there getting that kind of money from Indian tribes? But uh, if they're all making the same amount of money, it wouldn't show up. Um, the Obviously, the, the I understand as very well, well. He did very well as a lobbyist. Yeah. I wouldn't want to minimize that. Uh, and but, he did very well because he had friends here who helped him. I, 
really was not involved in Mr. Abramoff's doing, so I don't know how right. he did what he did. <laughs> but now, one of the things that I understand he did was that he instructed his clients to pay half to you and half to a uh, some kind of a charity or something that Scanlon ran. Is that common? Uh, most, uh, no, that's not common uh, And nobody all. ever noticed that? Uh, Mr. Abramoff uh, confessed to certain crimes, and if you look at his confession, you will find that among the things he confessed to was defrauding our law firm. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's, un uh, it's unquestionably so that his greatest victims were a number of our clients, and, and, and we regret that very much, and we've tried to fulfill our obligations to all of our clients. But our law firm was also a victim of Mr. Abramoff. Right. Well, I probably, I'm sure you didn't know anything about the uh, little place he had down at Rehoboth Beach where he laundered money to people like uh, Mr. Reed, Ralph Reed, and others. You did not know that was going on. I, I, no, I didn't. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever met Ralph Reed, and my recollection is he wasn't too fond of my politics. I bet. <laughs> well. Uh, I, you know, it's, as again, I, I, I know you weren't there, and I know you to be a thoroughly ethical man, and everything, but um, while I, in my view, Abramoff is a symptom, uh, the disease is here, and I think that there must be far more lobbyists than Abramoff that we just don't know about. But what they did with the Northern Marianas and the members of this Congress who helped him with that, I think, is, is a pretty awful thing. Um, let me ask Mr. Miller about that. Um, I certainly appreciate your testimony, and I think you had some very good ideas for us today. But was there anybody in, in your association or everything who ever thought that this man might be doing things that you consider unethical? He's never been a member of our He's association. He's not a member. Okay, never has that answers been. that. And, and if I could ask you a follow up on one question you just asked about fees. Um, yes, Mr. Abramoff charged some outrageous fees. I think everybody in this town will agree with that. I don't think anybody else is doing. But I also have to put the onus on the folks who are paying him. They have a responsibility to interview those folks who they want representing them here in Washington. If they're just going to take one man's word for it, then I don't have a lot of sympathy for them in that regard. Yes, he broke the law, so I do have sympathy for them in that regard. But I think they have to do a, de a better job of due diligence when they're hiring people to represent them in Washington to make sure they meet a certain standard. And the hundreds of thousands of dollars he's charging a month is not typical here in Washington. What is typical? It ranges depending on, on the size of the client and, and the issue and, and the amount of hours you're going to have to put in. But I would say a ballpark is anywhere from 5000 to 25000 a month. Yeah, well, uh, since the K Street project, I don't see anybody unless they come down from the district. So I, I, I'm not sure what they're doing or what they make. But let me agree with all of you. I, there's no reason for lobbyists to give us gifts. A lobbyist is supposed to give us information, as far as I understand, and that's, that's it. Uh, and frankly, if we ban them, that's fine with me. I, I don't uh, partake of that anyway. Which brings me to another thing is that uh, somebody in the, uh, your firm must have noticed that he was taking Tom DeLay and other people on golfing trips to, uh, uh, to Scotland without, uh, without it being a, a really legal thing to do. But nobody said a thing. Well, I don't happen to play golf. Me either. I, 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 I don't either. And I don't Don't ski. go out to dinner much either. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I wasn't on that trip. I, I know. I, I, I'm sure I'm, I don't mean to our throw firm, around your neck what I consider the extraordinary shortcomings of your firm. I, I, our firm uh, discovered the transgressions uh, of Mr. Abramoff, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, at the time everyone else did, by yeah. reading about them in the newspaper. And then uh, I believe the record will reflect that our uh, firm hired outside counsel to conduct an independent investigation. Uh, when uh, the leadership of our firm learned that uh, Mr. Abramoff had been lying uh, to our CEO and others about his relationships with Mr. Scanlon after we read about Mr. Scanlon uh, and the allegations in the newspaper, Mr. Abramoff was asked to leave the firm, uh, and, and he did. And since that time, uh, our law firm has every, done everything we possibly can to uh, compensate uh, our, our clients, to cooperate with uh, committees up here and others who are investigating this matter. Uh, I believe I'm correct when I say that the only reason that everyone has had the uh, opportunity to read all of Mr. Abramoff's emails is because we gave them voluntarily mm -hmm. 
uh, to folks over on the Senate side. Uh, I apologize if that's not correct, but that's my understanding. Uh, our law firm uh, has uh, uh, tried very hard to uh, do the right thing in the aftermath of all of this, but as I said, uh, we are among the victims of, uh, of his fraud and his, and his deceit. Any one of us can be victimized. Uh, from time to time, members of Congress violate the law. And I recall when I was a member how embarrassed I was when someone would do that. And I would be tarred by guilt by association. There are one or two members of Congress here recently who have had some problems. And that doesn't reflect on you, because I, too, know you to be I think thoroughly it does. ethical. I, it does. My, my concern is I think the public sees well, it, it as all it, of us. It affects your, your credibility and your legitimacy, mm -hmm. not your personal integrity. But I know it's painful to you, because I know you, just as it's painful to me. I regret after, it for my country. Yeah, it's painful to me after a lifetime in public service, mm -hmm. where my integrity has never been impugned, to have to ask answer questions about Mr. Abramoff, whom I barely know. Um, but I'm here to answer your questions to the extent that I can. And our law firm uh, is comprised of uh, good and honest people who try every day to do their best to do the right thing in the right way. And we're going to try even harder in the days to come. I hope so. Dr. Ornstein? Um, Mrs. Slaughter, I, I think uh, actually while some of Mr. Abramoff's clients were victimized, uh, the American people are the victims here. But more than that, some of his clients were not victimized. Uh, they paid money and they got and lots they of got benefits for it. Yeah. Uh, E-Lottery paid him a good deal of money and they managed to uh, block a bill that would have banned uh, gambling on the Internet. Uh, the uh, uh, firms in the Northern Marianas Islands paid him a lot of money and that worked uh, for them to be able to continue to send goods here uh, uh, that said made in America. I think what Mr. Abramoff did was to uh, recognize, given the size and scope of the federal government now, the things that are done and the amount of money sloshing around out there, that instead of operating as lawyers had traditionally operated uh, on the basis of an hourly fee or a modest retainer mm -hmm. with more if you do more work, that you could go to people and basically say, I'll get you $100 million in benefits if you give me 10 percent or 15 percent. It's a little bit similar, actually, I think, to some of the uh, personal injury lawyers uh, recognizing that uh, they could do some things with uh, class action lawsuits. Yeah. And it's worked. Now, it worked for Mitchell Wade and the other people who uh, were involved with Duke Cunningham who said, geez, I can get a $150 million defense contract if I give him $2 million. And that's a problem uh, that uh, gets back to the nature of earmarking defined broadly. Uh, as long as individual members ha are given the ability to direct hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in funds to different places, lots of people, whether it's universities deciding that they want to get their piece of the research action or defense contractors deciding that they want to get things channeled in their way, that has led to, I think, a very major distortion of the legislative process. We're not getting decisions made on the basis of costs and benefits to the society or who can do them best in the way that we ought to. And we've seen with Mr. Abramoff and with Mr. Cunningham a window opened into a reality that it would be nice. Many of us would like to see a smaller federal government. As long as we've got one that's got this power and this money, we're going to have to constantly be on guard to a new reality that you don't, you know, you bribe somebody with a couple million dollars, you can get an untold benefit. And we can't let that sort of thing happen. And I, I think one of the most astonishing things was that uh, Congressman Cunningham had a little piece of paper with the seal of the House of Representatives on it where he told everybody how much it cost to bribe him for whatever it was they were interested in. Uh, but going back to the, the Pentagon contracts, it's worth your life to try to find out where they came from. For those of us in the House, most of us, it's, it's very difficult to live with the notion that 80 percent of the Marines that died in, the, in Iraq would have lived had they had the proper armor. And one small company in Ohio, and I don't know how they got that contract, but we're trying to find out, was unable to perform and could not provide that. This is going on, but again, if I can go back to what I said tomorrow, we're going to do the most awful thing next week. To benefit the food industry, we're going to take away restaurant inspection, milk, not get to put anything on any labels that anybody might be allergic to. No hearings, no nothing, and everybody loves it. Uh, so what I, I, 
I think the process is broken here. I'm concerned about the lobbyists, and I'm certainly concerned about the kind of money that they're paid. Uh, but it's what as you pointed out, what's happening to the American people who lose every time these other folks win. And, uh, and it's absolutely. Congresswoman, can I yes. add something to that, to the, to the gift, gift question? I think what we're talking about is two things, gifts and meals. If Congress, if members of Congress want to ban gifts, I, th I think they have to be fair about this, and they have to ban all gifts. And, that, inclu and that includes the 14 current exemptions. If I'm a friend of a member of Congress, I can give you any gift I want. But if I'm a lobbyist, I can't do that. So if you're going to yeah. ban gifts, you have to ban them all Absolutely. together, which is, includes the 14 exemptions. But I think what we're also talking about is real gifts, the watches and things that maybe Mr. Cunningham got in, in return for some favors. Honey, but he I, got two and a half million dollars well, worth. E exactly. But oh, I, what, what we're talking that's about not is like. But watches. the lunches, the lunches that we're taking congressional staffers or even yeah. a member of Congress out for, that's that that's not part of the problem in the system. The system, the part of the problem in the system is those gifts that Mr. Mr. Cunningham may have gotten. It's it's not the lunches that that's doing any harm. But why the lobbyist's job is really to impart information. Correct. But your why office, do you have to do that over be, food? Because your offices are so busy each and every day to get a, a quiet meeting where the phone's not ringing, where there's not six or seven people in your lobby where you may have to meet sometimes well, or in the hallway. Right. There's an opportunity for us to go down to the cafeteria or off the hill to maybe Tortilla yeah. Coast or some other restaurant like that. I'm not saying that they're all at that place. Yeah, some people have abused the system by going to fancy lunches each and every day. But even at a $100 limit per year, that's reasonable. So to buy somebody a coffee or a, a cheap breakfast or lunch gets you a lot more time to really get in detail about the issues that are impacting your clients or your constituents. Perhaps. Well, as I said, the lobbyists since the K Street project don't really come to see us anymore, so I'm not overwhelmed. Mr. Well, Thurber? Yes, I'd like to add to the discussion and remind uh, the members of the, of the committee that we're only talking about Congress. Most lobbying in Washington, D.C. is done with the executive branch, mm. and most of it is non transparent. Let's take the case of Boeing Aircraft, the state of Washington, that attempted to have a sole source, eight uh, 18 to 23 billion dollar lease agreement with the Air Force for tankers. Uh, most of that activity was an activity related to the executive branch. Every department has really thousands of people advocating policies every day, and much of Abramoff's work, in fact, for the Indian tribes, was not even done up here. It was done in the Department of Interior. So let's let's broaden this and make sure that it's, you you don't bash. Congress for, for, for having problems here, but get to the issue of lobbying with respect to the executive branch. With respect to earmarks, everyone, everyone's talking about spending earmarks, right, appropriations, but there were over 6,000 earmarks on the transportation bill, 7,000 on the energy bill. Uh, there are all kinds of earmarks associated with the tax bills and other authorization bills. If you deal with transparency on earmarks, and you all have the right to have earmarks because you have the power of the purse up here. But if you deal with transparency on earmarks, be sure that you deal with spending as well as taxes, as well as authorization, uh, especially at the conference stage where they have not been considered in either body. I think it should, there should be a special vote on those, mm -hmm. it should be transparent and it should be associated with a member of Congress and justified and it, and a uh, amount of time to consider it by everyone before it slipped in to the bill late at night. We had that slipping in in the defense bill just before Christmas when they uh, indemnified everybody anything to do with avian flu, uh, which had nothing to do with what we were doing. Um, let me uh, ask Mr. Uh, Miller again. Um, given so few members of the lobbying uh, fraternity file, do you not have any oversight or requirement of your members to file I, I disagree files. with that number. That's so few file. I've heard 5%. F file their forms? Mm -hmm. I, I would disagree with that, and, and I don't know the actual number, but I can't believe that only 5% of the lobbying but committee you, file their forms. But you heard Professor Thurber say that he tried his best to find out how many complaints were filed, but, and he couldn't. But that's through the Justice Department. I think I think the clerk even said that there were some 16 to 20,000 reports filed already. So I, I would disagree with the number of 5% only file their forms. There's only according to you have to, no mechanism though in your no we don't but and that's one of the things that you know we maybe we need to think about maybe the an independent commission to talk about um, ethics here and, 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 and auditing the lobbying profession but maybe we need as an organization to set up our own ABA style type of 
of committee that reviews auditing and, and, and reports for, for lobbyists. But again, we represent about 750 members of the entire community, so you'd have to require everybody mm. to become a, a member of our organization for us to be able to police everybody, and that would require resources. Really, 750 out of 35,000? I, see, I disagree with the number 35,000. If you talk to Deborah Mayberry, who puts together a book, registered lobbyists? It's a, the number I've been told is 11,500. Well, we, we've heard there were 9,500 uh, when Clinton left, and it's but see, that's, 34,000. That's part of the problem. If you look at the Senate database, they'll tell you that there's not a good calculation because you count people who get married and change their, their name, you count people who are deceased, you count people who are retired, and you count people who may register as Paul Miller or Paul A. Miller the second but time. So. Even, even at that, that's 63 lobbyists for each of us, if, if we accept that number, which is uh, so atrocious that I can barely But i got to ask the question, it. why is that wrong? Uh, why is it wrong? I, I, I think it's so excessive that it doesn't make any sense, to tell you the truth. Uh, what do you think about writing these bills, the lobbyists writing the bills? I, I don't necessarily see is a bigger problem as you see it, because I think the, the, the experts that you're asking, talking about these issues of Medicare bill, and I know that's not a, probably a good one to use because there's oh, so many problems. One. No, it's, it's not. Oh, it was written by, by the industry. But it's on both sides. There's experts both on sides every, of what? On, on Republicans and Democrats. Democrats are, were in the room. But in, were in the room. But in the past, I mean, Democrats were in charge in the majority, too, and, and they've asked right. lobbyists to help them write pieces of legislation. They were actually in the room writing it? Well, I, I can't say that. As they are now? I would venture to guess yes. And if people are being honest I with don't you, believe so. but I don't see that as a bad or a negative thing because you're asking experts to help you write legislation that will help well, impact this country. Let me tell country. you why that's a bad thing. We were elected by our constituents to come down and write those bills to their benefit, not to yours or anybody that's paying you to come to tell me you think this would be a good thing. Now, you do have every right under the First Amendment to come and tell me how you feel about it. But if I'm only hearing your side of the story, that's crazy. And if I invite you in to write the thing, I have sold out my responsibility. I am no longer a member of Congress in good standing, as far as I'm concerned. I am simply your lackey and, and doing what you want me to do, which is precisely what we see happening. Well, yeah, I agree with you. I think you should take input from both sides. But I think don't discount those folks in our profession that will be able to help you, who are experts in that area, from both sides. From Supporting and opposing There's a views. difference in your giving me your opinion and writing the bill. But There's I, a major difference. But I don't think you can make this a, a Republican or Democratic issue because I, I truly believe if, if when you talk to Democrats who were in power back then, it, it happened then too. Well, I've been here 20 years. I've never heard of the uh, any chairman of any committee calling the Capitol Police to discharge the Republicans from a library has happened to the Democrats. I, I don't know. And anything. I don't, I've never heard of anything like Charlie Rangel and, and Barry standing outside the door of the Ways and Means Conference trying to get in and couldn't. Uh, let me tell you, we're out of, ha we're out of control here. Uh, and I, I tell kids every time when I go talk to them, whatever they teach you here about how a bill is passed, you can just forget it. We don't do that anymore. I want it back. And I want the lobbyists under control. I don't have any reason in the world to believe anybody needs 63 people coming at them to talk to them. It is so one-sided. I have, how could you possibly, if you have all that and all those lobbyists in us, how do you get the voice of the people in? I do it by going home. I guess Jim does it every weekend and talking to them. But good grief, I have to tell you, I'm headed up to here with these bills that are going through here, written by special interest and that are hurting this country but badly you, and are costing every man, woman, and child in the country. But all, but all your constituents can't spend as much time up here as, as, as you are back home. So for them to come here and, and, and actually have their voice heard with you, they'd have to quit their jobs and spend a lot of time here. That's the value we serve. We do it for them. I still say you only give one point of view. I disagree you with you. You are the one you're paid to give. I disagree with you because if, if you're if you're, you're going doing, to give me both sides of an issue. If you're doing your job and your staff, most of them do a very good job. One of the first questions out of their mouth is, "Who opposes this?" And if you aren't, if you are not going to give them that point of view of who opposes you and why, you're not doing your job. And I would put that onus on us. If we're not doing that, which I don't believe in, in most cases is happening, we are doing that because one of the first things we do is we research the opposite side of, of our issue. That's how, that's, we only make, have success if we're going to do that. Well, but then you're only 750 out of 34,000. Does anybody have a comment, well, Dr. Well, Thurber? Yeah. One quick thing, because I was uh, at one point referring to the number of firms that do not register. We don't know exactly how many there are. 
And then I was referring to the number of cases that have been referred to the Department of Justice, and there's no evidence that there's been any prosecutions or anything associated with those. But I would like to say that my estimate is there's over 100,000 people in the lobbying industry in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., if you include all forms of lobbying, grassroots, top roots, direct mail, uh, coalition building, and then a little bit of it is meeting you and your staff. Uh, as well as PR mm -hmm. firms that are, what are they here for? They're here to change public policy. So you have about 2,000 people for per member mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, advocacy business in Washington, D.C. And Mr. Miller is correct that the PR people should, for, I have one more thing I want to say, please, and I want to agree with all of you that the ethics idea is broken. Uh, I know we talked in the 90s about having retired federal judges or we're going to be able to survive here. Uh, as you know, at the beginning of the term, uh, the process was gutted. And even though the public outcry forced that to be reversed, they won anyway because we're in our 15th month here and they're still not running. So thank you. Thank you. Here's different. Yeah. <laughs> I've been here 14 years and I've been involved in a number of uh, legislative projects and have been able to draft um, a number of pieces of legislation that have been passed in the foreign policy area and the immigration area and others. Never has there been a lobbyist in the room while I have drafted legislation. So the, the idea that uh, somehow it's commonplace or common practice for lobbyists to draft legislation or be in the room, I just want to make sure, I want to state for the record that as someone who's been here 14 years, that is not common practice nor common place. I think it's important for the facts to be known. You may. But, well, actually, I want to yield to Mr. Hastings because I want to make sure everybody has an, an opportunity, to, but you can say it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate uh, your, your tolerance and uh, your patience, and I appreciate uh, your tolerance and, and patience. And, uh, and I, uh, I think there is a great deal of worthwhile discussion that has uh, come out of all of this. The purpose, however, of this meeting, uh, this hearing was on lobbying reform. Uh, there is a lot of discussion on other issues that, uh, that I'm in. Uh, involved with, uh, but that will be for another time. I'm not going to suggest at all that they are not interrelated because they are. But before I was elected to Congress, I was, I had a small business in my hometown. It was, uh, we sold paper and janitorial supplies. That happens to be a very big industry in this country. Uh, large enough that there are really only three sites to hold a national convention. And I say that because uh, our, th these national uh, conventions that they have, I don't know if that's a proper word, the, really a trade show, is designed for all of the entrepreneurs uh, in this industry to show their wares. Uh, I went to several of those. Uh, we had, I, I thought, very good product lines. But the point I'm getting to is this, is that I viewed those companies and their salesmen uh, as, in, in many respects, lobbyists for their wares. They came to me and they laid out what they had to sell, how broad their product line was, how unique it was in order to uh, help people that would buy their product line. Uh, then I could go to the next booth and uh, talk to a similar manufacturer of similar products. And at the end of the day, I would make up a termination which would be best for my business. That is what the essence of salesmanship is, and that is the essence, in my view, of what lobbyists is. Lobbyists, frankly, go a step farther because they are constitutionally protected. Now, it's interesting that uh, yesterday and even today we referred to uh, a bill that we're currently debating on the floor right now. It was suggested yesterday uh, that one of the members, in fact, the sponsor of the bill, was not qualified 
to deal with that subject matter because that individual was not a scientist or a biophysicist or whatever uh, it was that was described. I'm not sure I subscribe to that theory. But if we were to take that theory and extend it to today, it seems to me that the one person here that is actively involved in lobbying reform is a lobbyist. There's only one of you that are lobbyists. I don't think you lobby anymore, uh, at least you didn't suggest that. Uh, are you a registered lobby? Okay, I, I apologize for that. I, there's two, so you've certainly. But um, uh, with that in mind, uh, with that in mind, I, I noted here, and I apologize, I missed part of your uh, testimony, Mr. Miller. I was, as a matter of fact, meeting with some constituents. They were lobbying me on an issue that was very important to my district, and I, uh, I uh, took to heart what they had to say. I think that's part of the process. But I note here that you have a uh, code of ethics, and let me, let me read through these, uh, at least by article. I won't read them all. But the first one is Article 1, Honest and Integrity, and you have uh, a couple of bullet points that uh, you feel your industry ought to, to comply with. Article 2 is compliance with applicable laws, regulations, and rules, self-governing. Article 3 talks about professionalism. Article 4 talks about conflicts of interest. Article 5, due diligence and best efforts. Article 6, compensation and engagement terms. That was alluded to, and I'm sure, uh, uh, I'm sure you're sensitive to, to that one. Uh, Article 7, confidentiality. Article 8, public education. Article 9, duty to governmental institutions. Those are the articles of your code of ethics. You're a professional organization. Uh, this was passed, I understand, in 2000, so you're uh, emerging as association. I, w I just want to ask uh, all of you that are not lobbyists, so Mr. Wertheimer, you don't have to respond to this, but those that you are not lobbyists, what do you think of these uh, uh, code of ethics that these lobbyist organizations put together? Dr. Thurber, by the way, Dr. Thurber, there's nothing wrong with the dams in southeastern Washington. The fish are passing very well through that. I just don't want them to be breached. Uh, neither do I, and so that is why I say everything is working very Good. well. So. Good. But thank you, Dr. Thurber. Go ahead. As you know, I taught at Washington State University for several You're years. You're a cougar then, huh? Right. You know what the word. Not a cougar. I just taught there. You, well, <laughs> you know what the word cougar means then. Uh, no. Oh, well, I mean? won't tell you then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have studied his code of ethics, and I serve on the ethics committee of the American Association of Political Consultants for the last five years. I chaired it. I'm on the executive board of that organization. It's made up of campaign consultants, but also some lobbyists. Respectfully to Paul, uh, the problem with his organization is that maybe, and he would have a better estimate, only about 10% of the lobbyists in Washington, D.C., and not from the major firms, in my opinion, uh, belong to that organization. But I've studied it. I've, I've published uh, about that code of ethics, the code of ethics of the AAPC, and I think that it would be a good idea uh, for lobbyists to sign on to this and to join his organization. The problem is that they're really not taking it, sorry, Paul, but very seriously, uh, and they're not joining. and. They claim, and I agree with them, the ones that I know, and I know many of them, uh, that they are uh, uh, meeting or exceeding those codes of ethics. That the most important thing about uh, ethical behavior is not only the law, but, but their internal code that they develop over many years. And if you don't have it, you don't succeed. Um, if you're like Abramoff and almost every lobbyist that I know that teach in my classes say that he, you know, he, he's really an outlier. I mean, it's very, very rare uh, to have that kind of phenomena going on. Uh, they say that they've got an internal code of ethics that, uh, that regulates that. Um, I have run surveys and also focus groups with interest groups, I mean with uh, lobbyists. And by, by the way, I said interest groups because most of the lobbyists in Washington, D.C. are lobbyists for associations, for professional associations. Uh, they're not freestanding firms that, that are like law firms that bring in clients. Most of those associations probably have a code of ethics also. They do. So I, I'm going on and on. I, I support the code of ethics, 
but it's not uh, it's not being uh, taken very seriously right now. Con Sorry, Paul. Congressman, can I say yes, something to that? Do. I disagree a little bit. Our code of ethics to our members is, is very serious. Most of the folks that I know have it on, hanging on their wall. They, they, they find it something that they have to live by and should live by. As far as us not having key member lobbyists in this town or highly respected lobbyists in this town as members of ours, I disagree with you on that. Bob Walker, one of your former colleagues, is a, is a former board member of ours and very active in our organization. Patton Boggs is very active in our organization. Don Alexander former IRS commissioner, still a strong member of ours, and you have Cassidy and Associates who are members of ours with, Je with former Congressman Jack Quinn sitting on our board of directors. Good. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry to, if I might come back. I, I make that statement empirically because I've studied who's, you know, who's in your organization and who isn't, and so I make it from that. Uh, statement. Not, it's not a value judgment, it's an empirical observation. Well, let, this, let, let, let me make an observation too, and, and this organization is only six years old, if I read this correctly. Um, or the, or the Code of Ethics is only six years old. Okay, but the organization has been around 25 years. Uh, I, I confess in the, in the industry that I was talking about, uh, not everybody that sells paper and janitorial supplies is in that industry, but they see value in that. And I think, as uh, I just think, the, the more we talk about this, uh, hopefully there will be more that will see value uh, in what you have to offer. I think that's a very positive thing. In, in a, you know, th th this is the people's government. We are, we are free to make whatever associations that we, uh, we want to make. Uh, in, in fact, I think that's why we have done so well uh, as, dis as, as broadly as we are in this country from different backgrounds and so forth, why we are where we are today in the world because of that free association. And I think we, we shouldn't lose sight of that. Dr. Wertheimer, you wanted, did, did you want to say something on that? Okay. Just add one quick Please thing do. about that. I realize that this, this issue with Mr. Abramoff is, is a real serious one for our, our profession. Um, but prior to this, um, our organization realized that we needed to do more. We needed to do more in the area of education. So it, it happens to be a system. Uh, circumstance, but we have implemented a new lo voluntary lobbying certification program for our members to edu help better educate them on the new rules and everything else that's going on here um, so that they can continue and get education. There's really not one place that you can go in a couple hours at a time to get some real education on this. So we are doing that now. Um, it is helping with our membership. I, I make no bones about that. So our organization has always been labeled as a, as a breakfast, lunch, and club. It was in the beginning. It's becoming and growing into a lot more. We've been around 25 years, but I would say in the last six years we've become real serious. So we are in the infancy stages. Good. I do want to add something here. Please. Uh, Mr. Abramoff has been described as an aberration, and certainly in terms of his criminality and his personal ethics code and his greed uh, and his use of language, he is an aberration. But the techniques that Mr. Abramoff used are used by many lobbyists. Uh, the providing of trips, uh, the providing of campaign contributions, in his case both hard money and soft money before soft money was banned. Uh, the providing of meals, the providing of tickets to sporting events, the kinds of techniques he used to try to gain influence are common practice in Washington among lobbyists. So I think it's a mistake to simply focus on Mr. Abramoff as an aberration. I think you have to focus on the practices that are used to try to influence members of Congress and how to change the rules here to protect both the interests of the American people and your own reputations and your own integrity. Just one quick comment, uh, Mr. Hastings. Uh, I, codes of ethics are, are nice. This is a perfectly good code of ethics. Uh, I had a small hand uh, in the drafting of the House and Senate codes of ethics back in the mid-1970s. Um, and it was a difficult job and they're well done as well any code of ethics is only as good as the enforcement that's behind it. It's nice to educate people on what is appropriate and uh, maybe what's inappropriate. Uh, clever people can take a code of ethics and do things that seem to fit within it that are simply inappropriate. But if people know that nobody is going to be there looking over their shoulders, that they can do all kinds of things without it being disclosed, and that even if it's disclosed, nothing particular is going to happen to them, and in the process they can make lots of money, then it becomes meaningless. And I think that's true as true among lobbyists as it is here. 
Well, I think our founders recognize that. That's why they made three branches of government with distinct responsibilities. So, uh, we're, after all, we're all human, and uh, we're subject to human frailties. And so, I, I, I mean, that's the very basis of what our country is founded upon is, is uh, self-discipline of some sort. That's very difficult. There's no question about that. Finally, let me just, I want to ask a question of you, uh, Mr. Dr. Ornstein and Mr. Wertheimer. Uh, I think both of you are on record as saying specifically for staff there ought to be a two-year cooling period. Uh, two questions in that regard. Uh, are you afraid that there may be a, before, say, a two-year time period is put in place, there may be a brain drain off the hill? Because there are some very, very good staffers here. Uh, and, uh, you know, with the different makeup of our society, people, uh, I mean, when I, when I grew up, uh, people can't tend to stay in one job all the time. That certainly has changed. I mean, different generations do all of that. So first question, are you, sure, are you afraid of a brain drain? And the second one is an obvious follow-up to that. Uh, if, if the first one is that they're, they're concerned about that, would there not be a concern about people wanting to come on the Hill knowing that you have that two-year uh, exception? Uh, our principal focus has been in increasing the two-year period for member, former members of Congress and to broadening the scope so that members could neither... But this, this question was specifically staff. That's correct, but I'm saying that's our principal focus. We have supported uh, increasing the current scope from one year to two years. We have not supported making it uh, apply to the whole body as some proposals have done. Uh, we've supported an increase to two years going back to your own office or your own committee. I think the concern you raise is a legitimate one. I think you do need to uh, have a balance here that makes it uh, capable for people to come on and off the hill uh, while at the same time providing protections. Uh, and I think the issues are different for staff than they are for members. I think the biggest potential problem today lies with former members uh, as opposed to congressional staff. I'm going to disagree a little bit there. I, I, I uh, worry about the staff, and I worry about it in a variety of ways. I've been worried about a brain drain for a long time, even without a two-year uh, ban. In fact, I think uh, the way things have worked, the incentive for staff to leave and go into lobbying jobs has increased enormously over the last uh, several years. We've lost an awful lot of very good people, but it also has a pernicious element to it. My guess is, based on the news stories that we've seen and the investigation ongoing, that Tony Rudy, uh, uh, who is uh, now currently under investigation, who appears from news stories to have really operated as a mole for Mr. Abraham, Mr. Abramoff, uh, inside the majority leader's office, uh, part of it was an understanding that he would then go out and be able to make a bundle as a lobbyist. The temptations for these kinds of dealings for staff, for se senior staff, are just as serious as they are for members. If I had my druthers, I would sharply increase the pay of congressional staff. I think given the responsibilities that they have, the pay for many of them is way too low. Uh, and uh, at least I can get uh, some support around the, behind the table uh, for that. But, uh, you know, I've seen all kinds of people, uh, I've seen all kinds of people leave $50,000 jobs on Capitol Hill for $180,000 jobs uh, up on K Street. Uh, and that's true on uh, both sides of the aisle. It's not a very good process. Having a little bit more of a, a and it's happened, the, you know, the number of former members who are now up lobbying has increased dramatically in the last 10 years. The number of former staffers who move right into lobbying has increased <coughs> tremendously. The sense that this is a career for people has gone down at the same time tremendously. I don't know if we can get that back, uh, but a two-year cooling off period, maybe you uh, create a threshold for more senior staff would be a good thing. Would we lose a lot of people in the meantime? Yes. It would cause a bump in the road. I think you're going to find lots of uh, very bright young people out there who would be willing to come in. And maybe senior people in Congress who care about the institution should think about ways of creating a different climate around here so that people want to stay for longer periods of time and we can restore some of that sense of professionalism that we had when I came here. Yes, go ahead. Uh, after 32.
two years of teaching and seeing literally hundreds, thousands of students come through American University and come to the Hill. They come here for a variety of reasons, but much of it is good to, to be involved in making good public policy, loyalty, loyalty to a member, uh, to be a public servant, but they're not paid enough. In, and they would love to stay, but they have to leave because they begin to have families and children, and you cannot live on the, on the salaries that they have up here. At least uh, the Hill should consider having a compensation system similar to the GS system in the, in the executive branch, but it's hard for you to vote for increases in your own, you know, your, your own budgets for your own uh, um, offices. The loss of expertise on the Hill is a serious problem, I agree with Norm, and expanding this from one year to two year, it just isn't going to make that much difference compared to what's going on right now, and that is that the really good people have to leave because they can't live on the incomes that they have up here, in my opinion. I, I appreciate uh, your give and take on that. I, I just want to make two other observations. It was suggested, I think, just about by all of you in your opening remarks that we have a real opportunity to, uh, to act now on, on some meaningful reforms. And I would just make this observation, and that is, is that Congress and elected bodies tend to always react. Uh, we, you know, we're, if it's the people's government, we're always behind the people where they are. And I think that we will do that. I hope we can do it in a, in a bipartisan basis. I mean, case in point is your firm is reacting now to uh, one individual's bad conduct. Uh, and secondly, it was alluded to, I think, by only Dr. Ornstein that the size of a government may have an impact on public policy. And let me give you a case in point because uh, Dr. Thurber brought it up. He talked about the dams on the Lower Snake River and they, and they ought not to be breached. That becomes a national policy when it shouldn't. And because of that, a number of people that are affected by that potential policy all of a sudden got involved in government, which they probably wouldn't have because there's no reason for them to get involved in the policy of the government. But when something potentially, from their point of view, adversely affects them, uh, then they have that constitutional right. And one of the best ways to do that, of course, is to hire somebody to represent their views on the, on the. So I think there is a direct coalition or uh, uh, coordination. I can't think of the word right off the top of my head. Right? Correlation. Thank you. I knew it was. I knew it started with a CO. I just couldn't remember. Correlation between the size of government and the and the amount of lobbying activity that goes on, and for uh, good and bad reasons. But this was, you know, since this was brought up, it's in uh, not in my district, but in my area. I think that is a very good point to represent the point. So thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, let me thank everybody for your patience and for being here so long. And um, I'll try to be brief. Uh, first of all, um, uh, I, I agree with what everybody has said here on, on the need for transparency and um, increased transparency and increased accountability. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we can pass all the uh, new, uh, new rules and regulations we want, uh, but they're meaningless uh, unless we enforce them. Uh, and so, um, I mean, you know, on two levels, I mean, you need strong enforcement mechanisms, but you also need the political will existing in the institution to actually follow through and, and, and make them uh, and make them enforceable. Um, let me just say on the side on the travel issue, I, you know, I've, I've wrestled back and forth on, on whether we should ban all travel or try to make exceptions. But let me, let me give you one example in travel where, um, where I thought uh, it was beneficial to me uh, that wasn't uh, funded by the government, um, and that's some, some foreign travel. When you go on a, a, a publicly funded uh, trip sponsored by the government, uh, especially if you go to a hot spot, they control pretty much where you go. Uh, they dictate to you oftentimes places you can't go to. Um, and so if you, you know, especially in a country that, uh, you know, where, you're, where your position may be different from the government's position, you go down there and all of a sudden, you know, you're limited to who you can talk to and where you can go and places you can see. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it presents kind of a, an interesting dilemma. However, if there's, if there's no way to make exceptions for that, I, I think banning all travel, uh, it makes sense. But, uh, but I think it's wrong, and I think you all agree, that it's wrong to assume that all travel necessarily is bad. There is value in that. So I'm, I'm probably more with Pro Professor Thurber on that, uh, on that issue. Um, I would respectfully but strongly disagree with Mr. Miller that campaign finance reform and lobbying reform are, are separate issues. Uh, I think they're very much related. Uh, uh, after all, Jack Abramoff's primary weapon of, uh, of choice wasn't a free lunch. It was a fat pa uh, pack check. Um, and the bottom line is what I have in my 
10 years here, and I've been in the minority all 10 years, but in my 10 years here as a member of Congress, um, uh, the, the emphasis on money, um, and I'll say, you know, by both parties, uh, is ridiculous. Uh, in order to get reelected, you know, you need to raise a million or two million dollars, depending on where, on where you live. Um, the, the pressure by political parties, you know, if you don't have an opponent to go out there and raise more money, you know, for other people. I mean, the, the, the pressure constantly that uh, you need to raise money, uh, and that's part of your responsibility. I think that's, that's probably on, on both sides. Um, and I think, as a result, you end up creating a climate where you have people who, um, you know, who kind of stray off course. And we've seen some of those people who go out and try to, you know, you're, you're offering money, you know, I'll, I'll go out and I'll, I'll try to do business with you. I mean, I think that's a corrupting influence. The money has been a corrupting influence here. And I think anybody who says that it hasn't been uh, is living in another world. I think anybody who says that some of the major pieces of legislation that have been enacted into law have not been influenced by money, uh, you know, are not living in the real world. I mean, we were talking earlier about this bill that's coming to the, uh, to the floor early next week on uh, uh, reducing the, uh, the standards for uh, food labeling and, and, and health security. Um, the complaint that many of us had uh, was not that you were going to dis that th this legislation was going to be discussed. The fact that we, our complaint was that there were no hearings. And when Mr. Slaughter asked the question of the uh, of the uh, uh, chairman who was here, you know whether you're a scientist, it wasn't that you have to be a scientist to decide whether you could vote yes or no on the bill. The question was, you know, we have tons of letters from scientists and health commissioners and uh, heads of our Department of Agriculture from all over the country, from every state you can imagine, objecting to this, saying this is a very dangerous thing you're doing. So why are we rushing something like that to the floor without going through due process, without deliberating, without, I mean, it, it is inconceivable to me that we're doing that other than the fact that there's a, a very well-financed special interest, you know, that's, that's pushing this. Um, I'd also like to, uh, when I, when I, when I, I mean, I look, I, and I agree with, you know, I'll be honest with you, I agree with uh, Mr. Bacchus. I mean, I, 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 if I had my way, we'd have a public financing uh, of elections. I'd like to take the money right out of the system. I think it'd clean this place up, you know, uh, overnight. Doesn't end all the problems, but it's a, it, it, it'd take a lot of the, the, uh, the problems, uh, uh, you know, right off the table. The other thing is I, I want to commend uh, a number of you who have, who have, who have acknowledged and recognize that, that we have some serious institutional problems here in, in this Congress, uh, not just with lobbying. I mean, I think it's convenient right now to say this is all about lobbying. I mean, the, the title of this hearing is all about lobbying. But the fact of the matter is we have a huge problem with this legislative process. Now, I acknowledge I'm in the minority, so I mean, I, I guess I'm expected to, to grouse about the way the system is here. But I have to tell you, I, I, don't, um, I don't know how anybody can defend what's going on here. I mean, we've had, um, I've, and I've tried to get answers on the rationale why we should, why we should uh, bring a bill to the floor without having members having the opportunity to read it. I mean, what's the, what's the value in that? Can somebody rationalize why that has to happen? You know, or why we have to close off the, uh, the amendment process so strictly over and over. Why can't we deliberate on the floor? You know, when I was a staff member here, uh, the defense bill used to take a week, sometimes two weeks. Now we do it in a matter of a couple of hours, you know, and sometimes even shorter than that, depending on, you know, uh, how the process is, uh, is, is restricted. Uh, the fact of the matter is that um, we have ceased to be a deliberative body. And, um, and I guess, and again, I, I'm trying not to sound partisan here, but if you're, if you're, if you're the party in power, Maybe the incentive is uh, you can control things more if you don't have a deliberative pro process. You know, if you don't allow for amendments, then you can control the outcome. Um, if you don't allow people to read the bill, then they won't find out about some of the more controversial things until two weeks later. Um, you know, sometimes there's a tendency uh, when a particular party has too much power uh, to, to, have to, to see some arrogance appear, you know, that we can do whatever we want because we can. And I regret the fact that I think that's what's happening here. Um, and I don't say, and I know, I know a lot of my Republican friends uh, feel the same way. There are a lot of Republicans who have good amendments that come before this committee that routinely get denied. So it's not just a, about Democrats being shut out. Um, let me, uh, and I think that the way to, to correct this stuff, and this is, this is kind of the, uh, the, 
the challenge about what everybody has said here today is that you've come up with a lot of good ideas, and I think every one of them is, uh, is legitimate. Uh, but I think for us here as a committee and as a Congress, the first thing we need to do is admit we have a problem. Um, and uh, there's a tendency to try to uh, say, well, it's a few bad apples. You know, we really don't have a problem. You know, or no, how could you say that, uh, that you know, money or, in, or, you know, or special interests are influencing this process? That's, that's not happening. Uh, the fact of the matter is, um, I mean, anybody with their eyes open knows that we have a problem here. The question is whether we have the political will to actually do what we're going to need to do to clean this place up. Let me just ask one question, because this is, this is, you know, at the beginning of the uh, uh, hearing, I, I made a, a reference to the fact that all the issues that we're talking about all of a sudden didn't just come to light today. You know, some of these issues go back to previous Congresses, previous, you know, parties in control. Uh, but I mentioned the K Street project uh, and the fact that, you know, I, I did a search and we got articles that, you know, go back to December of 1996. And you know, uh, this is an article from the uh, Washington Times. It says, Republican leaders next month will issue a face-to-face -face warning to corporate leaders. <laughs> K Street lobbying firms will be told in no uncertain terms that if they want access to Republican legislative leaders, they had better send GOP lobbyists rather than Democrats left over from 40 years uh, of control on the Hill. Uh, there's another one from the, uh, uh, I think from the Washington Post. From, no, this is from the Hill. Uh, fa uh, fa uh, facing mounting... Uh, uh, pressure from Republican lawmakers uh, uh, the, uh, with, uh, with lingering Democratic dominance on K Street lobbying firms are anxiously courting top GOP members and their aides. One House GOP leadership aide put it bluntly, our message is this, don't hire Democratic lobbyists because we won't meet with them. If you want to lobby Republican offices, send Republican lobbyists. We are now in control. And it goes on. I have all, the, you know, all these different uh, articles. I guess what I'm, what I'm, concerned about, and I, is the fact that, you know, um, what we're trying to do up here, uh, whether the Republicans are in control or the Democrats are in control, is, you know, is, is deliberate to do the people's business and to have, um, you know, all people have access to members of Congress. And yet, you know, I'm not bashing lobbyists here. There are Democratic lobbyists and Republican lobbyists, but the bottom line is if the message that is coming out of here, if the culture on the Hill is that you only send me one kind of lobbyist. It gets to what Mr. Slaughter was pointing to before. You tend to get one side. Um, how, what, what, what do you think of the K Street project? I mean, what, what, do you, what, 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 what other lobbyists think of the K Street project? You know, how do you, how do you deal with this? I mean, I, I, because I, I, mean, I do think this is a corruption of the system. And, um, you know, and, and I, I'm curious to get your feedback on, on how we should respond to that, Professor Thurber. Um, over the last 20 years, I just calculated I've had over 1,200 presentations by lobbyists here in Washington, D.C., so I know them very well. And they talk, they've talked about the K Street project when it started years ago and as it evolved. Democrats and Republicans alike don't like it. Democrats especially didn't like it, Democratic uh, uh, people lobbying. But when, they, when you leave here, there's an epiphany that occurs to a certain extent if you watch uh, uh, Senator Mitchell and Senator Dole after they left, they were very good friends. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Representative Gingrich now is, you know, pushing for reform. The things that occur when you leave, and it's not as partisan as uh, one would think in these firms. They don't want it to be that partisan, but indeed the K Street project was effective uh, for a while. The Senate has acted on this, as you know, yesterday. Uh, but I think it's lobbying light uh, in terms of what they did. Democrats and Republicans alike have the right and they will recommend staff members and also members of Congress to firms when they leave. But to organize that and to have only one party uh, be the primary party that is considered with a clearance system uh, was quite unique, actually. It, uh, I had not seen that before it started really under Newt Gingrich and then it evolved. And so, uh, I think there's pushback on this right now. Uh, there's embarrassment about it, and I think that it's likely to affect the way the firms hire and the way the associations hire. Although there's some, some classic cases of Democrats that were up for the heads of associations, they didn't get that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they didn't get that because of pressure from the leadership here in the House of Representatives. I don't think that's going to happen under under this new leadership, in my opinion. 
Yeah. Can I, can I sure. answer one question? I want to go back to the lobbying reform mm -hmm. and campaign finance issue, keeping them separate. I, I truly believe if you mesh those two, you're not going to get anything at the end of the day that's going to be good for the American people. It's not going to be good for you, and it's not going to be good for us. I think you truly have to look at these as two very separate issues. You're free to deal with both of them. I just think if you're looking to get something that's going to be effective, I truly think you both you have to look at them separately and deal with them separately. That if you do them together, that I don't think you're going to be able to get a compromise on Republicans or Democrats to make something that's that's going to happen this year that's going to be effective. You know, uh, uh, comments on a couple of things that you uh, that you mentioned. First, I am distressed by the collapse of the deliberative process in a, in a whole lot of places. Um, this is going to be a Congress with the smallest number of days in session that we've had since 1947. Um, when I came here, we had a Tuesday to Thursday club. It tended to be really limited to the members from the Northeast and the region right around here. Uh, they would come back Monday night usually. We'd have sessions Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and they leave at the end of the day on Thursday. The Tuesday to Thursday club now is universal or close to it. It involves uh, coming back very late Tuesday because there aren't votes before 6.30 and leaving Thursday around noon or soon thereafter if you can possibly get out of here. Um, this is not a good way to run an institution. The number of hearings, uh, if you look at the number of hearings by Congress going back to the 60s, 70s, all the way forward, there's been a decline in the number per Congress, but now it's dropped very, very significantly. If you told me after this hearing, you can write a lobbying reform bill to your uh, full satisfaction, and that's what we're going to enact, I would be distressed, frankly, because whatever I would write or put together should be scrubbed and vetted and go through a very serious hearing process and get give and take and then go to the floor and have a significant process there. Too many bills don't have that happen now. And I don't care whether it is a lobbyist for a corporate interest or a lobbyist for the public interest or somebody else uh, or a member or a staff putting a bill together, the essence of deliberation is time, give and take, and uh, a back and forth that we just, we've lost a lot of it. Um, it's not brand new, but it's accelerated. On the K Street project, uh, Mr. Cole uh, mentioned early on Honest Graft, the book by Brooks Jackson. Uh, we would be naive and wrong to suggest that under 40 years of democratic rule, we had an open process on K Street. The, the K Street, the lobbying uh, element, the public relations element, the law firm element was dominated by Democrats. It didn't happen uh, through some organized process. It happened over a period of time. And it also happened that uh, as we moved into the 80s and 90s, you had Democrats in positions of power saying, I want more from the uh, business community. We got the reins of power here and we want them to contribute. Uh, the K Street project, as it started out, I think was a perfectly reasonable uh, idea. We're in power. We ought to have some of our people in some of these positions as well that morphed quickly into something that we had not seen before and that has been, I think, absolutely distressing because it's been an attempt by uh, at least some to create a self-reinforcing loop where we don't just ask or try and get some of our people into positions. We want specific people in specific positions, and they will then respond by giving campaign contributions back to the party, to individuals, so that we can be sure we can stay in power to keep this moving. And it also involved, very distressingly, the use of the power of the state to coerce positions. That included the Electronics Industries Association, where we had two treaties of the United States held up uh, that were favored by the uh, uh, association uh, uh, out of displeasure because they picked uh, Dave McCurdy uh, uh, over somebody else. And it gets to uh, allegations uh, surrounding the uh, investment uh, company institute and its lobbyists, an attempt to fire a lobbyist and replace her with somebody else with the, uh, at least some in the industry saying that they were told that hearings followed by legislation involving the industry would go very badly if these actions weren't taken. That's over and above anything I've seen in my time here. It crosses lines and the uh, legislative actions taken by the Senate Rules Committee yesterday and apparently I'm now told by the uh, Governmental Affairs Committee in the House today are uh, poor excuses for uh, dealing with some of these excesses. 
Well, I, th I thank you again uh, for your, your testimony. And again, I, I'll just conclude by saying that I think uh, so much of uh, all the important things that you've been saying and so much of the things that we've been saying up here really depends on whether we have the political will to move forward. And I hope we do, because uh, um, I'll, I'll tell you that um, I don't think there's a single member here who, um, when they go back to their district, uh, don't get the same refrain from their constituents, like, what the hell are you doing? I mean, what's wrong with this system? Um, and they're losing confidence in the system. And, and they also think that their concerns don't matter. Uh, and I think, you know, that's not uh, what this government's all about. And, uh, and we, need to, we need to fix some things. So I, I, hope, we, I hope this is the beginning of, of a process that will do that. Thank you. Wait a minute. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of like getting the keys to the car for the first time. You're not exactly <laughs> sure where they go in. Matter of fact, when I uh, when I came up here, you said congratulations, Mr. Chairman. I said, well, it could be worse. It could have been the ethics committee. So this is uh, not a bad thing. Uh, I want to start, if I may, and then we'll call my colleagues with because I want to follow up on a number of points. But I, I want to take the advantage that we've all taken and offer some observations. First, I want to begin by thanking all of you. You've been here for an enormously long time, and you've been incredibly generous with your times and your thoughts and your observations. And uh, frankly, I wish I could take you all to dinner and continue, Dutch treat, of course, and just for the record, uh, and continue this. Uh, I've spent a lot of time around, well, I'd be, I'd be delighted to do that, actually, Norm, sometime. I've spent a lot of time uh, in this business. I've been a state senator. I've been a secretary of state. I've been a congressman. I, was the ED of the, the uh, NRCC. I was chief of staff of the RNC. I've got a political consulting firm I used to run. So I think I've seen it as a practitioner. I haven't been a lobbyist, but I've certainly worked with enough of them, and my old firm uh, had lobbyists in it. So I think I, I know most ends of this business pretty well. Uh, and I would also begin by, by pointing out this is not very easy, because if you just listen to you guys, you don't agree on private travel whether we should have it or not. You don't agree on staff limitations. So the idea that we will, you know, this is, there's relatively five or six easy things to do here, uh, you know, uh, and actually get at the problem, I think, uh, uh, would be a mistake. As a matter of fact, I'm reminded of the old Lyndon Johnson uh, observation, doing the right thing isn't hard, knowing the right thing to do is. In the course of your testimony, I took, I counted them before I came up here, well over 20 pages of notes. And when I take notes, I usually have little observations which none of you will ever see. You know, and some of them are brilliant point, excellent idea, why didn't I think of that? And some of them are, what was he thinking? Has he ever done this before? He's crazy. That will never work. Uh, and then there's even some tougher ones than that. Uh, but. Uh, because you can have this kind of, of disagreement on, on, these, uh, on these issues in terms of how you arrive at a, at a process uh, that works. It seems to me there's four big areas. I'm going to have a series of questions that I would uh, invite any of you, and I may address to some of you in particular, to talk about. But before I do, a, a couple of other observations. One, I, I was going to make this point, and actually, Norm, you beat me to it, and then uh, 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 Representative Hastings picked up on it. But, uh, I couldn't agree more with size, One of the, that it matters. The size of the government has a lot to do with the complexities and the problems that we're facing. Uh, Dr. Thurber used the example $4 million worth of lobbying firepower for members. Well, if you, if you quantified it that way, every member spends $5.8 billion, you know, if you look at the federal budget. So uh, this idea that this is an enormously expensive process all out of proportion to the size of the federal budget just isn't true, whether it's in a political campaigns or anything else. The other thing I think of when I think of size and complexity is uh, one of the favorite sayings from one of my state's uh, patron saints, uh, Will Rogers, who had certainly no uh, great uh, love, but uh, ha had a lot of fun poking fun at this place. But he used to say that uh, uh, we're all ignorant only about different things. And when you're in the Congress or a legislative body, you find out how many things you're ignorant about in a hurry. Because I will promise you, nobody up here at this table uh, knows as much as they would like about most issues that they're called upon to vote on. Nor do they have sufficient staff or sufficient time to do that. And that is an important lobbying function, information function, informative function. And the idea that only my constituents will know about it, uh, you know, I always think I represent 700,000 people. 
I know there's somebody amongst that group that knows more than I do about whatever the subject that I'm discussing is. I really do spend a lot of time trying to find out who those people are and sit down and talk to them. I think actually most members do. But, um, you know, in the breach and in a hurry, sometimes I can't reach that person, and there will be people there to make a case and an observation. So that the function is a necessary one. Um, when we talk about reform, and I think, you know, that's always a wonderful term. We're always all for it, and I will guarantee you there are unintended consequences. Having lived through several iterations of campaign finance reform as a political consultant and watch what people told me was going to happen and then watch what happened, it's been different every time. I've never seen an author of a reform piece of legislation that accurately predicted uh, the outcome of it. And sometimes the consequences were better than anticipated, but frankly, usually they were worse or they spun something out of control. I, I'll just, uh, uh, you know, give you my favorite example, 527s. You know, we hear a lot about bipartisanship. I will promise you we will have people that voted for campaign finance reform that will not vote to eliminate 527s. Uh, and they just simply won't because, ah, I didn't think of that, but it's working to the advantage of my size, I, side. I don't say that judgmentally. Uh, by the way, it happens on, on both sides, but that's just simply true. And um, so bipartisanship's good, but it will be enormously tough in this area. Some of you I know believe in public finance. I mean, I could not be more opposed to that, uh, that idea. It makes uh, members, frankly, unresponsive and irresponsible. And part of the idea of being a good member, frankly, is, is earning and soliciting support of all kinds, whether it's somebody that knocks on a door or whether it's an endorsement. Most people are not lobbied about things they've already committed themselves on in any meaningful way. Most campaign uh, decisions and contributions when they're made are usually made because you already know what the person believes in. They've got a record, they've voted, they've made statements. So you're trying to help somebody that has an opinion similar to yours almost every time. Uh, the, the amount of time that you're trying to persuade is relatively, uh, relatively few. The danger areas, I will tell you, is always in these areas, and if you think about Jack Abramoff, who we talked about, he made his money on what I'd call the fringes of politics. This is not a guy, most of the issues he was concerned about were not the issues that, frankly, my, my constituents would consider of great uh, significance. You know, it's not the Medicare bill, it's not the defense budget, it's not the war in Iraq, it's not the future of Social Security. It was around the edges where, frankly, a lot of members don't know very much, a lot of staffs don't know very much. I'm the only Native American in Congress, believe me, I know a lot more about tribal issues than most of the people in here do. And I talk to more Indians in a week than most of the people in Congress do in a year. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm very proud to say my tribe never employed Jack Abramoff, never would have. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of complexities here. Uh, when I look at this, I see four major areas, and if in a perfect world, I would love to see four different pieces of legislation. The first one is campaign finance reform. Uh, and again, I would have very different ideas about it than a lot of people up here or even out there, but they really are, are rooted out of having fought campaigns all over the country in a variety of different levels. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's certainly, a, and 527 is actually one where people that I might disagree on one thing would probably agree with me on that. The second area is legislative process reform, which you all talked about a great deal, and I, I find a great deal of merit in, uh, in what was said about looking at the process. We reformed a lot of the process in the middle 90s in a burst of this stuff, and a lot of that stuff is good. No proxy voting is good. Open committee meetings is good. Open markups are good. Those were all reformed, applying the laws to Congress that it passes. Those are good things. You know, what we now find, okay, it's time for the next great wave. And uh, some of those reforms need to be attitudinal, but some of them, you know, clearly to earmarking. And I would, uh, you know, I'm not one of these people that uh, will tell you earmarks are bad. I always say phased array radar at the University of Oklahoma for the Weather Center is a good thing. Uh, and a bypass that saves lives is a good thing. And housing for soldiers at Fort Sill, Oklahoma is a good thing. And I can defend the ones that I've been for and would be happy to make them public and would be love, love to eliminate uh, last minute, uh, 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 you know, insertions and in conference committee reports. Uh, but that's the, the, the second area. The third area is lobbying reform, which I want to focus on in a minute, which is very different than process and finance, but is obviously interrelated. Uh, and, the fine, and the final one is ethics. Uh, and what you would, in an ideal world, want to do is pass each one of them separately. And some of you have actually taken that point, said, you know, it's a danger to combine them. Um, 
I actually agree with that. I will also tell you sometimes that's the only way you can get things done around here, and you all know that as well. I mean, the idea to say I want to dictate this outcome, and by the way, I want it done in a perfect process, strikes me as a very naive uh, you know, situation. It's, it's one of these things that that's great in the best of all possible worlds, but if, if I can only deal with 527s by linking them to something else, then I'm going to at least consider that possibility, and I think any legislator would. Doesn't mean it's the ideal solution, but it's, it's one worth thinking about. Uh, so you've gotten all my lectures, and, I, and again, I would uh, be happy because I, I love the history of this stuff, but let me focus on two or three things and ask some questions. Let me start with lobbying reform. I raised the question when I was talking uh, with our uh, uh, clerk, uh, Madam Clerk uh, Karen Haas, uh, about the idea of auditing uh, a uh, uh, lobbyist reports. I mean, it's one of the things that discourages me the most. I actually think you can fill out a lot of paper. That's a lot different from somebody looking at it. The FEC has an auditing function. I don't think they do it well. Frankly, I think I will tell you they got a lot of people down there, again, that don't know much about campaigns and are an incredible. Uh, uh, incredible pain to deal with in terms of paperwork. On the other hand, I would tell you I think the process is cleaner than it was before 1974, so I'm not for getting rid of the Federal Elections Commission. Having said that, how would you audit and who would audit lobbying reports? Yeah. Uh, if I might expand the scope of this quickly and then get back to your answer, I, I would first start by just simply enforcing uh, the, uh, the law right now, I mean, there was one estimate in the Senate hearing that I appeared in three weeks ago that there were 2,200 reports from the Senate that, that, that have never been acted on by the Department of Justice. Today we heard 534. So you can audit, but there has to be a consequence for the audit. Is audit. that a DOJ decision? Who makes that decision? DOJ makes a decision as to whether to pursue it, from what I understand. Um, Why would you think they would be slow to act on that? Um, uh, do you think, and I'm just, I'm literally, this is a legitimate question, uh, do you think it's because of a staffing or resource issue? Do you think it's because it's, gee, these are politically sensitive and uh, I don't know that I want to go there? Or a lot of the, or, you know, I think these are minor technical violations that ought to be looked at as opposed to a Duke Cunningham type violation. I, mean, I don't know authoritatively, but I think they probably think that they're minor but they also have resource problems over there, uh, significant resource problems. Plus, they haven't really investigated those who haven't registered, which is a whole nother, another area. Uh, auditing who? I mean, if you don't register, there's nothing to audit. And so first, you've got to get people to, to register and have complete information. Uh, how would you do it? I think you'd have to do it with much, uh, many more resources, and therefore, I, I, I like the idea of the Office of of public integrity with resources that could pursue this. Any others care to respond? I would just say that an audit of these kinds of reports right now is not going to get you very much. All you do is do one good faith estimate of the total amount you spent for six months. And you list the issues you work on and whether you lobby the House or Senate. So you don't have the kind of information that is going to Let's assume for a minute we got, because I agree with you, I think these things need to be much more revealing and much more inclusive than they are. Although, again, it's always easier for people that are dreaming up paperwork for other people to do uh, to, uh, to come up with just a laundry list and, and uh, you know, cost you a lot of time and money. But let's just caveat or grant you're right, that we need a much more extensive process and debate well, then, what that then would then you be. can use random audits, which are often used as a way they do, they do an effective job of increasing voluntary compliance. If you lo where would you lodge that function at? Would it be a DOJ function? Would it be we, a, we a would, I think lodge it in the Office of Public Integrity, okay. uh, an, a centralized office in, in Congress. Might I add uh, a bit more? I, I've talked to a lot of lobbyists before developing this testimony uh, for the Senate and for here, and the, the large firms see no problem even with monthly uh, reports. I have monthly reports advocated in mind. Uh, they're doing it now. Uh, they do think that it would be a problem for the small firms, individual, one individual uh, that doesn't, that has a part-time intern from American University that's trying to fill these things out. So when you go forward, you have to think about the consequences for, for small firms as well as large firms and associations. Most of them have uh, functions within their organizations that follow this very clear, carefully. Law firms 
follow every 10 minutes in terms of what somebody's doing, and they have a software system to do that. And I would like to advocate or have people think about developing a software system that then could be given to people uh, in the firm so they could use it not only for registering what they're doing, but also give it to the staff people to keep track of what's going on. I know it's difficult, but you can Usually the, the, the for-profits firms you know, frankly, have a resource advantage as to any kind of ideological firm, special cause group that may have lobbyists. Much tougher for those people to have the resources. These people are keeping those kind of records because they're billing and expenses records, not because they're compliance records right now. So you're going to put an enormous spent expense on people that are, quote, lobbyists, and particularly if we use a broad definition. That are but I think it's there. a small price for democracy and advocacy, in my opinion. And, and uh, the AARP, the NRA, they all, uh, they all, I know, because I, I know these people, and I take my students there, we do research about it, they all have systems to keep track of all of this now. No. Uh, Mr. Gold, I have to leave to catch a plane in a minute, uh, uh, so l let me give you a response to that. Let me first say, uh, most of us have testified in uh, at Congress many, many times. The usual pattern is there are a couple of members of a committee there at the beginning. If you break for a vote, one comes back. Um, you had nine people here through most of the afternoon uh, and uh, for a very long hearing. And it says something, I must say, about the diligence of the Rules Committee. Uh, so we're impressed with that. Maybe uh, fear. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, uh, first, I think the uh, Department of Justice may have a resource problem, but it's also very clear that nobody cares. Congress has not sent a signal that this is anything they care about. The public hasn't said you should be prosecuting these things. Why would they possibly prosecute when there is no demand and no sense that this has been seen as a violation of law that is uh, taken seriously on Capitol Hill? Uh, that might change uh, if you make some changes. Uh, if you do make some changes, though, the only way you're going to get any likelihood that more people fill out forms and that there's any possibility of catching them up if they uh, distort them and go beyond uh, uh, unwillful violations is to have some serious penalties. You may want, not want to do that the first time. Somebody may not know. You might have uh, a sliding scale. But believe me, if you had uh, a $100,000 fine uh, for somebody who didn't file uh, disclosure forms, uh, you'd suddenly get a whole lot more people uh, filing disclosure forms. If you had the possibility of a uh, serious misdemeanor conviction if you uh, made uh, willful misstatements in these forms, you'd have a very different level of compliance. To do this, it seems to me, one, it, it can't be done by an, uh, an ethics committee. It can't be done effectively by a clerk's office over a period of time. It ought to be done by a beefed up organization like a, an office of public integrity. Things have to be done in an electronic fashion. You've got to have far more disclosure than we have. It will be a burden on nonprofits. Filing uh, tax returns are burdens, but that's the sort of thing that, uh, that we do. It all ought to be available on the Internet, because one way in which you will catch people beyond audits or random audits, a way in which you're going to catch people in this process is if somebody looks and sees a disclosure form filed by a lobbying organization that they know has been up here regularly spending a lot of money, saying, wait a minute, that's not there, and by somebody looking at the forms and finding that somebody that they've seen lobbying regularly didn't file and notifying the organization. That's going to happen far more from the outside. So this has got to be electronically <laughs> filed and available on the Internet with a significant set of penalties. And, and please leave whenever you need to. I yeah, understand you. Yeah. One quick comment about uh, uh, penalties. One penalty could easily be established right now, and that is a list of, of individuals and organizations that are in noncompliance and leave it up on the website. No money associated with it, but it would be embarrassing and it would not be good for business for them. I think it's excellent. Uh, second, I'm sorry. No. Oh, second, second related question. Um, right now we have a situation where, frankly, members are quite often subject to criminal violations for gift violations or meal violations. Lobbyists aren't which most of the public doesn't know. And yet the, the people that are actually most in control of the records and sort of keeping track of this and have a vested financial interest in it are the lobbyists. Uh, I'd be very interested if you would be uh, 
if you have a, a viewpoint, particularly you, Mr. Miller, obviously professionally, but the rest of you as well, in terms of making lobbyists subjected to the same penalties for the same kind of offense that a member would be. Yeah, I, I don't think most of us would oppose that. If, if, if it's going to open up the system so everybody sees what's happening and those types of things, I don't think we're opposed to it. All we're asking for is that it be fair and balanced. That's all we're asking for. And that, that not so many burdens be placed on us and, and, and so much blame be placed on us because this wasn't just, this is not all lobbyists. This is, this is a small few. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that the, whatever the restrictions are should apply to both lobbyists and members. Now, mem the gift and travel rules only are ethics rules, so they're not subject to criminal penalties. But it's, a, it's an aberration where the members uh, could uh, violate a rule by winding up getting some kind of benefit when the person giving the benefit uh, has no responsibility. So I, I agree with that. I think lobbyists should be subject to the same penalties. And in a way, they are now in the sense that you want to go home after work and not go out to dinner. They want to go home and not go out to dinner. And you have the same penalty now. You all have to go out to dinner sometimes after work. <laughs> and it's the last thing you want to do after working very hard. You know, and, and actually, this, this takes us to an, I don't know if it would be an exception, but I want your thoughts on this. Because I will tell you, it may work that way with the most senior members. People I normally go out to dinner with are from my local chamber of commerce in my district that are up here for their one big trip to Washington, yeah. and they want to go, and I really maybe don't. Uh, or the people that uh, maybe a couple guys that work in an insurance, they're insurance salesmen, they come up for the national meeting, they're told by their, their association heads, gee, we want every one of you to go out and take your local congressman to dinner. They are my constituents, and they usually have a nice list that they didn't know a whole lot about. Somebody's written down asking these five questions, uh, and we do that. Uh, or on the gift limitations, I promise you, I already have a lifetime supply of baseball caps. Uh, I have more plaques than I have walls to put them up on. Uh, but they are quite technically, quote, gifts. And you are in an awkward position on something like that. It's clearly a trivial, a sort of a trinket type thing. I mean, how do you draw the rules for that? Or do you just say, hey, here's your ball cap back? Well, there are already a series of exemptions in the gift rules. I don't agree with Mr. Miller that they all should be eliminated. Uh, I think they should be reviewed. But I don't think people are all that concerned about caps and trinkets. And even in terms of the, the meals restrictions, when they were passed 10 years ago, we certainly supported them. A $50 limit, $100 overall limit in a year seemed reasonable to us. I think the problem that has arisen comes from the fact that they're not disclosed, there's no way to enforce them, there's no oversight of them, and all of a sudden you have some folks who start going out and violating them in a very public way, and then everyone pays the price. I mean, Mr. Abramoff had his own restaurant, was very happy to give a whole lot of people free meals, and he wasn't violating any rules based on what you just noted, uh, but some of the members probably were. And uh, that becomes a story and an issue, and then you're faced with this question on meals and gifts. Can I answer the question about the gifts? I mean, the 14 exemptions. Right now, if, if it's up to me or to you to decide whether or not I'm a friend, if I say that I'm a friend because I send you a birthday card or a, a Christmas card, I can give you any gift I want. It's, it's, it's my decision to, or your decision to, to classify me as a friend or not. So if you're going to get rid of all gifts, you've got to look at the all 14 exemptions and either get rid of them or not get rid of any gifts because I don't think it's fair to keep those because it's subjective. It's up to me to say whether or not I'm a friend of yours or not. Excuse me. I, I think that's an argument not to get rid of gifts. That's a, not an argument to get rid of all of the exemptions. I'm, I mean, I'm, let me finish, please. Uh, if you're going to get a, we a, a wedding present uh, from your cousin or your brother, I don't think we want to cover that under any kind of gift rule. There are legitimate exemptions that ought to exist for any set of gift rules. And they're not always necessarily easy to figure out. But caps, a wedding present uh, from your uh, sister-in-law, et cetera, are not the th kinds of things anyone's talking about. I think this argument is an argument that says either adopt a rule that simply will not work 
or don't adopt the rule, and it's an argument for not adopting. I, I, I want to thank you both for making the point that the experts don't always agree. I just disagree. But, I think you, if you want to eliminate the rules, eliminate them all, including the 14 exemptions. Yep. That was my point. I go to Dr. I, I want to point out something to you right now. Mr. Moakley up there is smiling because this, these arguments came up in 1994 almost exactly in terms of questions and answers. I don't think that uh, these trinkets are a problem. Uh, and I, you know, I think you should review what's going on and just le and leave it. I don't think I don't think that's the problem. It's the hundred thousand dollar parties uh, at conventions. What about it's, the meal from your constituents, your chamber of commerce that's up here? Well, I think that they probably come. Uh, I'm from rural Oregon, and it's very hard to find a meal that costs forty nine bucks. You no, know? when they come to Washington, I mean, literally, you will be amazed the number of communities that now send local delegations to Washington D.C. It, and the size of them is it's not necessarily large. And then a lot of times they're not even up here to ask for anything. It just becomes sort of the Chamber of Commerce annual outing. I think it's reasonable for them to, to buy a meal, and I think the limit is, is okay, if that's what you're asking, sir. Yeah. Let me ask. I'm going to just move quickly because I've, I've really indulged this chairmanship. I'm sure it will never come back. Uh, but uh, just two other areas. One, I, I wanted a quick opinion for those of you that didn't or did address it on 527s, whether, I mean, I, I will tell you just uh, as a commentary, I'm always disturbed when five or six people can give $80 million to the process and affect the outcome of elections. Uh, and anybody that, you know, you, you're never going to get politicians to disarm or, de uh, you know, when, when there, there are more people outside campaigns that are involved in campaigns than I've ever seen in a 25-year career of running campaigns. And they are massive in terms of the firepower that they can lay down. And members are on both sides of the aisle. Are, are, you know, they, you, then you're in an arms race against an opponent you don't even know you have until it's too late in the campaign to deal with. So that, that's one of the arguments for always being, you know, you never know where, what it's going to come from in an election. So the idea that you can have a limited war chest uh, and not run a risk, even in a safe district. And I could give you example after example of people in the last election cycle in safe districts that had millions of dollars dumped on them by 527, and the supposedly <laughs> invulnerable candidate became vulnerable immediately. I mean, it's a real problem. So, as you know, I've written five books on campaign uh, campaigning. I had a three and a half million dollar grant to study campaigning over a seven year period, and we have addressed these issues. Uh, I think the problem. Uh, there are a couple problems. One problem is the FEC. It's it's a broken organization. It didn't do its job, in my opinion, uh, with the 527s. And I know that, that, that some Democrats disagree with me on this, but it, uh, I think the 527s are, are a problem. It's a way for there's a dam, and then the dam is breached. And the, the money went around the dam because of, the, because of uh, uh, the FEC. They also are very weak in terms of investigating things that are a problem. But beyond this, it's. I think it's not the money that's the problem. It's, it's redistricting, and which is a whole other topic. There are only 28 seats that are competitive. You mentioned the money flows into these competitive districts where people win by 55 percent or less. You and I would disagree on that, uh, you know, because yeah, frankly, well, I'm sorry. Look, I've, I've run too national redistricting. Let me respectfully say that people don't want to go to a football game when they think somebody's going to win by, by 30 points. They want competition. And in fact, Republicans like competition in the marketplace. We need more competition. That's the problem. Well, I'd be happy to, to debate redistricting with you at any point, because there are a lot of problems. But, and the real question is whether or not it's a state or a national issue. And I will, I will promise you, gerrymandering is not a new science. And even the people that tell you that technologically it's somehow more advanced than it is, it's cheaper. It's not any any more advanced than it used to be. It's easier to get done. More people can do it. But I know I redistricted the state of Washington. There you go. Well, we all have sins to confess. Uh, I, 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 I will disagree with my colleague on whether there are 28 seats that are competitive this year. I would predict there are going to be a lot more. But going, uh, going to your point on 527s, uh, uh, as you well know, you and I would disagree on many campaign finance issues, but on 527s, we agree, except I guess I would disagree with you in the notion that this was an unintended consequence. This is just a failure of the Com Federal Election Commission to properly enforce the law. These groups are required to comply with federal campaign finance laws where they're spending millions of dollars to influence federal elections. 
Uh, and if we win the lawsuit that is pending right now, uh, that would be made clear. Uh, but the FEC chose not to do this. We're kind of in a circumstance right now where Democrats seem to see 527s as an advantage. Republicans seem to see it as a disadvantage. I think both sides are going to be wrong here in the end, but that's irrelevant. Uh, the bottom line is people are spending money to influence federal elections should be planned by the same set of rules, uh, and it's essential to get this straightened out. The sooner the better. I would abolish 527s. Uh, last question, and then I'll turn it over. It's, uh, it's a process issue, but it's, it's the sort of uh, issue du jour, uh, which is earmarks. And, uh, and what role they play and how do you do them. Uh, most members will tell you when they go home, people expect you to be able to, you know, look at needed projects or whatever in your district and try to be successful. Or you may have an interest uh, in, in a, a technology or something that is important and it's not being responsive. And it's a really tough call here. I, I, let me use the highway bill as an example. In my state, if all the money moves to the state, uh, number one, we have a formula, so we're going to we're a donor state, so we'll lose. And number two, uh, the people that will make the decision, who are honorable and able people, are all appointed by the governor in a highway commission. New governor appoints them all. So the idea that it's not going to be political, depending on who the governor is, is fanciful. We just move it down to another level with people that may be less interested or less knowledgeable about my district than than I am. So th those things become really tough issues. I'm all for the openness, that is, that you need to, if you request one, it needs to be obvious, that it needs to be looked at by the Congress. I think it makes a, you make very good point about not putting them in conference committees, that, that we have a chance to take these out on the floor and, and debate them. Uh, I would love it because, frankly, uh, uh, people would find out how bipartisan earmarks are. It's about 55, 45 most of the time and that. Uh, so that would be a good thing. On the other hand, do you think we should just eliminate it? Because I am, am, am mindful of the, op, uh, the point that a couple of you have made, that obviously uh, the pursuit of earmarks is, you know, motivates part of the lobbying business, too. Um, you have the power of the purse. You have the right to earmark. You have the right to make decisions about the budget. Why should the executive branch earmark? What is an earmark? Uh, is an earmark a uh, some money for the University of Oklahoma for the Department of Agriculture that goes through the regular process. The issue is whether they're transparent, whether there's an individual associated with them, whether there's justification, and whether you can vote on them if they're controversial. The controversial ones are the ones that are done uh, late at night uh, a after a conference committee has voted on something that's happened but also late at night in the conference committee when they've not been considered against the rules of the House and the Senate, in the, in, in the House and the Senate, before they're put into the bill. That's the problem, in my opinion. And it's not only, I'll say again, appropriations, it's tax code, and it's authorizations. There's more money spent in the last two categories, uh, I would argue, than on the money side of things. The, the, the less opportunity members have to vote around here, the more problem, the problematic earmarks become. I mean, earmarks are the way of Congress. They're, there's, you know, they've been there forever in different names and different forms. But you now have a process which uh, uh, is undemocratic, secret, uh, evades the legislative process. I mean, the worst are the things that wind up in conference when they weren't in the House or Senate. Mm -hmm. I think most of the reform proposals I've seen focus on making this process uh, both transparent and accountable and giving people ways to, to vote on these issues or to force the issue. And once you get back to that stage, you'll have uh, a different kind of public context of earmarks. Uh, and I, I haven't seen very many people talking about banning earmarks because I frankly don't know how you do it. I've written a, a history of the Appropriations Committee when it was 125 years old. And they, let me tell you, uh, there have been earmarks from the very beginning. Uh, they're the glue that keeps the, the the committee together and members together when they get to the floor. It's just a matter of whether they're transparent and open and whether you can justify them or not. Mr. Miller? 
I don't necessarily agree that this is an issue that needs to be legislated. I think the House can, the leadership on both sides can, can change the rules here and, and deal with the earmark problem. If you want to make it a more open process, the leadership's more than welcome and, and able to do that. So I don't necessarily agree that this needs to be an issue you need to legislate. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Let me, if I may, turn to the gentlelady from uh, West Virginia. Well, since that would be unethical of me to jump right back into my seat after being gone for an hour and a half into questioning, I'm going to pass to the next person. Thank you. I know the gentleman from Utah would be not nearly so ethical, so. Uh. <laughs> Which means? Gentleman from Georgia. Well, let me. Then I'll come, then I'll come back and be next. Uh, I, have, I have been sitting here for the duration, and uh, I, I really thank my colleagues for, for uh, passing to me, and I will, in deference to them, certainly be brief. I will say to my friend, Chairman uh, Cole, I think he asked me for two favors this week, and, and I have to tell him the answer now is no. <laughs> um, <laughs> in, uh, in, all, uh, in all seriousness, I, I was sitting over here doing a scientific experiment, and now I know uh, the retention span, attention span of a 63-year-old is a little shorter than I thought it was. Uh, that sitting in this seat, of course, you, you end up either all of your questions are asked by your colleagues or the ones that you had, had thought to ask you've long since forgotten. But, but I thank uh, uh, my colleagues for letting me go uh, ahead of them. That's uh, swore at me when I came in. <laughs> and then Shelley came in. Uh, but I want to really thank, uh, I, I really seriously want to thank the, uh, the, the, the panelists that have been here and spent the three or four hours that you have. And of course, uh, Dr. Ormstein had to leave to uh, catch a plane. But uh, I think you also, uh, he made a comment uh, about the committee, the, the 13 of us, uh, and the fact that we're here uh, too. And I think if some members had not been on the trip to the Gulf Coast to see the devastation there in a bipartisan fashion, uh, we probably all would still be here. Uh, clearly, uh, this, is a, this is a bipartisan uh, effort uh, to, to do exactly what the hearing calls for, lobbying reform. Now, I know we've talked about uh, legislative process reform and railed about that. I know we've talked about 527s and campaign finance reform and railed about that. And these clearly are problems that uh, we do need to address. Uh, but I, I think that uh, w the main focus of this hearing, lobbying reform, uh, has been uh, the most informative to me and the most meaningful and beneficial. And I, I know. Uh, uh, my good friend Tom Cole said that uh, sometimes uh, we get unintended consequences of some of the things that we do, and, uh, and I know he would agree with me on, on this statement, but I think that maybe now is the time to act boldly on this issue and take a chance on unintended consequences. Because I haven't heard uh, much from either side of the aisle that I disagree with or from the panelists. Uh, I, maybe a few things in regard to uh, lobbyists writing bills. I mean, I think that uh, clearly when I was in the Georgia General Assembly, Mothers Against Drunk Driving would bring me a bill that they had written, or the Georgia Right to Life would bring me a bill that they had written. And, and obviously, we have legislative council. We have legislative shops in our office. These bills go through the committee, subcommittee and committee process. They get amended. So I really don't have uh, a problem with that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we talk a little bit about the, the, the meal and gift ban and things like that. Uh, and when, when early on in the, in the hearing, I think it was Mr. Uh, Wertheimer, uh, talked about, about some of the things that, that are being paid for by lobbyists that uh, I guess I should know about. But I'm still a relatively new member as a second termer. Uh, but this, this business about uh, the fact that uh, uh, members, leadership, PACs, or anybody. I've got a PAC. I, I call it Doc PAC, uh, some pun intended. Uh, but I had absolutely no idea, absolutely no idea that that money could, could, could be converted to personal use. I, I assumed it was just like my, my regular Gingrey for, for Congress campaign account, that this is not my money. 
Uh, this is raised for good reasons and good purposes, but absolutely not for my personal benefit. Um, so, I, again, I think that uh, we've got some serious issues here. I do not believe that Abramhoff is a uh, uh, is the only problem. I mean, I think uh, maybe maybe Ms. Slaughter mentioned this. Uh, he is a symptom of the disease, and I and I truly believe that. Uh, uh, he was caught, but there are others out there, and, and, and uh, if we don't do something about this in a draconian fashion, uh, these names that we already know about are going to multiply, and they're going to multiply on both sides of the aisle. Uh, so this has been probably the best hearing that I have attended, uh, Madam Speaker, <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, since I've had an opportunity to, to uh, serve in this great body, and I think that we will, in the final analysis, I truly believe that we'll come together in a bipartisan way. Uh, we'll adopt some of the things that are, are in the, the Democratic proposals. We'll go through regular order as the Speaker has committed to do. Uh, and we are going to do this thing right because, as has been said uh, by several members, uh, uh, the American people demand it. Uh, and this great body uh, is something that, that we all honor and respect, and, and we're going we're gonna to do it. I, and I thank all of you, and I thank my colleagues for the time that we've put in today. I'd like to request that you send a letter to my provost and dean and explain that this was the best hearing, and this is why I missed a meeting this afternoon. <laughs> Speaker Reed went over the Senate one day and came back to the House, and the first thing he said is, thank God we're not a deliberative body. So just as we go that far, which one of you would ask, would give me some answers about the UK system, the United, the United Kingdom ethics system? And I know it wasn't brought up by any of you, but are any of you familiar with it? Okay, so I screwed up that opportunity. Can you tell me? Can you tell me why it was established and when it was established, and what, what for what was it a reaction? No. Okay. But I want to say something, and that is that they have public finance of their campaigns, and they do not have the same world of lobbyists uh, <clears throat> as we do here. Yes, they have people advocating, but it's nothing like this, and it's because they have a strong party system that would discipline that uh, the deliberation goes through those that party system. Yes, they have an office of ethics. I. If you want me to, if you'll send me a note, I'll try to get some information on that for you. It, it would be nice to find out exactly what was the cause that precipitated it and also the check and balance system that they have if we want to look at that. I want to thank Mr. Miller for being what I consider to be a devil's advocate, and you do a good job with that. I would suggest maybe on the legislative ID or the uh, lobbyist ID you provide maybe a scarlet L that they can wear around would be helpful at some times. I think one of the others of you one time said that, you know, I don't golf, I don't ski, which is another potential solution, just make sure our lobbyists are all dull people and you can solve that problem. I do have two things, though, that are legitimate. First of all is the definition of a lobbyist. Ms. Dr. Thurber, you're here, you're advocating a position, this is part of your job, you have some kind of inherent value by being here that's added to the luster of your, of your uh, occupation. Do you consider yourself a lobbyist in this, in this role? Absolutely. Uh, and when I, when it was stated, And then that would be part of the regulatory process, you would see. Well, I, I have a very broad definition of lobbying. My wife and I argue about this all the time. She was the lead attorney at OSHA for health standards for the United States, and I felt like people were going in and lobbying her all the time. She said not. I think anyone advocating a position to change public policy, uh, whether it is buying a Boeing aircraft or putting an earmark here or uh, performing uh, advocacy before a regulatory uh, body is a lobbyist. Now, the question is, where do you want to define it in terms of regulation? That's it. Okay. And would you include yourself in that? Well, I, I for what think you're doing today? right now, uh, and I've appeared 18 times over the years uh, on the Hill uh, for lost causes, lost reform causes. Uh, I believe that I'm an academic uh, lobbying, advocating for particular positions. Yes, and I have no shame about that at all or 
I, I think that it's a, a role that academics should take. All right. Ms. I, I think both of you would could do I, that. Could I add if you could talk to me, both of you, about how you would change the definition of what we have today as a lobbyist. I think the, def I think the definition is a good definition. I don't yeah. think the definition is a problem, and it involves uh, uh, lobbying, and it, the current definition involves contacting members of Congress for compensation. So a constituent who comes in to simply uh, lobby a member does not come under the regulation or is not required to file reports. But people who are trying to influence Congress and are being compensated and make contacts, lobbying contacts, triggers the regulation now, and I think it's worked pretty well. I would also say that there's an exemption for people who come up here to testify in response to requests from committees, uh, that uh, so that if uh, someone is asked to testify, that doesn't turn them into a lobbyist. I'd, I'd like Mr. Miller to yeah, answer that, but question. then once again, go back through the row here again. It's direct compensation. There's also indirect forms of compensation. I don't know if you want to consider that. Mr. Miller? I, I support broadening the definition. What I don't want to see happen, though, is those who have associations who bring their members here once or twice a year to, to come and visit with their members of Congress, seeing those folks caught up in this and having to register or fill out forms or do what have you. What I'm talking about is, is folk, you have one lobbyist who has been convicted of crimes. You also have a PR, someone who considered himself a PR consultant, but basically was doing what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's lobby. So I would like to see the definition expanded to anybody who is trying to advocate for a position one way or the other. And that in includes church groups. It includes PR consultants. It, it would incorporate a lot of people. Dr. Thurber, if you would want to add to that. I, I would broaden the definition from existing law to include, and I know this is controversial, but to include uh, grassroots lobbying and coalition building. <laughs> Millions are spent in this area. Uh, there are firms, and they come in and speak in my class, that will uh, be hired by an outside organization, a corporation, or a union to go after, in a grassroots, I call it AstroTurf, an AstroTurf uh, activity against 15 members of Congress. And direct lobbying is only one little piece of the lobbying activity up here. It's, it's grassroots, it's top roots, it's issue ads, it's coalition building. If you don't have all of those things going, uh, you're, you're just not going to be successful up here unless it's a very narrow issue, like, in, in, like, uh, like with uh, uh, earmarks. So I would broaden it to include grassroots as well as okay. coalition building. Yeah, I, I certainly share the view that grassroots lobbying, stimulated lobbying to the general public that is intended to directly lobby you should be covered by this act and isn't. Uh, we cover all of the lobbying firms in Washington that are hired to do direct lobbying. There are many firms that are hired simply for the purpose of stimulating public uh, response to reach you, direct lobbying to you. They're not covered. Those firms should be covered, and that grassroots lobbying should be covered as well. My, my original comment was narrowly focused on the direct lobbying. For any of the four of you, somebody at one of these times talked about expanding the kinds of things that would be included in information about what a lobbyist does, including specific vi visits to, to individuals. And for the, is there any one of you that four that actually recommended that? or? Yes, I, I, it's in my testimony. All right. I, I include in it, and I think it's very important, the amount of money that the lobbyist is contributing in, in that form. You can get it in another way. The amount of money that they're contributing to uh, candidacies and whether they sponsor trips and what the trips are about and how much they cost and other things. Do either of you see problems in the day-to-day -day function of the lobbyist in having them make specific reference to with whom they are speaking on issues. I do, and, and I'll tell you why. If you're going to make it that the lobbyists have to report that information, what makes you think you're going to be able to verify it? If, if I wanted to be the next, I'll use an example, if I wanted to be the next Jack Abramoff and impress my clients, all I have to do is go down and look at the issues that are important to them, find the committees of jurisdiction, and, and write down senior staff and members of Congress who I may not have met with and just say that I did turn that in. There, it's a he said, she said argument, so you wouldn't be able to verify that I've never met with your office or your staff or you personally. So that's the problem I see with this. If you're going to make some reporting requirements, it's going to have to be on both sides, the member, the staff, and, and us. 
but I see a problem with that. If you're walking down the hall and I see you and you say, hi, Paul, how you doing? Hey, by the way, how's, how's the highway built? Is that a contact? And you forget to write it down. You guys have very busy schedules and very busy days. We know that. You may forget to write down a contact that I may have down or I may forget to do one that you may have down. I think you have to look at that very carefully. I think there's a lot of problems with that part of the system. I had specific questions also about the concept of an office, office of public integrity. Yes. Um, and how you maintain, you ensure that there's not going to be some kind of vendetta, the kind of checks and balances you build in that system. Let me do this in a different way that is more, uh, that is more philosophical, and once again for all of you too. I'd like you just to address the issue on, as we're talking about transparency, talking about letting people know what's going on, the issue of regulation simply versus disclosure. Because everything we've talked about so far is talking about a whole bunch of new regulations we want to have in, new reports. Uh, and penalties attached to it. And we've seen in the other areas we branched off into, I mean, this was supposed to be about lobbying, we've talked about campaigns and everything else, all of whom seem to have complicated the process by coming up with some really obscure regulations and hoops that have to be to, to jump through. Would it not be simpler, easier, and clearer simply to have everyone list down the disclosure, have members list down the disclosure, even though there's some problems with that, list down the disclosures, and without having the kind of penalties attached to it, allow people then to just look at that and make the decisions on whether they find that is that is appropriate for re-election or not. Uh, uh, one, uh, I guess how I say this, you could do that. I think it would be a lot of paperwork when it comes to filling out the LDA forms. But uh, two, if you wanted to do this, one simple way to do this would be to, I guess, create some sort of card that you come into your office, you scan, it's automatically tracked into a database so that the, the House and Senate have that information. It makes it very easy. The problem you have is when you go off the Hill and members of Congress go and speak to groups or coalitions, I don't know if you want to be collecting cards or, or somehow carry a scanning device to have to scan that all in. I, I think it's a very complicated issue, but one easy way to do it when you're on the Hill, anybody who walks through your door who is a lobbyist may have this card. You scan it in for a meeting and it's tracked. Makes it easy. Uh, I I think there are certain areas where disclosure is the best way to go, but there are other areas where prohibitions are needed. I don't think it's either or. Uh, for example, uh, you have restrictions right now, gift restrictions, $50 and $100. Uh, you could, from a philosophical standpoint, say take off all the restrictions. You could get whatever, any level of gifts, and you'll just leave it up to your constituents. Or you could do that. Uh, as you do now, where a lobbyist can put up $50,000 and throw a party for you. But this is not just about voting constituencies. It's about influencing the process. It's about the way decisions are made here that affect everyone, not just your constituents. And certain kinds of activities have the ability to potentially buy influence that will affect decisions that go way beyond your constituents. They affect all of us. I think it's a balancing question, and in some areas, prohibitions are needed. I'd like to respond to your specific question. Um, <clears throat> in order to have uh, accurate disclosure, you have to have some form of enforcement. And in order to have uh, transparency, you have to have disclosure of things. I do agree with you, though, that ultimately, it's the competition in an election. It's your opponent or maybe the local newspaper in your district or, or uh, others that, say, that see some pattern that they think is questionable from the public record that ultimately will be the punishment uh, or, or will help somebody in terms of the way they're behaving. So in other words, I, I agree with you. Uh, it's, it's the open uh, campaign that counts. But then we get to the redistricting problem where you know, we've got a lot of districts that aren't very safe. Can I also add to that? I mean, I had an opportunity to talk to a reporter, and, and we had this discussion about the importance of writing down and tracking every conversation that you have with a member of Congress and their staff. And I said, what value does that offer to you? And she said, well, I'm not so sure that it offers me anything other than it's interesting. 
And the last thing I want to do is, is put people out there, you all in a position when, it, again, campaign issues, um, somebody using it against you, a, a reporter using it just to write a sexy article that's, that's going to find interest. I'm not sure there's, there's a lot of value. If the LD, LDA form has any problem with it, it needs that we need to be more specific on it. I don't say write down who you're meeting with, but c committees of jurisdiction, actually specific bill numbers and, and specific issues is important. Um, that's where it lacks. I don't think you're going to be able to, I think, come up with a good system where you track every meeting that you have because there's just going to be some days you forget to write one down. Uh, Madam Chairman, I, I appreciate the answers. I appreciate your willingness to stick here this long. Um, and let me just do one last bit of venting. Uh, as the answers you've given to us specifically about lobbyists, I think have been very good and very direct, and I appreciate that. As sometimes we have branched into other areas about other kinds of reform that deal with the process. And I, I never thought of myself as being a reformer until I came here. There is much about the way we do things that I think should have systemic reform. And to be honest, no one really has delved into that particular situation. We have conflicts between authorization and appropriations processes here. That's a systemic issue. We have, we've talked sometimes about doing regular order and having hearings. But as you can see, it would be nice to have people to hear what the hearings have to offer. We do much for the record but no one really cares about the record. It's, it's like checking off the box that we've gone through that. In, in all sincerity, as we talk more about changing Congress, I would like to see some look at how we have evolved over the years systemically, and especially in contrast to how certain state legislatures have done it. Forty years ago, my state went through this process. We have a unique system of legislative process among the 50 states. And it's a process I like a lot more because I think it's open and has a lot more avenues of opportunity of interaction than we have evolved here. And in some respects, I, I would hope as the future goes on, as we start talking about this, we would broaden to look at what we're doing because I think there are some things we take for granted that in, in reality have a negative or a limiting concept of what's going on. And I, and I apologize for that and I apologize for taking more of your time and thank you. I'm done. I want to thank the gentleman. I want to thank the members of the committee for uh, a very thoughtful questioning and a lot of stick to I think as the meeting's gone on, um, we've realized we have a lot more commonality maybe in some of these areas than it, the beginning statements might have le led you to believe. I want to thank the panelists for being so patient. Also, uh, as a relative newcomer to Congress, I thank you for your admiration at, for the uh, institution. And uh, I think that your very thoughtful answers are out of respect uh, for Congress and for our nation. And I appreciate all of your uh, sincere sentiments. And thank you very much. May I yes. Thank, I, I want to also thank the panel. I'm sorry we didn't give you lunch, uh, but and that you've come all day. But you've done a good service for your country today. And I'm, I want to thank C-SPAN for covering this, because I think this is of great interest to the people in the country. Um, and we're just scratching the surface, though. And I know we've all graciously allowed us to ask you more questions, but I hope you'll have some that you'll want to send us as well. Thank you very much for, for being here with us. And, and it really has been one of the most informative hearings that I've attended in 20 years. Thank, Thank you. More now on the lobbying process with remarks by the former Senate Minority Leader Everett Dirksen. His remarks from 1963 came during a broadcast 